Section 11 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapters 6 to 13. Chapter 6. There was more than half a gale blowing on the eve of the new year, and the wind came howling with a savage violence across the rain-swept fields, so that the first days of a fateful year had a stormy birth, and there was no peace on earth louder than the wind was the greeting of the guns to another year of war i heard the new year's chorus when i went to see the last of the year across the battlefields our guns did not let it die in silence it went into the tomb of the past with all its tragic memories to thunderous salvos carrying death with them the heavies were indulging in a special strafe this new year's eve as i went down a road near the lines by loose I saw from concealed positions the flash of gun upon gun. The air was swept by an incessant rush of shells, and the roar of all this artillery stupefied one's sense of sound. All about me in the village of Ancan, through which I walked, there was no other sound, no noise of human life. There were no New Year's Eve rejoicings among those rows of miners' cottages on the edge of the battlefield. Half those little red brick houses were blown to pieces, and when here and there, through a cracked window pane, I saw a woman's white face peering out upon me as I passed, I felt as though I had seen a ghost face in some black pit of hell. For it was hellish, this place, wrecked by high explosives, and always under the fire of German guns. That any human being should be there passed all belief. From a shell hole in a high wall, I looked across the field of battle, where many of our best had died. The tower bridge of Luz stood grim and gaunt above the sterile fields. Through the rain and the mist loomed the long black ridge of Notre Dame de Lorette, where many poor bodies lay in the rotting leaves. The ruins of Hen and Huluk were jagged against the skyline, and here, on New Year's Eve, I saw no sign of life and heard no sound of it but stared at the broad desolation and listened to the enormous clangor of great guns. Coming back that day through Bethune, I met some very human life. It was a big party of blue jackets from the Grand Fleet who had come to see what Tommy was doing in the war. They went into the trenches and saw a good deal, because the Germans made a bombing raid in that sector, and the naval men did their little bit by the side of the lads in khaki who liked this visit. They discovered the bomb store and opened such a Brock's benefit that the enemy must have been shocked with surprise. One young Marine was bomb-slinging for four hours and grinned at the prodigious memory as though he had the time of his life. Another confessed to me that he preferred rifle grenades, which he fired off all night until the dawn. There was no sleep in the dugouts, and every hour was a long thrill. I don't mind saying, said a petty officer, who had fought in several naval actions during the war, and is a man of mark, that I had a fair fright when I was doing duty on the fire step. I suppose I've got to look through a periscope, I said. Not you, said the sergeant. At night you puts your head over the parapet. So over the parapet I put my head and presently I saw something moving between the lines. My rifle began to shake. Germans! Moving, sure enough, over the open ground! I fixed bayonet and prepared for an attack. But I'm blessed if it wasn't a swarm of rats. The soldiers were glad to show Jack the way about the trenches, and some of them played up a little audaciously, as, for instance, when a young fellow sat on the top of the parapet at dawn. Come up and have a look, Jack, he said to one of the blue jackets. "'Not in these trousers, old mate,' said the young man. "'All as cool as cucumbers,' said a petty officer, "'and take the discomforts of trench life as cheerily as any men could. "'It's marvellous. Good luck to them in the new year.'" Behind the lines there was a banqueting by men who were mostly doomed to die, and I joined a crowd of them in a hall at Lillier on that New Year's Day. They were the heroes of Luz, or some of them, Camerons and Seaforths, Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, Gordons and King's own Scottish borderers, 
who, with the London men, were the first on Hill 70 and away to the Cite Saint Auguste. They left many comrades there, and their battalions have been filled up with new drafts, of the same type as themselves, and of the same grit. But that day no ghost of grief, no dark shadow of gloom, was upon any of the faces upon which I looked round a festive board in a long French hall, to which their wounded came in those days of the September battle. There were young men there, from the Scottish universities, and from Highland farms, sitting shoulder to shoulder in a jolly comradeship, which burst into song between every mouthful of the feast. On the platform above the banqueting board, a piper was playing when I came in, and this hall in France was filled with the wild strains of it. "'And they're grand, the pipes,' said one of the Camerons. "'When I been so tired on the march, I could a lead doon indeed.' the touch of the pipes was fair lifted me up again a piper made way for a kilty at the piano and for highlanders who sang old songs full of melancholy which seemed to make the hearts of his comrades grow glad as when they helped him with the bonny bonny banks of loch lomon but the roof nearly fell off the hall to the march of the Cameron men and the walls were greatly strained when the regimental marching song broke at every verse into wild highland shouts and the war cry which was heard at loose of camerons forward forward camerons an englishman is good said one of the camerons leaning over the table to me and an irishman is good but a scot is best of all then he struck the palm of one hand with the fist of another but the London men, he said, with a fine, joyous laugh at some good memory, are as good as any fighting men in France. My word, ye should have seen em on September 25th, and the London Irish were just lions. Out in the rain slash street I met the colonel of a battalion of Argyles and Sutherlands, with several of his officers, a tall, thin officer with a long stride, who was killed when another year had passed. He beckoned me and said, I'm going the rounds of the billets to wish the men good luck in the new year. It's a strain on the Constitution, as I have to drink their health each time. He bore the strain gallantly, and there was something noble and chivalrous in the way he spoke to all his men, gathered together in various rooms, in old Flemish houses, round plum pudding from home or feasts provided by the army cooks. To each group of men he made the same kind of speech, thanking them from his heart for all their courage. "'You were thanked by three generals,' he said, after your attack at Luce, and you upheld the old reputation of the regiment. I'm proud of you. And afterward, in November, when you had the devil of a time in the trenches, you stuck it splendidly, and came out with high spirits. I wish you all a happy new year, and whatever the future may bring, I know I can count on you. In every billet there were three cheers for the colonel, and another three for the staff captain, and though the colonel protested that he was afraid of spending a night in the guard room, there were shouts of laughter at this, he drank his sip of neat whiskey, according to the custom of the day. Toodaloo, old bird, said a kilted cockney halfway up a ladder, on which he swayed perilously, being very drunk, but the colonel did not hear this familiar way of address. In many billets and in many halls the feast of New Year's Day was kept in good comradeship by men who had faced death together, and who, in the year that was coming, fought in many battles and fell on many fields. Chapter 7 The Canadians who were in the Ypres salient in January 1916, and for a long time afterward, had a grim way of fighting. The enemy never knew what they might do next. When they were most quiet, they were most dangerous. They used cunning as well as courage, and went out on Red Indian adventures over no man's land for fierce and scientific slaughter. I remember one of their early raids in the salient when a big party of them, all volunteers, went out one night with intent to get through the barbed wire outside a strong German position to do a lot of killing there. They had trained for the job, and thought out every detail of this hunting expedition. They blacked their faces so that they would not show white in the enemy's flares. They fastened flash lamps to their bayonets so they might see their victims. They wore rubber gloves to save their hands from being torn on the barbs of the wire. 
Stealthily they crawled over no man's land, crouching in shell holes every time a rocket rose and made a glimmer of light. They took their time at the wire, muffling the snap of it by bits of cloth. Reliefs crawled up with more gloves, and even with tins of hot cocoa. Then, through the gap into the German trenches, and there were screams of German soldiers, terror shaken by the flash of light in their eyes and black faces above them, and bayonets already red with blood. It was butcher's work, quick and skillful, like a red Indian scalping. Thirty Germans were killed before the Canadians went back, with only two casualties. The Germans were horrified by this sudden slaughter. They dared not come out on patrol work. Canadian scouts crawled down to them and insulted them ingeniously, vilely, but could get no answer. Later they trained their machine guns on German working parties and swept crossroads on which supplies came up, and the Canadian sniper, in one shell hole or another, lay for hours in sulky patience, and at last got his man. They had to pay for all this at Maple Copse, in June of fifteen, as I shall tell but it was a vendetta which did not end until the war ended, and the Canadians fought the Germans with a long, enduring, terrible, skillful patience which at last brought them to Mons on the day before Armistice. I saw a good deal of the Canadians from first to last, and on many days of battle saw the tough, hard-fighting spirit of these men. Their generals believed in common sense applied to war and not in high mysteries and secret rites which cannot be known outside the circle of initiation. I was impressed by General Curry, who I met for the first time in that winter of 1915-16, and wrote at the time that I saw in him, quotes, a leader of men who in open warfare might win great victories by doing the common-sense thing rapidly and decisively, to the surprise of an enemy working by elaborate science. He would, I think, astound them by the simplicity of his smashing stroke. End of quotes. Those words of mine were fulfilled on the day when the Canadians helped to break the Trucourcant line and when they captured Cambrai with English troops on their right who shared their success. General Curry, who became the Canadian Corps commander, did not spare his men. He led them forward whatever the cost, but there was something great and terrible in his simplicity and sureness of judgment and this real estate agent, as he was before he took to soldiering, was undoubtedly a man of strong ability, free from those trammels of red tape and tradition which swathed round so many of our own leaders. He cut clean to the heart of things, ruthlessly, like a surgeon, and as I watched that man, immense in bulk, with a heavy, thoughtful face and stern eyes that softened a little when he smiled, I thought of him as Oliver Cromwell. He was severe as a disciplinarian, and not beloved by many men. But his staff officers, who stood in awe of him, knew that he demanded truth and honesty, and that his brain moved quickly to sure decisions and saw big problems broadly and with understanding. He had good men with him, mostly amateurs, but with hard business heads, and the same hatred of red tape and niggling ways which belonged to their chief. So the Canadian Corps became a powerful engine on our side when it had learned many lessons in blood and tragedy. They organized their publicity side in the same masterful way, and were determined that what Canada did the world should know, and damn all censorship. They bought up English artists, photographers, and writing men to record their exploits. With Lord Beaverbrook in England, they engineered Canadian propaganda with immense energy and Canada believed her men made up the British Army, and did all the fighting. I do not blame them, and only wish that the English soldier should have been given his share of the honors that belonged to him, the lion's share. Chapter 8 The Canadians were not the only men to go out raiding. It became part of the routine of war, that quick killing in the night, for English and Scottish and Irish and Welsh troops, and had some luck with it, and some men liked it and to others it was a horror which they had to do, and always it was a fluky, nervy job, when any accident might lead to tragedy. I remember one such raid by the 12th West Yorks in January of 15, which was typical of many others, before raids developed into minor battles with all the guns at work. There were four lieutenants who drew up the plan and called for volunteers, 
and it was one of these who went out first and alone to reconnoiter the ground and to find the best way through the german barbed wire he just slipped out over the parapet and disappeared into the darkness when he came back he had a wound in the wrist it was just the bad luck of a chance bullet but brought in valuable knowledge he had found a gap in the enemy's wire which would give an open door to the party of visitors he had also tested the wire further along and thought it could be cut without much bother good enough was the verdict and a detachment started out for no man's land divided into two parties the enemy trenches were about one hundred yards away which seems a mile in the darkness and the loneliness of the dead ground at regular intervals the german rockets flared up so that the hedges and wire and parapets along their line were cut out ink-black against the white illumination and the two patrols of yorkshiremen who had been crawling forward stopped and crouched lower and felt themselves revealed and then when darkness hid them again went on the party on the left were now close to the german wire and under the shelter of a hedge they felt their way along until the two subalterns who were leading came to a gap which had been reported by the first explorer they listened intently and heard the german sentry stomping his feet and pacing up and down presently he began to whistle softly utterly unconscious of the men so close to him so close now that any stumble any clatter of arms any word spoken would betray them the two lieutenants had the revolvers ready and crept forward to the parapet the men had to act according to instinct now for no order could be given and one of them found his instinct led him to clamber right into the german trench a few yards away from the sentry but on the other side of the traverse he had not been there long holding his breath and crouching like a wolf before footsteps came toward him and he saw the glint of a cigarette it was a german officer going his round the yorkshire boy sprang on to the parapet again and lay across it with his head toward our lines and his legs dangling in the german trench the german officer's cloak brushed his heels but the boy twisted round a little and stared at him as he passed but he passed and presently the sentry began to whistle again some old german tune which cheered him in his loneliness he knew nothing of the eyes watching him through the darkness nor of his nearness to death it was the first lieutenant who tried to shoot him but the revolver was muddy and would not fire perhaps a click disturbed the sentry anyhow the moment had come for quick work it was the sergeant who sprang upon him down from the parapet with one pounce a frightful shriek with the shrill agony of a boy's voice wailed through the silence the sergeant had his hand upon the german boy's throat and tried to strangle him and to stop another dreadful cry the second officer made haste he thrust his revolver close to the struggling sentry and shot him dead through the neck just as he was falling limp from a blow on the head given by the butt end of the weapon which had failed to fire the bullet did its work though it passed through the sergeant's hand which had still held the man by the throat the alarm had been raised and german soldiers were running to the rescue quick said one of the officers there was a wild scramble over the parapet a drop into the wet ditch and a race for home over no man's land which was white under the german flares and noisy with the waspish note of bullets the other party were longer away and had greater trouble to find a way through but they too got home with one officer badly wounded and wonderful luck to escape so lightly the enemy suffered from the jumps for several nights afterward and threw bombs into their own barbed wire as though the english were out there again and at the sound of those bombs the west yorks laughed all along their trenches chapter nine it was always astonishing though afterward familiar in those battlefields of flanders to find oneself in the midst of so many nationalities and races and breeds of men belonging to that british family of ours which sent its sons to sacrifice in those trenches there were always ways of speech all the sentiment of place and history all the creeds and local customs and songs of old tradition which belong to the mixture of our blood wherever it is found about the world the skirl of the scottish bagpipes was heard through all the years of war over the flemish marshlands and there were highlanders and lowlanders with every dialect over the border 
in one line of trenches the german soldiers listened to part songs sung in such trained harmony that it was as if the battalion of opera singers had come into the firing line the welshmen spoke their own language for a time no officer received his command unless he spoke it as fluently as running water by aberystwyth and even orders were given in this tongue until a few saxons discovered in the ranks failed to form fours and know their left hand from their right in welsh the french canadians did not need to learn the language of the peasants in these market towns soldiers from somerset used many old saxon words which puzzled their cockney friends and the lancashire men brought the northern burr with them and the grit of the northern spirit and ireland though she would not have conscription sent some of the bravest of her boys out there and in all the bloodiest battles since that day at mons the old fighting qualities of the irish race shone brightly again and the blood of her race has been poured out upon these tragic fields one of the villages behind the lines of arras was so crowded with irish boys at the beginning of sixteen that i found it hard not to believe that a part of old ireland itself had found its way to flanders in one old outhouse the cattle had not been evicted twelve flemish cows lay cuddled up together on the ground in damp straw which gave out a sweet sickly stench while the irish soldiers lived upstairs in the loft to which they climbed up a tall ladder with broken rungs i went up the ladder after them it was very shaky in the middle and putting my head through the loft gave a greeting to a number of dark figures lying in the same kind of straw that i had smelled downstairs one boy was sitting with his back to the beams playing a penny whistle very softly to himself or perhaps to rats under the straw the creatures are that bold said the boy from county clerk that when we first came in they sat up smiling and sang god save ireland but dad it was the truth i'm after telling ye the billets were wet and dirty but it was good to be away from the shells even if the rain came through the beams of a broken roof and soaked through the plaster of wattle walls the irish boys were good at making wood fires in these old barns and pigsties if there were a few bricks about them to make a hearth and sure a baked potato was no protestant with a grudge against the pope there were no such luxuries in the trenches when the dublins and the munsters were up in the firing line at the hohenzollern the shelling was so violent that it was difficult to get up the supplies and some of the boys had to fall back on their iron rations it was the only complaint which one of them made when i asked him what he thought of his first experience under fire it was all right sore and not so bad as i'd been after thinking if only my appetite had not been bigger than my belt at all the spirit of these irishmen was shown by some who had just come out from the old country to join their comrades in the firing line when the germans put over a number of shells smashing the trenches and wounding men the temper of the lads broke out and they wanted to get over the parapet and make a dash for the enemy twould teach them a lesson they told their officers who had some trouble in restraining them these newcomers had to take part in the digging which goes on behind the lines at night out in the open without the shelter of a trench it was nervous work especially when the german flares went up silhouetting their figures on the skyline and when one of the enemy's machine guns began to chatter but the irish boys found the heart for a jest and one of them resting on his spade a moment stared over to the enemy's lines and said may the old devil take the spalline who works that typewriter it was a scaring nerve-wracking time for those who had come fresh to the trenches some of those boys who had not guessed the realities of war until then but they came out proudly with their tails up said one of the officers after their baptism of fire the drum and fife band of the munsters was practicing in an old barn on the wayside and presently in honor of visitors who were myself and another the pipers were sent for they were five tall lads who came striding down the street of flemish cottages with the wind-bags under their arms and then with the fife men sitting on the straw around them and the drummers standing with their sticks ready they took their breath for the good old irish tune demanded by the captain it was a tune which men could not sing very safely in irish yesterdays 
and it held the passion of many rebellious hearts in the yearning of them. Oh, Patty dear, and did you hear the news that's going round? The shamrock is forbid by law to grow on Irish ground. She's the most distressful country that ever yet was seen. They're hanging men and women there for wearing of the green. Then the pipers played the march of O'Neill, a wild old air, as shrill and fierce as the spirit of the men who came with their Irish battle cries against Elizabeth's pikemen and Cromwell's ironsides. I thought then that the lads who still stayed back in Ireland, and the old people there, would have been glad to stand with me outside the Flemish barn and to hear the old tunes of their race played by the boys who were out there fighting. I think they would have wept a little, as I saw tears in the eyes of an Irish soldier by my side, for it was the spirit of Ireland herself, with all her poetry and her valor and her faith in liberty, which came crying from those pipes, and I wished that the sound of them could carry across the sea. That was a year before I saw the Irish battalions come out of Gishi, a good remnant of the strength that had gone in, all tattered and torn, and caked with the filth of battle, and hardly able to stagger along. But they pulled themselves up a little, and turned their eyes left when they passed their brigadier, who called out words of praise to them. It was more than a year later than that when I saw the last of them, after a battle in Flanders, when they were massacred, and lay in heaps around German redoubts, up there in the swamps. CHAPTER Ten. Early in the morning of February 23rd, there was a clear sky with a glint of sun in it, and airplanes were aloft as though it would be a good flying day. But before midday the sky darkened, and snow began to fall, and then it snowed steadily for hours, so that all the fields of Flanders were white. There was a strange new beauty in the war zone, which had changed all the pictures of war by a white enchantment. The villages where our soldiers were billeted looked as though they were expecting a visit from Santa Claus. The snow lay thick on the thatch and in the soft downy ridges on the red tile roofs. It covered, with its purity, the rubbish heaps of Flemish farmyards, and the old oak beams of barns and sheds where British soldiers made their beds of straw. Away over the lonely country which led to the trenches, every furrow in the fields was a thin white ridge and the trees which were just showing a shimmer of green, stood ink-black against the drifting snow-clouds, with a long white streak down each tall trunk on the side nearest to the wind. The old windmills of Flanders, which looked down upon the battlefields, had been touched by the softly falling flakes, so that each rib of their sails, and each rung of their ladders, and each plank of their ancient timbers was outlined like a frosty cobweb. Along the roads of war our soldiers tramped through the blizzard, with ermine mantles over their Mackintosh capes, and mounted men with their heads bent to the storm were like white knights riding through a white wilderness. The long columns of motor lorries, the gun limbers drawn up by their batteries, the field ambulances by the clearing hospitals, were all cloaked in snow, and the tramp and traffic of an army were hushed in the great quietude. In the trenches the snow fell thickly and made white pillows of piled sandbags and snowmen of sentries standing in the shelter of the traverses. The tarpaulin roofs and timbered doorways of dugouts were so changed by the snowflakes that they seemed the dwelling places of fairy folks, or at least of Pierrot and Columbine, in a Christmas hiding place and not of soldiers stamping their feet and blowing on their fingers and keeping their rifles dry. In its first glamour of white, the snow gave a beauty even to no man's land, making a lacework pattern of barbed wire, and lying very softly over the tumbled ground of minefields, so that all the ugliness of destruction and death was hidden under this canopy. The snowflakes fluttered upon stark bodies there, and shrouded them tenderly, it was as though all the doves of peace were flying down to fold their wings above the obscene things of war. For a little while the snow brought something like peace. The guns were quieter, for artillery observation was impossible. There could be no sniping, for the scurrying flakes put a veil between the trenches. 
the airplanes which went up in the morning came down quickly to the powdered fields and took shelter in their sheds a great hush was over the war zone but there was something grim suggestive of tragic drama in the silent countryside so white even in the darkness where millions of men were waiting to kill one another behind the lines the joke of the snow was seen by soldiers who were quick to see a chance of fun men who had been hurling bombs in the ypres salient bombarded one another with hand grenades which burst noiselessly except for the shouts of laughter that signaled a good hit french soldiers were at the same game in one village i passed where the snow fight was fast and furious and some of our officers led an attack upon old comrades with a craft of trappers and an expert knowledge of enfilade fire the white peace did not last long the ermine mantle on the battlefield was stained by scarlet patches as soon as men could see to fight again chapter eleven for some days in that february of nineteen sixteen the war correspondents in the chateau of tilk from which they made their expeditions to the line were snowed up like the army round them not even the motor cars could move through that snow which drifted across the roads we sat indoors talking high treason sometimes pondering over the problem of a war from which there seemed no way out becoming irritable with one another's company becoming passionate in argument about the ethics of war the purpose of man the gospel of christ the guilt of germany and the dishonesty of british politicians futile foolish arguments while men were being killed in great numbers as daily routine without result officers of a division billeted nearby came in to dine with us some of them generals with elaborate theories on war and passionate hatred of germany seeing no other evil in the world some of them brigadiers with tales of appalling brutality which caused great laughter some of them battalion officers with the point of view of those who said moratori te saluant there was one whose conversation i remember having taken notes of it before i turned in at the night it was a remarkable conversation summing up many things of the same kind which i had heard in stray sentences by other officers and month by month years afterward heard again spoken with passion this officer who had come out to france in nineteen fourteen and had been fighting ever since by a luck which had spared his life when so many of his comrades had fallen round him did not speak with passion he spoke with a bitter mocking irony he said that g h q was a close corporation in the hands of a military clique which had muddled through the south african war and were now going to muddle through a worse one they were he said entrenched behind impregnable barricades of old moss-eaten traditions red tape and caste privilege they were of course patriots who believed that the empire depended upon their system they had no doubt of their inherent right to conduct the war which was quote, their war without interference or criticism or publicity they spent many hours of the days and nights in writing letters to one another, and those who wrote most letters received most decorations, and felt with a patriotic fire within their breasts that they were getting on with the war. Within their close corporation there were rivalries, intrigues, perjuries, and treacheries like those of a medieval court. Each general and staff officer had his followers and his sycophants, who jostled for one another's jobs fawned on the great man flattered his vanity and made him believe in his omniscience among the general staff there were various grades gso one gso two gso three and those in the lower grades fought for the higher grade with every kind of artfulness and diplomacy and backstair influence they worked late into the night that is to say they went back to their offices after dining at mess quotes so frightfully busy you know old man and kept their lights burning and smoked more cigarettes and rang one another up on the telephone with futile questions and invented new ways of preventing something from being done somewhere the war to them was a far-off thing essential to their way of life as miners in the coal fields are essential to the statesmen in downing street especially in cold weather but it did not touch their souls or their bodies 
they did not see its agony or imagine it or worry about it they were always cheerful breezy bright with optimism they made a little work go a long way they were haughty and arrogant with subordinate officers or at best affable and condescending and to superior officers they said yes sir no sir quite so sir to any statement however absurd in its ignorance and dogmatism if a major general said wagner was a montebank in music gso three who had once studied in munich said yes sir or you think so sir of course you're right if a lieutenant colonel said browning was not a poet a staff captain who had read browning at cambridge with passionate admiration said i quite agree with you sir and who do you think was a poet sir it was the army system the opinion of a superior officer was correct always it did not admit of contradiction it was not to be criticized its ignorance was wisdom g h q lived said our guest in a world of its own rose-colored remote from the ugly things of war they had heard of the trenches yes but as the west end hears of the east end a nasty place where common people lived occasionally they visited the trenches as society folk go slumming and came back proud of having seen a shell burst having braved the lice and the dirt the trenches are slums said our guest we are the great unwashed we are the mudlarks there was a trench in the salient called j three it was way out in advance of our lines it was not connected with our own trench system it had been left derelict by both sides and was a ditch in no man's land but our men were ordered to hold it to save sniping a battalion commander protested to the headquarters staff there was no object in holding j three it was a target for german guns and a temptation to german miners j three came the staff command must be held until further orders we lost five hundred men in holding it the trench and all in it were thrown up by mines among those killed was the honorable lyndhurst bruce the husband of camille clifford with other husbands of women unknown our guest told the story of a massacre in neuve chapelle this is a death sentence said the officer who were ordered to attack but they attacked and died with great gallantry as usual in the slums said our guest we are expected to die if ghq tells us so or if the corps arranges our funeral and generally we do that night when the snow lay on the ground i listened to the rumbling of the gunning away in the salient and seemed to hear the groans of men at Hooge, at st eloi in other awful places the irony of that guest of ours was frightful it was bitter beyond justice though with truth in the mockery the truth of a soul shocked by the waste of life and heroism when i met him later in the war he was on the staff chapter twelve the world our side of it held its breath and felt its own heartbeat when in february of that year fifteen the armies of the german crown prince launched their offensive against the french at verdun it was the biggest offensive since their first drive down to the marne and as the days passed they had hurled fresh masses of men against the french and brought up new guns to replace their losses where there was no doubt that in this battle the germans were trying by all their weight to smash their way to victory through the walls which the french had built against them by living flesh and spirit will they hold was the question which every man among us asked of his neighbor and of his soul on our front there was nothing of war beyond the daily routine of the trenches and the daily list of deaths and wounds winter had closed down upon us in flanders and through its fogs and snows came the news of that conflict round verdun to the waiting army which was ours the news was bad yet not the worst poring over maps of the french front we in our winter quarters saw with secret terror some of us with the bluster of false optimism some of us with unjustified despair that the french were giving ground giving ground slowly after heroic resistance after dreadful massacre and steadily they were falling back to the inner line of forts hard pressed the germans in spite of monstrous losses under the flail of the soixante were forcing their way from slope to slope 
capturing positions which all but dominated the whole of the Verdun Heights. If the French break, we shall lose the war, said the pessimist. The French will never lose Verdun, said the optimist. Why not? What are your reasons beyond that cursed optimism which has been our ruin? Why announce things like that as though divinely inspired? For God's sake, let us stare straight at the facts. The Germans are losing the war by this attack on Verdun. They are just pouring their best soldiers into the furnace, burning the flower of their army. It is our gain. It will lead, in the end, to our victory. But, my dear good fool, what about the French losses? Don't they get killed, too? The German artillery is flogging them with shell-fire from seventeen-inch guns, twelve-inch, nine-inch, every bloody and monstrous engine. The French are weak in heavy artillery. For that error, which has haunted them from the beginning, they are now paying with their life's blood, the life-blood of France. You are arguing on emotion and fear. Haven't you learned yet that the attacking side always loses more than the defense? That is a sweeping statement. It depends on relative manpower and gunpower. Given a superiority of guns and men, the attack is cheap. Defense is blown off the earth. Otherwise, how could we ever hope to win? I agree, but the forces at Verdun are about equal, and the French have the advantage of position. The Germans are committing suicide. Humbug! They know what they're doing. They are the greatest soldiers in Europe. Led by men with bone heads. By great scientists. By the traditional rules of medievalism. By bald-headed vultures in spectacles with brains like penny-in-the-slot machines. Put in a penny, and out come rules of war. Mad egoists, colossal blunderers, efficient in all things but knowledge of life. Then God help our British GHQ. A long silence. The silence of men who see monstrous forces at work, in which human lives are tossed like straws in flame. A silence reaching back to old ghosts of history, reaching out to supernatural aid. Then, from one speaker or another, a kind of curse and a kind of prayer. Hell! God help us all! So it was in our mess where war correspondents and censors sat down together after futile journeys to dirty places to see a bit of shell-fire, a few dead bodies, a line of German trenches through a periscope, a queue of wounded men outside a dressing station, the survivors of a trench raid, a bombardment before, quotes, a minor operation, a trench mortar stunt, a new part of the line. Verdun was the only thing that mattered in March and April until France had saved herself and all of us. Chapter 13 The British Army took no part in that Battle of Verdun, but rendered great service to France at that time. By February of 1915, we had taken over a new line of front extending from our positions around Luce southward to the country around Lens and Arras. It was to this movement in February that Marshal Joffrey made allusion when, in a message to our commander-in-chief on March 2nd, he said that, quotes, the French army remembered that its recent call on the comradeship of the British army met with an immediate and complete response. By liberating an immense number of French troops of the 10th Army and a mass of artillery from this part of the front, we had the good fortune to be of great service to France at that time, when she needed many men and guns to repel the assault upon Verdun. Some of her finest troops, men who had fought in many battles and had held the trenches with most dogged courage, were here in this sector of the Western Front, and many batteries of heavy and light artillery had been in these positions since the early months of the war. It was, therefore, giving a new and formidable strength to the defense of Verdun when British troops replaced them at the time the enemy made his great attack. The French went away from this part of their battlefront with regret and emotion. To them it was sacred ground, this line along the long ridge of notre dame de lorette past Arras, the old capital of Artois, to Hébertin, where it linked up with the British army already on the Somme. Every field here was a graveyard to the heroic dead. 
I went over all the ground which we now held and saw the visible reminders of all that fighting which lay strewn there and told the story of all the struggle there by the upheaval of earth, the wreckage of old trenches, the mine craters and shell holes, and the litter of battle in every part of that countryside. I went there first to the hill of the Notre Dame de Lorette, looking northward to Lens and facing the Vimy Ridge which the enemy held as a strong barrier against us above the village of Suchet and Ablan de Nazaire and Nouvelle Saint Vassat, which the French had captured when they were still there, and I am glad of that, for I saw in their places the men who had lived there and fought there, as one may read in the terrible and tragic narrative of war by Henri Barbus in Le Feu. I went on such a day as Barbus describes. Never once did he admit any fine weather to alleviate the suffering of his comrades, thereby exaggerating their misery somewhat. It was raining, and there was a white, dank mist through the trees of the Bois de Bouvigny on the way to the spur of Notre Dame. It clung to the undergrowth, which was torn by shell fire, and to every blade of grass growing rankly round the lips of shell craters in which were bits of red rag or old bones the red pantaloons of the first French armies who had fought through those woods in the beginning of the war. I roamed about the graveyard there, where shells had smashed down some of the crosses, but had not damaged the memorial to men who had stormed up the slope of Notre Dame de Lorette and had fallen when their comrades chased the Germans to the village below. A few shells came over the hill as I pushed through the undergrowth with the French captain, and they burst among the trees with shattering boughs. I remember that little officer in a steel helmet, and I could see a Norman knight as his ancestor, with a falcon as his crest. He stood so often on the skyline, in full view of the enemy. I was thankful for the mist, and I admired but deplored his audacity. Without any screen to hide us, we walked down the hillside, gathering clots of greasy mud in our boots, stumbling and once sprawling. Another French captain joined us and became the guide. This road is often marmite, he said, but I have escaped so often I have a kind of fatalism. I envied his faith, remembering two eight-inch shells which a few minutes before had burst in our immediate neighborhood, cutting off twigs of trees, and one branch with a scatter of steel as sharp as knives and as heavy as sledgehammers. Then, for the first time, I went into Ablan saint nazaire which afterward I passed through scores of times on the way to Vimy when that ridge was ours. The ragged ruin of its church was white and ghostly in the mist. On the right of the winding road which led through it was Suchet Wood, all blasted and riven, and beyond the huddle of bricks which once was Suchet Village. Our men have fallen on every yard of this ground, said the French officer. Their bodies lie thick below the soil. Poor France, poor France. He spoke with tragedy in his eyes and voice seeing the vision of all that youth of france which even then in march of sixteen had been offered up in vast sacrifice to the greedy devils of war rain was slashing down now beating a tattoo on the steel helmets of a body of french soldiers who stood shivering by the ruined walls while trench motors were making a tumult in the neighborhood they were the men of henri barbus his comrades there were middle-aged men and boys mixed together in a confraternity of misery. They were plastered with wet clay, and their boots were enlarged grotesquely by the clots of mud on them. Their blue coats were sodden, and the water dripped out of them and made pools round their feet. They were unshaven, and their wet faces were smeared with the soil of the trenches. "'How goes it?' said the French captain with me. "'It does not go,' said the French sergeant. "'Cré nom de Dieu! My men are not gay today. They have been wet for three weeks, and their bones are aching. This place is not a bal tuberien. If we light even a little fire, we ask for trouble. At the sight of smoke, the dirty bush starts shelling again. So we do not get dry, and we have no warmth, and we cannot make even a cup of good hot coffee. That dirty bosch up there, on Vimy, looks out of his deep tunnels and laughs up his sleeve and says, Those poor devils of Frenchmen are not gay today. That is true, mon capitaine. Mais, que voulez-vous? C'est pour la France. Oui, c'est pour la France. 
The French captain turned away, and I could see that he pitied those comrades of his as he went over cratered earth to the village of Nouvelle saint vaast Poor fellows, he said presently, not even a cup of hot coffee. That is war. Blood and misery. Glory, yes, afterward. But at what a price! So we came to Nouvelle saint vaast a large village once with a fine church, old in history, a schoolhouse, a town hall, many little streets of comfortable houses under the shelter of the friendly old hill of Vimy, and with an easy walk of Arras, then a frightful rubbish heap mingled with unexploded shells, the twisted iron of babies' perambulators, bits of dead bodies, and shattered farm carts. Two French soldiers carried a stretcher on which a heavy burden lay under a blood-soaked blanket. "'It is a bad wound?' asked the captain. The men laid the stretcher down, breathing hard, and uncovered a face waxen, the color of death. It was the face of a handsome man, with a pointed beard, breathing snuffily through his nose. "'He may live as far as the dressing station,' said one of the Frenchmen. "'It was a trench mortar which blew a hole in his body just now over there.' The man jerked his head toward a barricade of sandbags at the end of a street of ruin. Two other men walked slowly toward us with a queer hobbling gait. Both of them were wounded in the legs and had tied rags round their wounds tightly. They looked grave, almost sullen, staring at us as they passed with brooding eyes. "'The German trench mortars are very evil,' said the captain. We poked about the ruins, raising our heads cautiously above sandbags to look at the German lines, cut into the lower slopes of Vimy, and thrust out by communication trenches to the edge of the village in which we walked. A boy officer came out of a hole and saluted the captain, who stepped back and said in an emotional way, Tiens, c'est toi, Edward? Oui, mon capitaine. The boy had a fine, delicate Latin face, with dark eyes and long black eyelashes. You are a lieutenant, then. How does it go, Edward? It does not go, answered the boy, like that French sergeant in Ablan saint nazaire This is a bad place. I lose my men every day. There are three killed yesterday and six wounded. Today already there are two killed and ten wounded. Something broke in his voice. Ce n'est pas bon du tout, du tout. It is not good at all, at all. The captain clapped him on the shoulders, tried to cheer him. Courage, mon vieux. The rain shot down on us. Our feet slithered in deep, greasy mud. Sharp stabs of flame vomited out of the slopes of Vimy. There was the high, long-drawn scream of shells in flight to Notre-Dame-de-Lorette. Batteries of soixante-quinze were firing rapidly, and their shells cut through the air above us like scythes. The cauldron in this pit of war was being stirred up. Another wounded poilu was carried past us covered by a bloody blanket like the other one. From slimy sandbags and wet ruins came the sickening stench of human corruption. A boot with some pulp inside protruded from a mud bank where I stood, and there was a human head without eyes or nose, black and rotting in the puddle of a shell hole. Those were relics of a battle on May ninth, a year before, when swarms of boys of the sixteen class boys of eighteen, the flower of French youth, rushed forward from the crossroads at Les Targettes, a few hundred yards away, to capture these ruins of Nouvelle saint vaast They captured them, and it cost them seven thousand in killed and wounded, at least three thousand dead. They fought like young demons through the flaming streets. They fell in heaps under the German barrage fire. Machine guns cut them down as though they were ripe corn under the sickle. But these French boys broke the Prussian guard that day. Round bout over all this ground below Notre Dame de Lorette and the fields around Suchet, the French had fought ferociously, burrowing below earth at the labyrinth, sapping, mining, gaining a network of trenches, an isolated house, a huddle of ruins, a German sap head by frequent rushes and the frenzy of those who fight with their teeth and hands flinging themselves on the bodies of their enemies below ground in the darkness or above ground between ditches and sandbags so for something like fifteen months they fought by souchet and the labyrinth until in february of sixteen they went away after greeting our khaki men 
who came into their old places and found the bones and bodies of Frenchmen there, as I found, white, rat-gnawed bones, in disused trenches below Notre Dame, when the rain washed the earth down and uncovered them. End of section 11section 12 of now it can be told by philip gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain part 4 chapters 14 to 20 chapter 14 it was then in that february of 15 that the city of arras passed for defense into british hands and became from that time on one of our strongholds on the edge of the battlefields so that it will be haunted forever by the ghosts of those men of ours whom i saw there on many days of grim fighting month after month in snow and sun and rain in steel helmets and stink coats in muddy khaki and kilts in queues of wounded three thousand at a time outside the citadel in billets where their laughter and music were scornful of high velocities in the surging tide of traffic that poured through to victory that cost as much sometimes as defeat when i first went into arras during its occupation by the french i remembered a day fifteen months before near the town of st paul in artois where i was caught up in one of those ties of fugitives which in those early days of war used to roll back in a state of terror before the german invasion where did they come from i asked watching this long procession of gigs and farmers carts and tramping women and children the answer told me everything they are bombarding arras monsieur since then they had never ceased to bombard arras from many points of view as i had come through the countryside at night i had seen the flashes of shells over that city and had thought of the agony inside four days before i went in first it was bombarded with one hundred and fifty seventeen-inch shells each one of which would destroy a cathedral it was with a sense of being near to death not a pleasant feeling you understand that i went into arras for the first time and saw what had happened to it i was very near to the germans no more than ten yards away when i stood peering through a hole in the wall of the maison rouge in the suburb of blangeny it was a red brick villa torn by shells with a piano in the parlor which no man dared to play behind a shelter of sandbags and no more than two hundred yards away from the enemy's lines when i paced up and down the great railway station of arras where no trains ever traveled for more than a year the enemy had been encamped outside the city and for all that time had tried to batter a way into and through it an endless battle had surged up against its walls but in spite of all their desperate attacks no german soldier had set foot inside the city except as a prisoner of war many thousands of young frenchmen had given their blood to save it the enemy had not been able to prevail over flesh and blood and the spirit of heroic men but he had destroyed the city bit by bit it was pitiful beyond all expression it was worse than looking upon a woman whose beauty had been scarred by bloody usage for arras was a city of beauty a living expression in stone of all the idealism in eight hundred years of history and most sweet and gracious place even then after a year's bombardment some spiritual exaltation of human love and art came to one out of all this ruin when i entered the city and wandered a little in its public gardens before going into its dead heart the grand place i felt the strange survival the trees here were slashed by shrapnel enormous shell craters had ploughed up those pleasure grounds the shrubberies were beaten down almost every house had been hit every building was scarred and slashed but for the most part the city still stood so that i went through many long streets and passed long lines of houses all deserted all dreadful in their silence and desolation and ruin when i came to the cathedral of st vast it was an enormous building of the renaissance not beautiful but impressive in its spaciousness and dignity next to it was the bishop's palace with long corridors and halls and a private chapel 
Upon these walls and domes the fury of great shells had spent itself. Pillars as wide in girth as giant trees had been snapped off to the base. The dome of the cathedral opened with a yawning chasm. High explosives burst through the walls. The keystones of arches were blown out. The masses of masonry were piled into the nave and aisles. As I stood there, rooks had perched in the broken vaulting and flew with noisy wings above the ruined altars. Another sound came like a great beating of wings, with a swifter rush. It was a shell, and the vibration of it stirred the crumbling masonry, and bits of it fell into the clatter of the littered floor. On the way to the ruin of the bishop's chapel, I passed a group of stone figures. They were the famous Angels of Arras, removed from some other part of the building to what might have been a safer place. Now they were fallen angels, mangled as they lay. But in the chapel beyond, where the light streamed through the broken panes of stained-glass windows, one figure stood untouched in all this ruin. It was a tall statue of Christ, standing in an attitude of meekness and sorrow, as though in the presence of those who crucified him. Yet something more wonderful than this scene of tragedy lived in the midst of it. Yet there were still people living in Arras. They lived an underground life for the most part, coming up from the underworld to blink in the sunlight, to mutter a prayer or a curse or two, to gaze for a moment at any change made by a new day's bombardment, and then to burrow down again at the shock of a gun. Through low archways just above the pavement I looked down into some of the deep vaulted cellars where the merchants used to stock their wine and saw old women, and sometimes young women there, cooking over little stoves pottering about iron bedsteads, busy with domestic work. Some of them looked up as I passed, and my eyes and theirs stared into each other. The women's faces were lined and their eyes sunken. They had the look of people who had lived through many agonies and have more to suffer. Not all these citizens of Arras were below ground. There was a greengrocer's shop still carrying on a little trade. I went into another shop and bought some picture postcards of the ruins within a few yards of it. The woman behind the counter was a comely soul and laughed because she had no change. Only two days before, a seventeen-inch shell had burst fifty yards or so away from her shop, which was close enough for death. I marveled at the risk she took with cheerful smiles. Was it courage or stupidity? One of the old women in the street grasped my arm in a friendly way, and called me Cher Petite Ami, and described how she had been nearly killed a hundred times. When I asked her why she stayed, she gave an old woman's cackling laugh and said, Que voulez-vous, jeune homme? Which did not seem a satisfactory answer. As dusk crept into the streets of Arras, I saw small groups of boys and girls. They seemed to come out of holes in the ground to stare at this Englishman in khaki. "'Are you afraid of the shells?' I asked. They grimaced up at the sky and giggled. They had got used to the hell of it all, and dodged death as they would a man with a whip, shouting with laughter beyond the length of his lash. In one of the vaulted cellars underground, when English soldiers first went in, there lived a group of girls who gave them wine to drink and kisses for a franc or two and the Circe cup of pleasure, if they had time to stay. Overhead shells were howling. Their city was stricken with death. These women lived like witches in a cave, a strange and dreadful life. I walked to the suburb of Blangy by way of San Nicolas, and came to a sinister place. Along the high road from Arras to Douai was a great factory of some kind, probably for beet sugar and then a street of small houses with backyards and gardens much like those in our own suburbs. Holes had been knocked through the walls of the factory and houses. The gardens had been barricaded with barbed wire and sandbags, and the passage from house to house and between the overturned boilers of the factory formed a communication trench to the advanced outpost in the last house held by the French, on the other side of which is the enemy. As we made our way through these ruined houses, we had to walk very quietly and to speak in whispers. In the last house of all, which was a combination of fort and dugout, absolute silence was necessary, 
for there were German soldiers only ten yards away, with trench mortars and bombs and rifles always ready to snipe across the walls. Through a chink no wider than my finger I could see the red brick ruins of houses inhabited by the enemy and the road to Douai. The road to Douai, as seen through this chink, was a tangle of broken bricks. The enemy was so close to Arras when the French held it that there were many places where one had to step quietly and duck one's head, or get behind the shelter of a broken wall, to avoid a sniper's bullet or the rattle of bullets from a machine gun. As I left Arras in that November evening, darkness closed in its ruined streets and shells were crashing over the city from French guns, answered now and then by enemy batteries. But in a moment of rare silence I heard the chime of a church clock. It seemed like the sweet voice of that old-time peace in Arras before the days of its agony, and I thought of that solitary bell sounding above the ruins in a ghostly way. Chapter 15 While we hung on the news from Verdun, it seemed as though the fate of the world were in Fort Duamont, our own lists of death grew longer. In the casualty clearing station at Poporinga, more mangled men lay on their stretchers, hobbled to the ambulance trains, groped blindly with one hand clutching at a comrade's arm. More and more and more, with head wounds and body wounds, with trench feet and gas. Oh, Christ, said one of them, whom I knew. He had been laid on a swing bed in the ambulance train. Now you'll be comfortable and happy, said the RAMC orderly. The boy groaned again. He was suffering intolerable agony and grasping a strap, hauled himself up a little with a wet sweat breaking out on his forehead. Another boy came along alone with one hand in a pink bandage. He told me that it was smashed to bits and began to cry. Then he smudged the tears away and said, I'm lucky enough. I saw many fellows killed. So it happened, day by day, but the courage of our men endured. It seemed impossible to newcomers that life could exist at all under the shell-fire which the Germans flung over our trenches and which we flung over theirs. So it seemed to the Irish battalions when they held the lines around Luce by that Hohenzoller redoubt, which was one of our little hells. Things happened, said one of them, which in our times would have been called miracles. We all had hairbreadth escapes from death. For days they were under heavy fire, with nine-point-twos flinging up volumes of sand and earth and stones about them, then waves of poison gas, then trench mortars and bombs. It seemed like years, said one of the Irish crowd. None of us expected to come out alive. Yet most of them had the luck to come out alive that time, and over a midday mess in a Flemish farmhouse they had hearty appetites for bully beef and fried potatoes, washed down by thin red wine and strong black coffee. Around Ypres and up by Bozinga and Hooge, do you remember Hooge? The 14th, 20th, and 6th Divisions took turns in wet ditches and in shell holes, with heavy crumps falling fast and roaring before they burst like devils of hell. On one day there were 300 casualties in one battalion, the German gunfire lengthened, and men were killed on their way out to rest camps to the left of the road between Poporinga and Vlamartinga. On March 28th, the Royal Fusiliers and the Northumberland Fusiliers, the old fighting fifth, captured 600 yards of German trenches near saint Eloi, and asked for trouble, which, sure enough, came to them who followed them. Their attack was against a German stronghold built of earth and sandbags nine feet high, above a nest of trenches in the fork of two roads from St. Eloi to Messines. They mined beneath this place, and it blew up with a roaring blast which flung up tons of soil in a black mass. Then the fusiliers dashed forward, flinging bombs through barbed wire and over sandbags which had escaped the radius of the mine burst in one jumbled mass of human bodies in a hurry to get on, to kill, and to come back. One German machine gun got to work on them. It was knocked out by a bomb flung by an officer who saved his company. The machine gunners were bayoneted. Elsewhere there was chaos out of which living men came, shaking and moaning. 
I saw the Royal Fusiliers and the Northumberland Fusiliers come back from this exploit, exhausted, caked from head to foot in wet clay. Their steel helmets were covered with sandbagging. Their trench waders, their rifles, and smoke helmets were all plastered by wet white earth, and they looked a ragged regiment of scarecrows gathered from the fields of France. Some of them had shawls tied above their helmets, and some of them wore the shiny black helmets of the Jaeger regiment and the gray coats of German soldiers. They had had luck. They had not left many comrades behind, and they had come out with life to the good world. Tired as they were, they came along as though to carnival. They had proved their courage through an ugly job. They had done damn well, as one of them remarked, and they were out of the shell fire which ravaged the ground they had taken where other men lay. Chapter 16 at the beginning of March there was a little affair, costing a lot of lives, in the neighborhood of St. Alva, up in the Ypres salient. It was a struggle for the dirty hillock called the Bluff, which had been held for a long time by the 3rd Division under General Haldane, whose men were at last relieved, after weary months in the salient, by the 17th Division, commanded by General Pilcher. The Germans took advantage of the change in defense by a sudden attack after the explosion of a mine, and the men of the 17th Division, new to this ground, abandoned a position of some local importance. General Haldane was annoyed. It was a ground of which he knew every inch. It was ground which men of his had died to hold. It was very annoying, using a feeble word, to battalion officers and men of the 3rd Division, Suffolk's and King's own Liverpools, Gordons, and Royal Scots, who had first come out of the salient, out of its mud and snow and slush and shell-fire, to a pretty village far behind the lines on the road to Calais, where they were getting back to a sense of normal life again. Sleeping in snug billets, warming their feet at wood fires, listening with enchantment to the silence about them, free from the noise of artillery. They were hugging themselves with the thought of a month of this. Then, because they had been in the salient so long, and had held this line so stubbornly, they were ordered back again to recapture the position lost by new men. After a day of field sports, they were having a boxing match in an old barn, very merry and bright, before the news came to them. General Haldane had given me a quiet word about it, and I watched the boxing and the faces of all those men crowded round the ring with pity for the frightful disappointment that was about to fall on them like a sledgehammer. I knew some of their officers, Colonel Dyson of the Royal Scots and Captain Heathcote, who hated the war and all its ways with a deadly hatred, having seen much slaughter of men and of their own officers. Colonel Dyson was the 17th commanding officer of his battalion, which had been commanded by every officer down to second lieutenant, and had had only thirty men left of the original crowd. They had been slain in large numbers in that holding attack by Hooge on September 25th during the Battle of Luz, as I have told. Now they were going in again, and were very sorry for themselves, but hid their feelings from their men. The men were tough and stalwart lads, tanned by the wind and rain of a foul winter, thinned down by the ordeal of those months in the line under daily bouts of fire. In a wooden gallery of the barn a mass of them lay in deep straw, exchanging caps, whistling, shouting in high spirits. Not yet did they know the call back to the salient. Then word was passed to them after the boxing finals. That night they had to march seven miles to entrain for the railroad near Astuipa. I saw them march away, silently, grimly, bravely, without many curses. They were to recapture the bluff, and early on the morning of March 2nd, before dawn had risen, I went out to the salient and watched the bombardment which preceded the attack. There was an incessant tumult of guns, and the noise rolled in waves across the flat country of the salient and echoed back to Kemmel Hill and the Wichita Ridge. There was a white frost over the fields, and all the battlefront was veiled by a mist which clung round the villages and farmsteads behind the lines and made a dense bank of gray fog below the rising ground. This curtain was rent with flashes of light, 
and little glinting stars burst continually over one spot where the bluff was hidden beyond Zilbeke Lake. When daybreak came, with the rim of a red sun over a clump of trees in the east, the noise of guns increased in spasms of intensity like a rising storm. Many batteries of heavy artillery were firing salvos. Field guns, widely scattered, concentrated their fire upon one area where their shells were bursting with a twinkle of light. Somewhere a machine gun was at work with sharp staccato strokes, like an urgent knocking at the door. High overhead was the song of an airplane coming nearer with a high, vibrant humming. It was an enemy searching through the mist down below him for any movement of troops or trains. It was the 76th Brigade of the 3rd Division, which attacked at 4.32 that morning, and they were the Suffolk's, Gordon's, and King's own Liverpool's, who led the assault, commanded by General Pratt. They flung themselves into the German lines in the wake of a heavy barrage fire, smashing through broken belts of wire and stumbling in and out of shell craters. The Germans in their front lines had gone to cover in deep dugouts, which they had built with feverish haste on the bluff and its neighborhood during the previous ten days and nights. At first only a few men, not more than a hundred or so, could be discovered alive. The dead were thick in the maze of trenches, and our men stumbled across them. The living were in a worse state than the dead, dazed by the shell-fire and cold with terror when our men sprang upon them in the darkness before dawn. Small parties were collected and passed back as prisoners, marvelously lucky men if they kept their sanity as well as their lives after all that hell about them. Hours later, when our battalions had stormed their way up other trenches into the salient jutting out of the German line and beyond the boundary of the objective that had been given to them, other living men were found to be still hiding in the depths of other dugouts and could not be induced to come out. Terror kept them in those holes, and they were like wild beasts at bay, still dangerous because they had their bombs and rifles. An ultimatum was shouted down to them by men too busy for persuasive talk. If you don't come out, you'll be blown in. Some of them came out, and others were blown to bits. After that, the usual thing happened, the thing that inevitably happened in all these little murderous attacks and counterattacks. The enemy concentrated all its power of artillery on that position captured by our men, and day after day hurled over storms of shrapnel and high explosives, under which our men cowered until many were killed and more wounded. The first attack on the bluff and its recapture cost us three thousand casualties, and that was only the beginning of a daily toll of life and limbs in that neighborhood of hell. Through driving snowstorms, shells went rushing across that battleground, ceaselessly in those first weeks of March, but the third division repulsed the enemy's repeated attacks in bombing fights which were very fierce on both sides. I went to General Pilcher's headquarters at Renninghelz on March 4th and found the staff of the 17th Division frosty in their greeting, while General Pratt, the brigadier of the 3rd Division, was conducting the attack in their new territory. General Pilcher himself was much shaken. The old gentleman had been at St. Eloi when the bombardment had begun on his men. With Captain Ratnag, his ADC, he lay for an hour in a ditch with shells screaming overhead and bursting close. More than once, when I talked with him, he raised his head and listened nervously and said, Do you hear the guns? They are terrible. I was sorry for him, this general who had many theories on war and experimented in light signals, as when one night I stood by his side in a dark field and had a courteous, old-fashioned dignity and gentleness of manner. He was a fine old English gentleman and a gallant soldier, but modern warfare was too brutal for him, too brutal for all those who hated its slaughter. Those men of the 3rd Division, the Iron Division, as it was called later in the war, remained in a hideous turmoil of wet earth up by the bluff until other men came to relieve them and take over this corner of hell. What remained of the trenches was deep in water and filthy mud where the bodies of many dead Germans lay under a litter of broken sandbags and in the holes of half-destroyed dugouts. Nothing could be done to make it less horrible. Then the weather changed and became icily cold with snow and rain. One dugout, which had been taken for battalion headquarters, 
was six feet long by four wide, and here, in this waterlogged hole, lived three officers of the Royal Scots, to whom a day or two before I had wished good luck. The servants lived in a shaft alongside, which was a place measuring four feet by four feet. There were no other dugouts where men could get any shelter from shells or storms, and the enemy's guns were never silent. But the men held on, as most of our men held on, with a resignation to fate and a stoic endurance beyond that ordinary human courage which we seemed to know before the war. The chaplain of this battalion had spent all the long night behind the lines stoking fires and going round the cookhouses and looking at his wristwatch to see how the minutes were crawling past he had tea rum socks oil and food all ready for those who were coming back and the lighted braziers were glowing red at the appointed time the padre went out to meet his friends pressing forward through the snow and listening for any sound of footsteps through the great hush but there were no sounds except the soft flutter of snowflakes he strained his eyes for any moving shadows of men, but there was only darkness and the falling snow. Two hours passed, and they seemed endless to that young chaplain, whose brain was full of frightful apprehensions, so that they were hours of anguish to him. Then at last the first men appeared. "'I've never seen anything so splendid and so pitiful,' said the man who had been waiting for them. They came along at about a mile an hour, sometimes in groups, sometimes in twos or threes, holding on to each other, often one by one. In this order they crept through the ruined villages, in the falling snow, which lay thick upon the masses of fallen masonry. There was a profound silence about them, and these snow-covered men were like ghosts walking through cities of death. No man spoke for the sound of human voice would have seemed a danger in this great white quietude. They were walking like old men, weak-kneed, and bent under the weight of their packs and rifles. Yet when the young padre greeted them, the cheery voice that hid the water in his heart, every one had a word and a smile in reply, and made little jests about their drunken footsteps, for they were like drunken men with utter weariness. "'What price Charlie Chaplin now, sir?' was one man's joke. The last of those who came back, and there were many who never came back, were some hours later than the first company, having found it hard to crawl along that Via Dolorosa, which led to the good place where the braziers were glowing. It was a heroic episode, for each one of these men was a hero, though his name will never be known in the history of that silent and hidden war. And yet it was an ordinary episode, no degree worse in its hardship than what happened all along the line when there was an attack or counterattack in foul weather. The marvel of it was that our men, who were very simple men, should have stuck it out with the grandeur of courage which endured all things without self-interest and without emotion. They were unconscious of the virtue that was in them. Chapter 17 Going up to the line by Ypres, or Armentieres, or Luce, I noticed in those early months of 1916 an increasing power of artillery on our side of the lines, and a growing intensity of gunfire on both sides. Time was, a year before, when our batteries were scattered thinly behind the lines, and when our gunners had to be thrifty of shells, saving them up anxiously for hours of great need when the SOS rocket shot up a green light from some battered trench upon which the enemy was concentrating hate. Those were ghastly days for gunner officers, who had to answer telephone messages calling for help from battalions whose billets were being shelled to pieces by long-range howitzers, or from engineers whose working parties were being sniped to death by German field guns, or from a brigadier who wanted to know plaintively whether the artillery could not deal with a certain gun which was enfilading a certain trench and piling up the casualties. It was hard to say, Sorry, we've got to go slow with ammunition. That now was ancient history. For some time the fields had grown a new crop of British batteries. Month after month our weight of metal increased, and while the field guns had been multiplying at a great rate, the heavies had been coming out too and giving a deeper and more sonorous tone to that swelling chorus which rolled over the battlefields by day and night. 
there was a larger supply of shells for all those pieces and no longer the same need for thrift when there was urgent need for artillery support retaliation was the order of the day and if the enemy asked for trouble by any special show of hate he got it quickly and with a double dose compared with the infantry the gunners had a chance of life except in places where as in the salient the german observers stared down at them from high ground and saw every gun flash and registered every battery going around the salient one day with general burstall and a very good name too who was then the canadian gunner general i was horrified at the way in which the enemy had the accurate range of our guns and gun pits and knocked them out with deadly shooting here and there our amateur gunners quick to learn their job found a good place and were able to camouflage their position for a time and give praise to the little god of luck until one day sooner or later they were discovered and a quick move was necessary if they were not caught too soon so it was with a battery in the open fields beyond kemmel village where i went to see a boy who had once been a rising hope of fleet street he was new to his work and liked the adventure of it that was before his men were blown to bits around him and he was sent down as a tragic case of shell shock and as we walked through the village of kemmel he chatted cheerfully about his work and life and found it topping his bright luminous eyes were undimmed by the scene around him he walked in a jaunty boyish way through that ruined place it was not a pleasant place kemmel village even in those days had been blown to bits except where on the outskirts the chateau with its racing stables remained untouched german spies said the boy and where a little grotto of our lady of lords was also unscathed the church was battered and broken and there were enormous shell pits in the churchyard and open vaults where old dead had been tumbled out of their tombs we walked along a sunken road and then to a barn in open fields the roof was pierced by shrapnel bullets which let in the rain on wet days and nights but it was cosy otherwise in the room above the ladder where the officers had their mess there were some homemade chairs up there and kitchener prints of naked little ladies were tacked up to the beams among the trench maps and round the fireplace where logs were burning with a canvas screen to let down at night a gramophone played merry music and gave a homelike touch to this parlor in war a good spot i said is it well hidden as safe as houses said the captain of the battery touching wood i mean there were six of us sitting at a wooden plank on trestles and at those words five young men rose with a look of fright on their faces and embraced the beam supporting the roof of the barn what's happened i asked not having heard the howl of a shell nothing said the boy except touching wood the captain spoke too loudly we went out to the guns which were to do a little shooting and found them camouflaged from aerial eyes in the grim desolation of the battlefield all white after a morning snowstorm except where the broken walls of distant farmhouses and the windmills on kemmel hill showed black as ink the gunners could not see their target which had been given to them through the telephone but they knew it by the figures giving the angle of fire it's a pumping party in a waterlogged trench said the bright-eyed boy by my side he was one of the rising hopes of fleet street before he became a gunner officer in flanders with any luck we'll get em in the neck and i like to hear the germans squeal and my guns ready first as usual the officer commanding shouted through a tin megaphone and the battery fired each gun following its brother at a second interval with the staccato shock of a field piece which is more painful than the dull roar of a heavy the word came along the wire from the officer in the observation post a mile away another order was called through the tin mouthpiece repeat we've got em said the young gentleman by my side in a cheerful way the officer with the megaphone looked across and smiled we may as well give them a salvo they won't like it a bit a second or two later there was a tremendous crash as the four guns fired together repeat came the high voice through the megaphone the still air was rent again in a waterlogged trench which we could not see a german pumping party had been blown to bits the artillery officers took turns in the observation post sleeping for the night in one of the dugouts behind the trench instead of in the billet below the weight of the observation post 
was sometimes a little vague, especially in the frost and thaw weather, when parts of the communication trenches slithered down under the weight of sandbags. The young officer who walked with luminous eyes and eager step found it necessary to crawl on his stomach before he reached his lookout station, from which he looked straight across the enemy's trenches. But once there it was pretty comfortable and safe, barring a direct hit from above or a little mining operation underneath. He made a seat of a well-filled sandbag. It was rather a shock when he turned it over one day to get dry side up and found a dead Frenchman there, and smoked Belgian cigars for the sake of their aroma, and sat there very solitary and watchful. The rats worried him a little. They were bold enough to bare their teeth when they met him down a trench, and there was one big fellow called Cuthbert who romped around his dugout and actually bit his ear one night. But these inconveniences did not seem to give any real distress to the soul of youth, out there alone and searching for human targets to kill, until one day, as I have said, everything snapped in him, and the boy was broken. It was on the way back from Kemmel village one day that I met a queer apparition through a heavy snowstorm. It was a French civilian in evening dress, boiled shirt, white tie and all, with a bowler hat bent to the storm. Tomlinson, the great Tomlinson, was with me and shook his head. It isn't true, he said. I don't believe it. We're mad. That's all. The whole world is mad. So why should we be sane? We stared after the man who went into the ruin of Kemmel to the noise of gunfire in evening dress, without an overcoat, through a blizzard of snow. A little farther down the road we passed a signboard on the edge of a cratered field. New words had been painted on it in good Roman letters. Cimetière Reserve. Tomlinson, the only Tomlinson, regarded it gravely and turned to me with a world of meaning in his eyes. Then he tapped his forehead and laughed. Mad, he said. We're all mad. Chapter 18 In that winter of discontent there was one great body of splendid men whose spirits had sunk to zero seeing no hope ahead of them in that warfare of trenches and barbed wire. The cavalry believed they were bunkered forever, and that all their training and tradition were made futile by the digging in of armies. Now and again, when the infantry was hard-pressed, as in the Second Battle of Ypres and the Battle of Luce, they were called on to leave their horses behind and take a turn in the trenches, and then they came back again, lest some of their comrades into dirty billets, remote from the fighting lines, to exercise their horses and curse the war. Before they went into the line in February of 16, I went to see some of those cavalry officers to wish them good luck, and saw them in the trenches and afterward when they came out. In the headquarters of a squadron of royals, the way in was by a ladder through the window, billeted in a village, which on a day of frost looked as quaint and pretty as a Christmas card, was a party of officers typical of the British cavalry as a whole. A few pictures cut out of La Vie Parisienne were tacked onto the walls to remind them of the arts and graces of an older mode of life, and to keep them human by the sight of a pretty face. Oh, to see a pretty girl again! Now they were going to change this cottage for the trenches, this quiet village with a church bell chiming every hour for the tumult in the battlefront this absolute safety for the immediate menace of death. They knew already the beastliness of life in trenches. They had no illusions about glory, but they were glad to go because activity was better than inactivity, and because the risk would give them back their pride, and because the cavalry should fight anyhow and somehow, even if a charge or a pursuit were denied them. They had a hot time in the trenches. The enemy's artillery was active, and the list of casualties began to tot up. A good officer and a fine fellow was killed almost at the outset, and men were horribly wounded. But all those troopers showed a cool courage. Things looked bad for a few minutes when a section of trenches was blown in, isolating one platoon from another. A sergeant major made his way back from the damaged section, and a young officer who was going forward to find out the extent of damage met him on the way. "'Can I get through?' asked the officer. "'I've got through,' was the answer. "'But it's chancing one's luck.' The officer chanced his luck. 
but did not expect to come back alive. Afterward, he tried to analyze his feelings for my benefit. I had no sense of fear, he said, but a sort of subconscious knowledge that the odds were against me if I went on, and yet conscious determination to go on at all costs and find out what had happened. He came back, covered with blood, but unwounded. In spite of all the unpleasant sights in the crumpled trench, he had the heart to smile when in the middle of the night one of the sergeants approached him with an amiable suggestion. "'Don't you think it would be a good time, sir, to make a slight attack upon the enemy?' There was something in those words, a slight attack, which is irresistibly comic to any of us who know the conditions of modern trench war. But they were not spoken in jest. So the cavalry did its bit again, though not as cavalry, and I saw some of them when they came back, and they were glad to have gone through that bloody business so that no man might fling a scornful word as they passed with their horses. "'It is queer,' said my friend, "'how we go from this place of peace to the battlefield, and then come back for a spell before going up again. It is like passing from one life to another.' In that cavalry mess I heard queer conversations. Those officers belonged to the old families of England, the old caste of aristocracy, but the foul outrage of the war, the outrage against all ideals of civilization, had made them think, some of them for the first time, about the structure of social life and of the human family. They hated Germany as the direct cause of war, but they looked deeper than that and saw how the leaders of all great nations in Europe had maintained the philosophy of forms, and had built up hatreds and fears and alliances over the heads of the people whom they inflamed with passion or duped with lies. The politicians are the guilty ones, said one cavalry officer. I am all for revolution after this bloody massacre. I would hang all politicians, diplomats, and so-called statesmen with strict impartiality. I'm for the people, said another. The poor bloody people who are kept in ignorance and then driven into the shambles when their rulers desire to grab some new part of the earth's surface or to get their armies going because they are bored with peace. What price Christianity? asked another, inevitably. What have the churches done to stop war or preach the gospel of Christ? The Bishop of London, the Archbishop of Canterbury, all those conventional patriotic cannon-blessing, banner-baptizing humbugs. God, they make me tired. Strange words to hear in a cavalry mess. Strange turmoil in the souls of men. They were the same words I had heard from London boys in Ypres, spoken just as crudely. But many young gentlemen who spoke those words have already forgotten them, or would deny them. Chapter 19 The winter of 1915-16 passed with its misery and spring came again to France and Flanders with its promise of life, fulfilled in the beauty of wild flowers and the green of leaves where the earth was not made barren by the fire of war and all trees killed. For men there was no promise of life, but only new preparations for death and continued killing. The Battle of Verdun was still going on, and France had saved herself from a mortal blow at the heart by a desperate heroic resistance which cost her 550,000 in dead and wounded. On the British front there were still no great battles, but those trench raids, artillery duels, mine fighting, and small massacres which filled the casualty clearing stations with the average amount of human wreckage. The British armies were being held in leash for a great offensive in the summer. New divisions were learning the lessons of the old divisions, and here and there generals were doing a little fancy work to keep things merry and bright. So it was when some mines were exploded under the German earthworks on the lower slopes of the Vimy Ridge, where the enemy had already blown several mines and taken possession of their craters. It was to gain those craters, and new ones, to be made by our mine charges, that the 74th Brigade of the 25th Division, a body of Lancashire men, the 9th Loyal North Lancashires, and the 11th Royal Fusiliers, with a company of royal engineers and some Welsh pioneers, were detailed for the perilous adventure of driving in the mine shafts, putting tremendous charges of high explosives in the sap heads, and rushing the German positions. 
It was on the evening of May 15th, after two days of wet and cloudy weather preventing the enemy's observation, that our heavy artillery fired a short number of rounds to send the Germans into their dugouts. A few minutes later, the right group of mines exploded with a terrific roar and blew in two of the five old german craters after the long rumble of heaving earth had been stilled there was just time enough to hear the staccato of a german machine-gun then there was a second roar and a wild upheaval of soil when the left group of mines destroyed two more of the german craters and knocked out the machine-gun the moment for the infantry attack had come and the men were ready the first to get away were two lieutenants of the ninth loyal north lancashires who rushed forward with their assaulting parties to the remaining crater on the extreme left which had not been blown up with little opposition from dazed and terror-stricken germans bayoneted as they scrambled out of the chaotic earth our men flung themselves into those smoking pits and were followed immediately by working parties who built up bombing posts with earth and sandbags on the crater lip and began to dig out communication trenches leading to them. The assaulting parties of the Lancashire Fusiliers were away at the first signal, and were attacking the other groups of craters under heavy fire. The Germans were shaken with terror because the explosion of the mines had killed and wounded a large number of them, and through the darkness there rang out the cheers of masses of men who were out for blood. Through the darkness there now glowed a scarlet light flooding all that turmoil of earth and men with a vivid red illumination, as flare after flare rose high into the sky from several points of the German line. Later the red lights died down, and then other rockets were fired, giving a green light to the scene of war. The German gunners were now at work in answer to those beacons of distress, and with every caliber of gun from howitzers to minenwerfers, they shelled our front lines for two hours and killed for vengeance they were too late to stop the advance of the assaulting troops who were fighting in the craters against groups of german bombers who tried to force their way up to the rescue of a position already lost one of our officers leading the assault on one of the craters on the right was killed very quickly but his men were not checked and with individual resolution and initiative and the grit of the lancashire men in a tight place fought on grimly and won their purpose a young lieutenant fell dead from a bullet wound after he had directed his men to their posts from the lip of a new mine crater as coolly as though he were a master of ceremonies in a lancashire ballroom another a champion bomb thrower with a range of forty yards flung his hand grenades at the enemy with untiring skill and with a fierce contempt of death until he was killed by an answering shot the NCOs took up the command, and the men carried on until they held all the chain of craters, crouching and panting above mangled men. They were hours of anguish for many Germans, who lay wounded and half-buried, or quite buried, in the chaos of earth made by those mine craters, now doubly upheaved. Their screams and moans sounding above the guns, the frantic cries of men maddened under tons of earth, which kept them prisoners in deep pits below the crater lips, and awful inarticulate noises of human pain coming out of that lower darkness beyond the light of the rockets made up a chorus of agony more than our men could endure even in the heat of battle they shouted across the german grenadiers we will cease fire if you will and let you get in your wounded cease fire for the wounded the shout was repeated and our bombers held their hands still waiting for an answer but the answer was a new storm of bombs and the fighting went on and the moaning of the men who were helpless and unhelped working parties followed up the assault to consolidate the position they did amazing things toiling in the darkness under abominable shell fire and by daylight had built communication trenches with head cover from the crater lips to our front line trenches but now it was the enemy's turn the turn of his guns which poured explosive fire into those pits churning up the earth again mixing it with new flesh and blood and carving up his own dead and it was the turn of his bombers who followed this fire in strong assaults upon the lancashire lads who lying among their killed and wounded had to repel those fierce attacks on may seventeenth i went to see general duran of the twenty fifth division an optimistic old gentleman who took a bright view of things and colonel crosby who was acting brigadier of the seventy fourth brigade which had made the attack 
he too was enthusiastic about the situation though his brigade had suffered eight hundred casualties in a month of routine warfare in my simple way i asked him a direct question do you think your men can hold on to the crater sir colonel crosby stared at me sternly certainly the position cannot be retaken over ground we hold it strongly as he spoke an orderly came into his billet a small farmhouse saluted and handed him a pink slip which was a telephone message i watched him read it and saw the sudden pallor of his face and noticed how the room shook with the constant reverberation of distant gunfire a big bombardment was in progress over vimy way excuse me said the colonel things seem to be happening i must go at once he went through the window leaping the sill and a look of bad tidings went with him his men had been blown out of the craters a staff officer sat in the brigade office and when the acting brigadier had gone raised his head and looked across to me i'm a critic of these affairs he said they seem to me too expensive but i'm here to do what i am told we did not regain the vimy craters until a year afterward when the canadians and scottish captured all the vimy ridge in a great assault chapter twenty the winter of discontent had passed summer had come with a wealth of beauty in the fields of france this side the belt of blasted earth the grass was a tapestry of flowers and tits and warblers and the golden oriole were making music in the woods at dusk the nightingale sang as though no war were near its love and at broad noonday a million larks rose above the tall wheat with a great high chorus of glad notes among the british armies there was hope again immense faith that believed once more in an ending to the war verdun had been saved the enemy had been slaughtered his reserves were thin and hard to get so said intelligence and the british stronger than they had ever been in men and guns and shells and aircraft and all material of war were going to be launched in a great offensive no more trench warfare no more dying in ditches out into the open with an army of pursuit rawlinson's and a quick breakthrough it was to be the great push the last battles were to be fought before the year died again though many men would die before that time up in the salient something happened to make men question the weakness of the enemy but the news did not spread very far and there was a lot to do elsewhere on the somme where the salient seemed a long way off it was the canadians to whom it happened and it was an ugly thing on june second a flame of fire from many batteries opened upon their lines in sanctuary wood and maple copse beyond the lines of ypres and tragedy befell them I went to see those who lived through it and stood in the presence of men who had escaped from the very pits of that hell which had been invented by human beings out of the earth's chemistry and yet it kept their reason the enemy's bombardment began suddenly with one great crash of guns at half past eight on friday morning generals mercer and williams had gone up to inspect the trenches at six o'clock in the morning it had been almost silent along the lines when the enemy's batteries opened fire with one enormous thunderstroke which was followed by continuous salvos the shells came from nearly every point of the compass north east and south the evil spell of the salient was over our men again in the trenches just south of hooge were the princess patricia's light infantry with some battalions of the royal canadian regiment south of them and some of the canadian mounted rifles who had long been dismounted and units from another canadian division at the extreme end of their line of front it was those men who had to suffer the tempest of the enemy's shells earth below them opened up into great craters as high explosive shells burst continually flinging up masses of soil flattening out breastworks and scattering sandbags into dust canadians in the front trenches held on in the midst of this uproar they took it all said one of the officers and in that phrase spoken simply by a man who was there too lies the spirit of pride and sacrifice they took it all and did not budge though the sky seemed to be opening above them and the earth below them the bombardment continued without a pause for five hours by which time most of our front trenches had been annihilated at about a quarter past one the enemy's guns lifted a little 
and through the dense smoke clouds, which made a solid bar across no man's land, appeared a mass of German infantry. They wore their packs in full field kit, as though they had come to stay. Perhaps they expected that no one lived in the British trenches, and it was a reasonable idea, but wrong. There were brave men remaining there, alive and determined to fight. Although the order for retirement had been given, single figures here and there were seen to get over the broken parapets and go forward to meet the enemy halfway. They died to a man fighting. It seemed to me one of the most pitiful and heroic things of this war, that little crowd of men, many of them wounded, some of them dazed and deaf, stumbling forward to their certain death to oppose the enemy's advance. From the network of trenches behind, not altogether smashed, there was time for men to retire to a second line of defense if they were still unwounded and had strength to go. An officer, Captain Crossman, in command of one of these support companies, brought several men out of a trench, but did not follow on. He turned again, facing the enemy, and was last seen, a big husky man, says one of his comrades, as he fired his revolver and then flung it into a German's face. Colonel Shaw of the 1st Battalion CMR rallied eighty men out of the Cumberland dugouts and died fighting. The Germans were kept at bay for some time, but they flung their bombs into the square of men, so that very few remained alive. When only eight were still fighting among the bodies of their comrades, these tattered and blood-splashed men, standing there fiercely contemptuous of the enemy and death, were ordered to retire by Major Palmer, the last officer among them. Meanwhile, the battalions in support were holding firm in spite of the shell-fire, which raged above them also, and it was against the second line of Canadians that the German infantry came up and broke. In the center, the German thrust was hard toward Zilbeka Lake. Here some of the Canadian rifles were in support, and as soon as the infantry attack began, they were ordered forward to meet and check the enemy. An officer in command of one of their battalions afterward told me that he led his men across country to Maple Copse under such fire as he had never seen. Because of the comrades in front, in dire need of help, no notice was taken as the wounded fell, but the others pressed on as fast as they could go. Maple Copse was reached, and here the men halted and awaited the enemy with another battalion, who were already holding this wood of six or seven acres. When the German troops arrived, they may have expected to meet no great resistance. They met a withering fire, which caused them bloody losses. The Canadians had assembled at various points, which became strongholds of defense with machine guns and bomb stores, and the men held their fire until the enemy was within close range, so that they worked havoc among them. But the German guns never ceased, and many Canadians fell. Colonel E. H. Baker, a member of the Canadian Parliament, fell with a piece of shell in his lung. Hour after hour our gunners fed their breeches and poured out shells. The edge of the salient was swept with fire, and though the Canadian losses were frightful, the Germans suffered also, so that the battlefield was one great shambles. Our own wounded, who were brought back, owe their lives to the stretcher-bearers, who were supreme in devotion. They worked in and out across that shell-swept ground, hour after hour, through the day and night, rescuing many stricken men at a great cost in life to themselves. Out of one party of twenty, only five remained alive. No one can say, said one of their officers, that the Canadians do not know how to die. No one would deny that. Out of 3,000 men in the Canadian 8th Brigade, their casualties were 2,200. There were 151 survivors from the 1st Battalion Canadian Mounted Rifles, 130 from the 4th Battalion, 350 from the 5th, 520 from the 2nd. Those were the figures of massacre. Eleven days later, the Canadians took their revenge. Their own guns were but a small part of the huge orchestra of heavies and field batteries which played the devil's tattoo upon the German positions in our old trenches. It was annihilating, and the German soldiers had to endure the same experience as their guns had given to Canadian troops on the same ground. Trenches already battered were smashed again. The earth, which was plowed with shells in their own attack, was flung up again by our shells. It was hell again for poor human wretches. The Canadian troops charged at two o'clock in the morning. Their attack was directed to the part of the line from the southern end of Sanctuary Wood 
to Mount Gorst, about a mile, which included Armagh Woods, Observatory Hill, and Mount Gorst itself. The attack went quickly, and the men expected greater trouble. The enemy's shellfire was heavy, but the Canadians got through under cover of their own guns, which had lengthened their fuses a little, and continued an intense bombardment behind the enemy's first line. The men advanced in open order, and worked downward and southward into their old positions. In one place of attack, about forty Germans who fought desperately were killed almost to a man, just as Colonel Shaw had died on June 2nd with his party of eighty men who had rallied round him. It was one shambles for another, and the Germans were not less brave, it seems. One officer and one hundred and thirteen men surrendered. The officer was glad to escape from the death to which he had resigned himself when our bombardment began. I knew how it would be, he said. We had orders to take this ground, and took it, but we knew you would come back again. You had to do so, so here I am. Parts of the line were deserted except by the dead. In one place the stores, which had been buried by the Canadians before they left, were still there, untouched by the enemy. Our bombardment had made it impossible for his troops to consolidate their position and to hold the line steady. They had just taken cover in the old bits of trench, in shell holes and craters, and behind scattered sandbags, and had been pounded there. The Canadians were back again. End of section 12「Section 13 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5. The Heart of a City. Amiens in Time of War. Chapters 1 to 9. Chapter 1. During the battles of the Somme in 1916, and afterward in periods of progress and retreat over the abominable fields, the city of Amiens was the capital of the British Army. When the battles began in July of that year, it was only a short distance away from the fighting lines, near enough to hear the incessant roar of gunfire on the French front and ours, and near enough to get by motor car or lorry in less than thirty minutes to places where men were being killed or maimed or blinded in the routine of the day's work. One went out past Amiens Station and across a little stone bridge, which afterward, in the enemy's advance of 1918, became the mark for German high velocities, along the road to Kerieu, where Rawlinson had his headquarters of the Fourth Army in an old chateau, with pleasant meadows round it and a stream meandering through fields of buttercups in summertime. Beyond the dusty village of Kerieu, with its white cottages, from which the plaster fell off in blotches as the war went on, we went along the straight high road to Albert, through the long and straggling village of La Soussois, where Scottish soldiers in reserve lounged about among frowsy peasant women and played solemn games with the Berns, and so past camps and hutments on each side of the road to the ugly red-brick town where the golden virgin hung head downward from the broken tower of the church with her babe outstretched above the fields of death as though as a peace offering to this world at war one could be killed any day in albert i saw men blown to bits there the clay after the battles of the somme began it was in the road that turned to the right past the square to go to meulte and on to fricourt there was a tide of gun transport swirling down the road, bringing up new ammunition for the guns that were firing without a pause over Fricourt and Mametz. The high scream of a shell came through a blue sky and ended on its downward note with a sharp crash. For a few minutes the transport column was held up while a mass of raw flesh, which a second before had been two living men and their horses, was cleared out of the way. Then the gun wagons went at a harder pace down the road, raising a cloud of white dust out of which I heard the curses of the drivers, swearing in a foul way to disguise their fear. I went through Albert many scores of times to the battlefields beyond, and watched its process of disintegration through those years, till it was nothing but a wild scrap heap of red brick and twisted iron, 
and in the last phase even the golden virgin and her babe which had seemed to escape all shell-fire by miraculous powers lay buried beneath a mass of masonry beyond were the battlefields of the somme where every yard of ground is part of the great graveyard of our youth so amiens as i have said was not far away from the red heart of war and was clear enough to the lines to be crowded always with officers and men who came out between one battle and another and by lorry jumping could reach this city for a few hours of civilized life according to their views of civilization to these men boys mostly who had been living in lousy ditches under hellfire amiens was paradise with little hells for those who liked them there were hotels in which they could go to get a bath if they waited long enough or had the luck to be early on the list there were streets of shops with plate glass windows unbroken shining beautiful there were well-dressed women walking about with kind eyes and children as dainty some of them as in high street kensington or princes street edinburgh young officers who had plenty of money to spend because there was no chance of spending money between a row of blasted trees and a ditch in which bits of dead men were plastered into the parapet invaded the shops and bought fancy soaps razors hair oil stationery pocket-books knives flash lamps top boots at a fabulous price khaki shirts and collars gramophone records and the latest set of kirchner prints it was the delight of spending rather than the joy of possessing which made them go from one shop to another in search of things they could carry back to the line that and the lure of girls behind the counters laughing bright-eyed girls who understood their execrable french even english spoken with a glasgow accent and were pleased to flirt for five minutes with any group of young fighting men who broke into roars of laughter at the gallantry of some don juan among them with a gift of audacity and paid outrageous prices for the privilege of stammering out some foolish sentiment in broken french blushing to the roots of their hair though captains and heroes at their own temerity with a girl who in another five minutes would play the same part in the same scene with a different group of boys i used to marvel at the patience of these girls how bored they must have been with all this flirtation which led to nothing except perhaps the purchase of a bit of soap at twice its proper price they knew that these boys would leave to go back to the trenches in a few hours and that some of them would certainly be dead in a few days there could be no romantic episode save of a transient kind between them and these good-looking lads in whose eyes there were desire and hunger because to them the plainest girl was womanhood the sweet gentle and feminine side of life as opposed to the cruelty brutality and ugliness of war and death the shop girls of amiens had no illusions they had lived too long in war not to know the realities they knew the risks of transient love and they were not taking them unless conditions were very favorable they attended strictly to business and hoped to make a lot of money in the shop and were i think mostly good girls as virtuous as life in wartime may let girls be wise beyond their years and with pity behind their laughter for these soldiers who tried to touch their hands over the counters knowing that many of them were doomed to die for france and england they had their own lovers boys in blue somewhere between vos and hartmann's Wielerkopf, and apart from occasional intimacies with english officers quartered in amiens for long spells left the traffic of passion to other women who walked the streets chapter two the street of the three pebbles la rue des trois cailloux which goes up from the station through the heart of Amiens, was the crowded highway. Here were the best shops, the hairdresser at the left-hand side, where all day long officers down from the line came in to have elaborate luxury in the way of close crops, with friction d'eau de quinin, shampooing, singeing, oiling, not because of vanity, but because of the joyous sense of cleanliness and perfume after the filth and stench of life in the desolate fields then the booksellers madame carpentier et fille on the right-hand side which was not only the rendezvous of the miscellaneous crowd buying stationery in la vie parisienne 
but of the intellectuals who spoke good French and bought good books and liked ten minutes' chat with the mother and the daughter. Madame was an Alsatian lady with vivid memories of 1870, when, as a child, she had first learned to hate Germans. She hated them now with a fresh, vital hatred, and would have seen her own son dead a hundred times. He was a soldier in Saloniki, rather than that France should make a compromise peace with the enemy. She had been in Amiens, as I was, on the dreadful night of August of 1914, when the French army passed through in retreat from Belpomme, and she and the people of her city knew for the first time that the Germans were close upon them. She stood in the crowd, as I did, in the darkness, watching that French column pass with their transport and their wounded lying on the baggage wagons. Men of many regiments mixed up, the light of the street lamps shining on the casks of cousseurs and their long horsehair tails, leading their stumbling horses and foot soldiers hunched under their packs, marching silently with dragging steps. Once in a while one of the soldiers left the ranks and came on to the sidewalk, whispering to a group of dark shadows. The crowds watched silently in a curious, dreadful silence, as though stunned. A woman near me spoke in a low voice and said, Nous sommes perdus. Those were the only words I heard or remembered. That night in the station of Amiens, the boys of a new class were being hurried away in the truck trains, and while their army was in retreat, sang La Marseillaise as though victory were in their hearts. Next day, the German army under von Kluck entered Amiens, and ten days afterward passed through it on the way to Paris. Madame Carpentier told me of the first terror of the people when the field gray men came down the street of the Three Pebbles and entered their shops. A boy selling oranges fainted when a German stretched out his hand to buy some. Women hid behind their counters when German boots stamped into their shops. But Madame Carpentier was not afraid. She knew the Germans and their language. She spoke frank words to German officers who saluted her respectfully enough. You will never get to Paris. France and England will be too strong for you. Germany will be destroyed before this war ends. They laughed at her and said, We shall be in Paris in a week from now. Have you a little diary, madame? Madame Carpentier was haughty with them. Some women in Amiens, poor drabs, did not show any haughtiness nor any pride with the enemy who crowded into the city on their way toward Paris. A girl told me that she was looking through the window of a house that faced the Place de Gare, and saw a number of German soldiers dancing around a piano organ which was playing to them. They were dancing with women of the town, who were laughing and screeching in the embrace of big blond Germans. The girl who was watching was only a schoolgirl then. She knew very little of the evil of life but enough to know that there was something in this scene degrading to womanhood and to France. She turned from the window and flung herself on her bed and wept bitterly. I used to call in at the bookshop for a chat now and then with Madame and Mademoiselle Carpentier, while a crowd of officers came in and out. Madame was always merry and bright in spite of her denunciations of sale boche, les brillants, les bandites, the mademoiselle put my knowledge of French to a severe but pleasant test. She spoke with alarming rapidity, her words tumbling over one another in a cascade of volubility delightful to hear, but difficult to follow. She had a strong mind, masterly in her methods of business, so that she could serve six customers at once and make each one think her attention was entirely devoted to his needs, and a very shrewd and critical idea of military strategy and organization. She had but a poor opinion of British generals and generalship, although a whole-hearted admiration for the gallantry of British officers and men, and she had an intimate knowledge of our preparations, plans, failures, and losses. French liaison officers confided to her the secrets of the British Army, and English officers trusted her with many revelations of things in the wind. But Mademoiselle Carpentier had discretion and loyalty, and did not repeat these things to people who had no right to know. She would have been far more efficient as a staff officer than many of the young gentlemen with red tabs on their tunics who came into the shop, flipping beautiful top boots with riding crops, sitting on the counter, 
and turning over the pages of la vie for the latest convention in ladies legs mademoiselle was a serious musician so her mother told me but her musical studies were seriously interrupted by business and air raids which one day ceased in amiens altogether after a night of horror when hundreds of houses were smashed to dust and many people killed and the germans brought their guns close to the city close enough to scatter high velocities about its streets and the population came out of their cellars shaken by the terror of the night and fled i passed the bookshop where mademoiselle was locking up the door of this house which had escaped by greater luck than its neighbors she turned as i passed and raised her hand with a grave gesture of resignation and courage il n'est pas son pas she said it was the spirit of the courage of french womanhood which spoke in those words chapter three that was in the last phase of the war but the street of the three pebbles had been tramped up and down for two years before then by the british armies on the somme with the french on their right i was never tired of watching those crowds and getting into the midst of them and studying their types all the types of young english manhood came down this street and some of their faces showed the strain and agony of war especially toward the end of the somme battles after four months or more of slaughter i saw boys with a kind of hunted look in their eyes and death was the hunter they stared into the shop windows in a dazed way or strode along with packs on their backs looking neither to the right nor to the left and white haggard faces as expressionless as masks tomorrow or the next day perhaps the hunter would track them down other english officers showed no sign at all of apprehension or lack of nerve control although the psychologist would have detected disorder of soul in the rather deliberate note of hilarity with which they greeted their friends in gusts of laughter for no apparent cause at charlie's bar where they would drink three cocktails apiece on an empty stomach and in their tendency to tell tales of horror as things that were very funny they dined and wined in amiens at the rhin the godebert or the cathedrale with a kind of spiritual exultation in good food and drink as though subconsciously they believed that this might be their last dinner in life with good pals about them they wanted to make the best of it and damn the price in that spirit many of them went after other pleasures down the byways of the city and damned the price again which was a hellish one who blames them it was war that was to blame and those who made war possible down the rue de trois cailloux up and down up and down went english and scottish and irish and welsh and canadian and australian and new zealand fighting men in the winter they wore their trench coats all splashed and caked up to the shoulders with the white chalky mud of the somme battlefields and their top boots and puttees were plastered with this mud and their faces were smeared with it after a lorry drive or a tramp down from the line the rain beat with a metallic tattoo on their steel hats their packs were all sodden french pouillou detrained at amiens station for a night on their way to some other part of the front jostled among british soldiers and their packs were a wonder to see they were like travelling tinkers with pots and pans and boots slung about their faded blue coats and packs bulging with all the primitive needs of life in the desert of the battlefields beyond civilization they were unshaven and wore their steel casque low over their foreheads without gaiety without the means of buying a little false hilarity but grim and sullen looking and resentful of english soldiers walking or talking with french coquettes chapter four i saw a scene with the french boyou one day in the street of the three pebbles during those battles of the somme when the french troops were fighting on our right from mericourt southward toward roy it was like a scene from gaspard the pouillou was a middle-aged man and very drunk on some foul spirit which he had bought in a low cafe down by the river in the high street he was noisy and cursed god for having allowed the war to happen and the french government for having sentenced him and all poor sacre pouillou to rot to death in the trenches away from their wives and children without a thought for them and nothing but treachery in paris nous sommes trahis said the man raising his arms 
for the hundredth time Francis betrayed. A crowd gathered round him, listening to his drunken denunciations. No one laughed. They stared at him with a kind of pitying wonderment. An agent de police pushed his way between the people and caught hold of the soldier by the wrist and tried to drag him away. The crowd murmured a protest, and then suddenly the Puyu, finding himself in the hands of the police, on this one day out of the trenches, after five months, flung himself on the pavement in a passion of tears and supplication. Je suis père de famille. Je suis un soldat de France. Dans les tranches pour cinq mois. Qu'est-ce que mes camarades vont dire? Cré nom de Dieu. Et mon capitaine? C'est important après toute ma service comme brave soldat. Mais quoi donc, mon vieux? Viens donc, sale go, growled the agent de police. The crowd was against the policemen. Their murmurs rose to violent protest on behalf of the poilu. C'est ton héros tout de même. Cinq mois dans les tranches. C'est ta faute. Mais oui, il est seul. Mais pourquoi pas? Après cinq mois sur la fronte? Qu'est-ce que cela signifie? C'est une aucune importance. A dandy French officer of Chasseur Alpin stepped into the center of the scene and tapped the policeman on the shoulder. Leave him alone. Don't you see he is a soldier? Sacred name of God, don't you know that a man like this has helped to save France while you pigs stand at street corners watching petticoats? He stooped to the fallen man and helped him to stand straight. Be off with you, mon brave, or there will be trouble for you. He beckoned to two of his own chasseurs and said, Look after that poor comrade yonder. He is en peu étoile. The crowd applauded. Their sympathy was all for the drunken soldier of France. Chapter 5 Into a small estaminet at the end of the Rue des Trois Cailloux, beyond the Hôtel de Ville, came one day during the battles of the Somme two poyu grizzled heavy men deeply bronzed with white dust in their wrinkles and the earth of the battlefields ingrained in the skin of their big coarse hands they ordered two little glasses and drank them at one gulp then two more see what i have got my little cabbage said one of them stooping to the heavy pack which he had shifted from his shoulders to the other seat beside him it is something to make you laugh and what is that my old man said a woman sitting at the other side of the marble top table with another woman of her own class from the market nearby the man did not answer the question but fumbled into his pack laughing a little in a self-satisfied way i killed a german to get it he said he was a pig of an officer a dirty bush very chic too and young like a schoolboy one of the women patted him on the shoulder her eyes glistened did you slit his throat, the dirty dog, eh? I'd like to get my fingers round the neck of a dirty bush. I finished him with a grenade, said the Puyu. It was good enough. It knocked a hole in him as large as a cemetery. See then, my cabbage. It will make you smile. It is a funny kind of mascot, eh? He put on the table a small leather pouch stained with a blotch of reddish brown. His big, clumsy fingers could hardly undo the little clasp. He wore this next to his heart, said the man. Perhaps he thought it would bring him luck. But I killed him all the same. Cré nom de Dieu. He undid the clasp, and his big fingers poked inside the flap of the pouch. It was from his woman. His German grew. Perhaps even now she doesn't know he's dead. She thinks of him wearing this next to his heart. Cré nom de Dieu. It was I that killed him a week ago. He held up something in his hand, and the light through the estaminet window gleamed on it. It was a woman's lock of hair, like fine-spun gold. The two women gave a shrill cry of surprise, and then screamed with laughter. One of them tried to grab the hair, but the poyu held it high, beyond her reach, with a gruff command of, Hands off! Other soldiers and women in the estaminet gathered round, staring at the yellow tress, laughing, making ribald conjectures as to the character of the woman whose head it had come from. They agreed that she was fat and ugly, like all German women, and a foul slut. "'She'll never kiss that fellow again,' said one man. 
Our old one has cut the throat of that pig of a bush. I'd like to cut off all her hair and tear the clothes off her back, said one of the women, the dirty drab with yellow hair. They ought to be killed, every one of them, so that the human race should be rid of them. Her lover is a bit of clay, anyhow, said the other woman, a bit of dirt, as our poyous will do for all of them. The soldier, with the woman's hair in his hand, stroked it across his forefinger. All the same, it is pretty, like gold, eh? I think of the woman sometimes, with blue eyes, like a German girl I kissed in Paris, a dancing girl. There was a howl of laughter from the two women. The old one is drunk. He is amorous with the German cow. I will keep it as a mascot, said the Poyu, scrunching it up and thrusting it into his pouch. It'll keep me in mind of that saligo of a German officer I killed. He was a chic fellow, tout de mime, a boy. Chapter 6 Australians slouched up the street of the Three Pebbles, with a grim look under their wide brim hats, having come down from Pozier, where it was always hell in the days of the Somme fighting. I liked the look of them, dusty up to the eyes in summer, muddy up to their eyes in winter, these gypsy fellows, scornful of discipline for discipline's sake, but desperate fighters, as simple as children in their ways of thought and speech, except for frightful oaths, and looking at life, this life of war and this life in Amiens, with frank, curious eyes, and a kind of humorous contempt for death and disease, and English Tommies and French girls, and the whole damned show, as they called it. They were lawless except for the laws to which their souls gave allegiance. They behaved as the equals of all men, giving no respect to generals or staff officers or the devils of hell. There was a primitive spirit of manhood in them, and they took what they wanted and were ready to pay for it in coin or in disease or in wounds. They had no conceit in themselves in a little, vain way, but they reckoned themselves the only fighting men, simply and without boasting. They were hard as steel and finely tempered. Some of them were ruffians, but most of them were, I imagine, like those English yeomen who came into France with the Black Prince, men who lived rough, close to nature, of sturdy independence, good-humoured, though fierce in a fight, and ruthless. That is how they seemed to me in a general way, though among them were boys of a more delicate fibre and sensitive, if one might judge by their clear-cut features and wistful eyes. They had money to spend beyond the dreams of our poor Tommy. Six shillings and sixpence a day, and remittances from home. So they pushed open the doors of any restaurant in Amiens, and sat down to a table next to English officers, not abashed, and ordered anything that pleased their taste, and wine in plenty. In that high street of Amiens, one day, I saw a crowd gathered round an Australian, so tall that he towered over all other heads. It was at the corner of the Rue des Côtes de Nutantest, the street of the naked body without a head, and I suspected trouble. As I pressed on the edge of the crowd, I heard the Australian ask, in a loud, slow drawl, whether there was any officer about who could speak French. He asked the question gravely, but without anxiety. I pushed through the crowd and said, I speak French. What's the trouble? I saw then that, like the French poilu I have described, this tall Australian was in the grasp of a French agent de police, a small man of whom he took no more notice than if a fly had settled on his wrist. The Australian was not drunk. I could see that he had just drunk enough to make his brain very clear and solemn. He explained the matter deliberately, with a slow choice of words, as though giving evidence of high matters before a court. It appeared that he had gone into the estaminet opposite with four friends. They had ordered five glasses of Porto, for which they had paid twenty centimes each, and drank them. Then they ordered five more glasses of Porto, and paid the same price, and drank them. After this they took a stroll up and down the street, and were bored, and went into the estaminet again, and ordered five more glasses of Porto. It was then the trouble began, but it was not the Australian who began it. It was the woman behind the bar. She served five glasses more of Porto, and asked for thirty centimes each. Twenty centimes, said the Australian. Vente, madame. Mais non, trente centimes chaque verre, 
thirty, my old one. Six sous, comprenez? No, comprenez, said the Australian. Vingt centimes, or go to hell. The woman demanded the thirty centimes, kept on demanding with a voice more shrill. It was her voice that vexed me, said the Australian. That and the bloody injustice. The five Australians drank the five glasses of Porto, and the tall Australian paid the twenty centimes each without further argument. Life is too short for argument. Then, without words, he took each of the five glasses, broke it at the stem, and dropped it over the counter. "'You will see, sir,' he said gravely, "'the justice of the matter on my side.' But when they left the estaminet, the woman came shrieking into the street after them. Hence the agent de police, and the grasp on the Australian's wrist. "'I should be glad if you would explain the case to this little Frenchman,' said the soldier. "'If he does not take his hand off my wrist, I shall have to kill him.' "'Perhaps a little explanation might serve,' I said. I spoke to the agent de police at some length, describing the incident in the café. I took the view that the lady was wrong in increasing the price so rapidly. The agent agreed gravely. I then pointed out that the Australian was a very large-sized man, and that in spite of his quietude he was a man in the habit of killing Germans. He also had a curious dislike of policemen. "'It appears to me,' I said politely, "'that for the sake of your health the other end of the street is better than this.' The agent de police released his grip from the Australian's wrist and saluted me. "'Vous avez raison, monsieur. Je vous remercie. Ces Australiens sont vraiment formidables, n'est-ce pas?' He disappeared through the crowd, who were smiling with a keen sense of understanding. Only the lady of the estaminet was unappeased. "'They are bandits, these Australians,' she said to the world about her. The tall Australian shook hands with me in a cowardly way. "'Thanks for your trouble,' he said. It was the injustice I couldn't stick. I always pay the right price. I come from Australia. I watched him go slouching down the Rue des Trois Cailloux, head above all the passers-by. He would be at Pozieres again next day. Chapter 7 I was billeted for a time with other war correspondents in an old house in the Rue Amiral Courbet, on the way to the River Somme, from the street of the three pebbles and with a view of the spire of the cathedral a wonderful thing of delicate lines and tracery graven with love in every line by muret bonnet and from my dormer window it was the house of madame de la rochefoucauld who lived farther out of the town but drove in now and then to look at this little mansion of hers at the end of a courtyard behind wrought iron gates it was built in the days before the revolution when it was dangerous to be a fine lady with the name of Rochefoucauld. The furniture was rather scanty, and of the Louis XV and Empire periods. Some portraits of old gentlemen and ladies of France, with one young fellow in a scarlet coat who might have been in the King's Company of the Guard about the time when Wolfe scaled the heights of Abraham, summoned up the ghosts of the house and I liked to think of them in these rooms and going in their sedan chairs across the little courtyard to high mass at the cathedral or to some game of bezy in some other mansion still standing in the quiet streets of Amiens unless in a day in March of 1918 they were destroyed with many other hundreds of houses by bombs and gunfire. My little room was on the floor below the garret and here at night after a long day in the fields up by Pozieres or Montampuich, or beyond by Nini Tilois, or on the way to Bopom, in the long struggle and slaughter over every inch of ground, I used to write my day's dispatch to be taken next day, it was before we were allowed to use the military wires, by King's Messenger to England. Those articles written at high speed, with an impressionism born out of many new memories of tragic and heroic scenes, were interrupted sometimes by air bombardments. Hostile airmen came often to Amiens during the Somme fighting to unload their bombs as near to the station as they could guess, which was not often very near. Generally they killed a few women and children and knocked a few poor houses and a shop or two into a wild rubbish heap of bricks and timber. While I wrote, listening to the crashing of glass and the anti-aircraft fire of French guns from the citadel, 
I used to wonder subconsciously whether I should suddenly be hurled into chaos at the end of an unfinished sentence, and now and again, in spite of my desperate conflict with time to get my message done, the censors were waiting for it downstairs, I had to get up and walk into the passage to listen to the infernal noise of the dark city of Amiens. But I went back again and bent over my paper, concentrating on the picture of war which I was trying to set down so that the world might see and understand, until once again, ten minutes later or so, my willpower would weaken and the little devil of fear would creep up to my heart and I would go uneasily to the door again to listen. Then once more to my writing. Nothing touched the house in the Rue Amiral Courbet while we were there, but it was into my bedroom that a shell went crashing after the night in March when Amiens was badly wrecked, and we listened to the noise of destruction all around us from a room in the Hotel de Rhine on the other side of the way. I should have been sleeping still if I had slept that night in my little old bedroom when the shell paid a visit. There were no lights allowed at night in Amiens, and when I think of darkness I think of that city in time of war, when all the streets were black tunnels and one fumbled one's way timidly, if one had no flash lamp, between the old houses with their pointed gables, coming into sharp collision sometimes with other wayfarers. But up to midnight there were little lights flashing for a second and then going out along the street of the three pebbles and in the dark corners of side streets they were carried by girls seeking to entice english officers on their way to their billets and they clustered like glowworms about the side door of the hotel de rhine after nine o'clock and outside the railings of the public gardens as one passed the bright bull's-eye from a pocket torch flashed in one's eyes and in the radiance of it one saw a girl's face laughing coming very close while her fingers felt for one's badge how dark is it tonight little captain are you not afraid of darkness i am full of fear it is so sad this war so dismal it is comradeship that helps one now a little love a little laughter and then who knows a little love a little laughter alluring words to boys out of one battle expecting another hating it all lonely in their souls because of the thought of death in exile from their own folk in exile from all womanhood and tender feminine things up there in the ditches and shell craters of the desert fields or in the huts of headquarters staffs or in the reserve camps behind the fighting line a little love a little laughter and then who knows the sirens had whispered their own thoughts they had translated into pretty French the temptation of all the little devils in their souls. Un peu de mort. One flash lamp was enough for two down a narrow street toward the riverside, and then up a little dark stairway to a lamp-lit room. Presently this poor boy would be stricken with disease and wish himself dead. Chapter 8 In the street of the Three Pebbles there was a small estaminet into which I went one morning for a cup of coffee while I read an Amiens news sheet made up mostly of extracts translated from the leading articles of English papers. There was never any news of French fighting beyond the official communique, and imaginary articles of a romantic kind written by French journalists in Paris about episodes of war. In one corner of the estaminet was a group of bourgeois gentlemen talking business for a time, and then listening to a monologue from a woman behind the counter. I could not catch many words of the conversation owing to the general chatter, but when the man went out the woman and I were left alone together, and she came over to me and put a photograph down on the table before me, and as though carrying on her previous train of thought she said in French, of course, yes, that is what the war has done to me. I could not guess her meaning. Looking at the photograph I saw it was a young girl in evening dress, with her hair coiled in an artistic way and a little curl on each cheek. Madam's daughter, I thought, looking up at the woman standing in front of me in a grubby bodice and tousled hair. She looked a woman of about forty, with a wan face and beaten eyes. A charming young lady, I said, glancing again at the portrait. The woman repeated her last sentence word for word. Yes, that is what the war has done to me. I looked up at her again and saw that she had the face of a young girl in the photograph but coarsened, aged, rattled, 
by the passing years and perhaps by tragedy is it you i asked yes in nineteen thirteen before the war i have changed since then n'est-ce pas monsieur there is a change i said i tried not to express my thought of how much change you have suffered in the war more than most people ah i have suffered she told me her story and word for word if i could have written it down then it would have read like a little novel by guy de montpessant she was the daughter of people in lille well-to-do merchants and before the war married a young man of the same town the son of other manufacturers they had two children and were very happy then the war came the enemy drove down through belgium and one day drew near and threatened lille the parents of the young couple said we will stay we are too old to leave our home and it is better to keep watch over the factory you must go with the little ones and there is no time to lose there was no time to lose the trains were crowded with fugitives and soldiers mostly soldiers it was necessary to walk weeping the young husband and wife said farewell to their parents and set out on the long trail with the two babies in a perambulator under a load of bread and wine and a little maid carrying some clothes in a bundle for days they tramped the roads until they were all dusty and bedraggled and footsore but glad to be getting further away from the tide of field-gray men which had now swamped over lille the young husband comforted his wife courage he said i have money enough to carry us through the war we will set up a little shop somewhere the maid wept bitterly now and then but the young husband said we will take care of you margot there is nothing to fear we are lucky in our escape he was a delicate fellow rejected for military service but brave they came to amiens and hired the estaminet and set up business there was a heavy debt to work off for capital and expenses before they could make money but they were doing well the mother was happy with her children and the little maid had dried her tears then one day the young husband went away with the little maid and all the money leaving his wife in the estaminet with a big debt to pay and a broken heart that is what the war has done to me she said again picking up the photograph of the girl in the evening frock with a little curl on each cheek c'est triste madame oui c'est triste monsieur but it was not war that had caused her tragedy except that it had unloosened the roots of her family life guy de montpassant would have given just such an ending to this story chapter nine some of our officers stationed in amiens and billeted in private houses became very friendly with the families who received them young girls of good middle class the daughters of shopkeepers and schoolmasters and merchants in a good way of business found it delightful to wait on handsome young englishmen to teach them french and to take walks with them and to arrange musical evenings with other girlfriends who brought their young officers and sang little old french songs with them or english songs in the prettiest french accent these young officers of ours found the home life very charming it broke the monotony of exile and made them forget the evil side of war they paid little gallantries to the girls bought them boxes of chocolate until fancy chocolate was forbidden in france and presented flowers to decorate the table and wrote amusing verses in their autograph albums or drew sketches for them as this went on they gained to the privilege of brotherhood and there were kisses before saying good night outside bedroom doors while the parents downstairs were not too watchful knowing the ways of young people and lenient because of their happiness then a day came in each one of these households when the officer billeted there was ordered away to some other place what tears what lamentations and what promises never to forget little jeanne with her dark tresses or suzanne with the merry eyes were they not engaged not formally perhaps but in honor and in love for a time letters arrived eagerly waited for by girls with aching hearts then picture postcards with a line or two of affectionate greeting then nothing nothing at all month after month in spite of all the letters addressed with all the queer initials for military units so it happened again and again until bitterness crept into girls hearts and hardness and contempt in my own little circle of friends said a lady of amiens i know eighteen girls who were engaged to english officers and have been forsaken 
It is not fair. It is not good. Your English young men seem so serious, far more serious than our French boys. They have a look of shyness which we find delightful. They are timid at first, and blush when one pays a pretty compliment. They are a long time before they take liberties. So we trust them, and take them seriously, and allow intimacies which we would refuse to French boys unless formally engaged. But it is all camouflage. At heart your English young men are just flirts. They play with us, make fools of us, steal our hearts, and then go away, and often do not send so much as a postcard, not even one little postcard to the girls who weep their hearts out for them. You English are all hypocrites. You boast that you play the game. I know your phrase. It is untrue. You play with good girls as though they were gurus, and that no Frenchman would dare to do. He knows the difference between good girls and bad girls, and behaves with reverence to those who are good. When the English army goes away from France, it will leave many bitter memories because of that. End of section 13《セクション14の Now It Can Be Told》by Philip Gibbs。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5, Chapters 10 to 14. Chapter 10. It was my habit to go out at night for a walk through Amiens before going to bed, and generally turn riverward, for even on moonless nights there was always a luminance over the water, and one could see to walk along the quay side. Northward and eastward, the sky was quivering with flashes of white light, like summer lightning, and now and then there was a long, vivid glare of red touching the high clouds with rosy feathers. One of our dumps, or one of the enemy's, had been blown up by that gunfire, sullen and menacing, which never ceased for years. In that quiet half hour alone, or with some comrade like Frederick Palmer or Beach Thomas, As tired and as thoughtful as oneself after a long day's journey in the swirl of war, one's brain roved over the scenes of battle, visualizing anew and in imagination the agony up there, the death which was being done by those guns, and the stupendous sum of all this conflict. We saw, after all, only one patch of the battlefields of the world, and yet were staggered by the immensity of its massacre, by the endless streams of wounded. And by the growth of those little forests of white crosses behind the fighting lines, we knew and could see at any moment in the mind's eye, even in the darkness of an Amiens night, the vastness of the human energy which was in motion along all the roads to Paris, and from Boulogne and Dieppe and Havre to the fighting lines, and in every village on the way, the long columns of motor lorries bringing up food and ammunition. The trains on their way to the army railheads with material of war, and more food and more shells. The Red Cross trains crowded with maimed and injured boys. The ambulances clearing the casualty stations. The troops marching forward from back roads to the front, from which many would never come marching back. The guns and limbers and military transports and spare horses, along hundreds of miles of roads. All the machinery of slaughter on the move. It was staggering in its enormity, in its detail, and in its activity. Yet beyond our sphere in the British section of the Western Front, there was the French Front, larger than ours, stretching right through France, and all their roads were crowded with the same traffic, and all their towns and villages were stirred by the same activity, and for the same purpose of death. And all their hospitals were crammed with the wreckage of youth. On the other side of the lines, the Germans were busy in the same way, as busy as soldier ants. And the roads behind their fronts were cumbered by endless columns of transport and marching men and guns and ambulances laden with bashed, blinded, and bleeding boys. So it was in Italy, in Austria, in Saloniki, and Bulgaria, Serbia, Mesopotamia, Egypt. In the silence of Amiens by night, under the stars, with the cool breath of the night air on our foreheads, with the glamour of light over the waters of the Somme, 
our spirit was stricken by the thought of this world tragedy and cried out in anguish against this bloody crime in which all humanity was involved the senselessness of it the futility the waste the mockery of men's faith in god often palmer and i dear grave old palmer with sphinx-like face and honest soul used to trudge along silently with just a sigh now and then or a groan or a sudden cry of oh god oh christ it was i generally who spoke those words and palmer would say yes and it's going to last a long time yet a long time it's a question of who will hold out twenty-four hours longer than the other side france is tired more tired than any of us will she break first somehow i think not they are wonderful their women have a gallant spirit how good it is the smell of the trees tonight sometimes we would cross the river and look back at the cathedral high and beautiful above the huddle of old old houses on the quayside with the faint light on its pinnacle and buttresses and immense blackness beyond them those builders of france loved their work said palmer there was always war above the walls of this cathedral but they went on with it stone by stone without hurry we stood there in a long silence not on one night only but many times and out of those little dark streets beyond the cathedral of amiens came the spirit of history to teach our spirit with wonderment at their nobility and the brutality of men and their incurable folly and their patience with tyranny when is it all going to end palmer old man the war or the folly of men the war this cursed war this bloody war something will break one day on our side or the other those who hold out longest and have the best reserves of manpower we were starting early next day before dawn to see the beginning of another battle we walked slowly over the little iron bridge again through the vegetable market where old men and women were unloading cabbages from a big wagon then into the dark tunnel of the rue des augustins and so to the little old mansion of mademoiselle de lochefoucault in the rue amiral cobay there was a light burning in the window of the censor's room in there the colonel was reading the times in the louis quinze salon with a grave pucker on his high thin forehead he could not get any grasp of the world's events there was an attack on the censor by northcliffe now what did he mean by that it was really very unkind of him after so much civility to him charteris would be furious he would bang the telephone but dear dear why should people be so violent war correspondents were violent on the slightest provocation the world itself was very violent and it was all so dangerous do you think so russell the cars were ordered for five o'clock time for bed chapter eleven the night in amiens was dark and sinister when rain fell heavily out of a moonless sky hardly a torch lamp flashed out except when a solitary woman scurried down the wet streets to lonely rooms there were no british officers strolling about they had turned in early to hot baths and unaccustomed beds except for one or two who with their burberries buttoned tight to the throat and sopping field caps pulled down about their ears and top boots which went splash splash through deep puddles as they staggered a little uncertainly and peered up at dark corners to find their whereabouts by a dim sense of locality and the shapes of the houses the rain pattered sharply on the pavements and beat a tattoo on leaden gutters and slate roofs every window was shuttered and no light gleamed through on such a night i went out with beach thomas as often before wet or fine after hard riding a foul night said thomas setting off in a quick jerky step i like to feel the rain on my face we turned down as usual to the river it was very dark the rain was heavy on the quayside where there were a group of people bareheaded in the rain and chattering in french with gusts of laughter une bouteille de champagne the words were spoken in a clear boy's voice with an elaborate caricature of french accent in musical cadence but unmistakably english a drunken officer said thomas poor devil we drew near among the people and saw a young officer arm in arm with a french peasant 
one of the market porters, telling a tale in broken French to the audience about him with comic gesticulations and extraordinary volubility. A woman put her hand on my shoulder and spoke in French. He has drunk too much bad wine. His legs walk away from him. He will be in trouble, monsieur. A child, no older than my own boy, who is fighting in the Argonne. Apportez-moi un bouteille de champagne, vite, said the young officer. Then he waved his arm and said, J'ai perdu mon cheval, a kingdom for a bloody horse, as Shakespeare said. Y a-t-il quelqu'un qui vu mon sacré cheval? In other words, if I don't find that four-legged beast, which led to my damnation, I shall be shot at dawn. Fusil, comprenez? On va me fusiller par un mot blanc. Or is it un mot blanche? Quand l'aura s'est levée avec la couleur de un rose, et l'odeur dont jeune fille la vie est parfumée. Pretty good, that, eh, what? But the fact remains that unless I find my steed, my charger, my war-horse, which in reality does not belong to me at all, because I pinched it from the colonel, I shall be shot as sure as fate, and alas, I do not want to die. I am too young to die, and meanwhile I desire encore un bote de champagne. The little crowd of citizens found a grim humor in this speech, one-third of which they understood. They laughed coarsely, and a man said, Quel de rôle de type! Quel numéro! But the woman who had touched me on the sleeve spoke to me again. He says he has lost his horse, and will be shot as a deserter. Those things happen. My boy in the Argonne tells me that a comrade of his was shot for hiding five days with his young woman. It would be sad if this poor child should be condemned to death. I pushed my way through the crowd and went up to the officer. Can I help it all? He greeted me warmly, as though he had known me for years. My dear old pal, you can indeed. First of all, I want a bottle of champagne, un bouteille de champagne. It was wonderful how much music he put into those words. And after that, I want my runaway horse, as I have explained to these good people who do not understand a bloody word, in spite of my excellent French accent. I stole the colonel's horse to come for a joy ride to Amiens. The colonel is one of the best men, but very touchy, very touchy indeed. You would be surprised. He also has the worst horse in the world, or did, until it ran away half an hour ago into the blackness of this hell, which men call Amiens. It is quite certain that if I go back without that horse, most unpleasant things will happen to a gallant young British officer, meaning myself, who, with most innocent intentions of cleansing his soul from the filth of battle, from the horror of battle, from the disgusting fear of battle, oh, yes, I've been afraid all right, and so have you, unless you're a damned hero or a damned liar, desire to get as far as this beautiful city, so fair without, so foul within, in order to drink a bottle, or even two or three, of rich, sparkling wine, to see the loveliness of women as they trip about these pestilential streets, to say a little prayer in la cathedrale, and then to ride back, refreshed, virtuous, knightly, all through the quiet night, to deliver up the horse whence I had pinched it, and nobody any the wiser in the dewy morn. You see, it was a good scheme. What happened? I asked. It happened thus wise, he answered, breaking out into fresh eloquence, with fantastic similes and expressions of which I can give only the spirit. Leaving a posiers, which, as you doubtless know, unless you are a bloody staff officer, is a place where the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, where he leaves his victims' entrails hanging on to the barbed wire, and where the bodies of your friends and mine lie decomposing in muddy holes. You know the place? I put my legs across the colonel's horse, which was in the wagon lines, and set forth for Amiens. That horse knew that I had pinched him. Forgive my slang. I should have said it in the French language, volé, and resented me. Thrice I was nearly thrown from his back. Twice did he entangle himself in barbed wire deliberately. Once did I have to coerce him with many stripes to pass a tank. Then the heavens opened up upon us, and it rained. It rained until I was wet to the skin, in spite of sheltering beneath a tree, one branch of which, owing to the stubborn temper of my steed, struck me a stinging blow across the face. 
so in no joyful spirit i came at last to amiens this whited sepulchre this circe's capital this den of thieves this home of vampires there i dined not wisely but too well i drank of the flowing cup un botte de champagne and i met a maiden as ugly as sin but beautiful in my eyes after posier you understand and accompanied her to her poor lodging in a most verminous place sir where we discoursed upon the problems of life and love o oh, youth o oh, war o oh, hell my horse that brute who resented me was in charge of an ostler whom i believe verily is a limb of satan in the yard without it was late when i left that lair of circe where young british officers even as myself are turned into swine it was late and dark and i was drunk even now i am very drunk i may say that i am becoming drunker and drunker it was true the fumes of bad champagne were working in the boy's brain and he leaned heavily against me it was then that that happened which will undoubtedly lead to my undoing and blast my career as i have blasted my soul the horse was there in the yard but without saddle or bridle where is my saddle and where is my bridle oh naughty ostler i shouted in dismay the ostler who as i informed you is one of satan's imps answered in incomprehensible french led the horse forth from the yard and giving it a mighty blow in the rump sent it clattering forth into the outer darkness in my fear of losing it for i must be at posier at dawn i ran after it but it ran too fast in the darkness and i stopped and tried to grope my way back to the stable yard to kill that ostler thereby serving god and other british officers for he was the devil's agent but i could not find the yard again it had disappeared it was swallowed up in chimerian gloom so i was without revenge and without horse and as you will perceive sir unless you are a bloody staff officer who doesn't perceive anything i am utterly undone i am also horribly drunk and i must apologize for leaning so heavily on your arm it's awfully good of you anyway old man the crowd was mostly moving driven indoors by the rain the woman who had spoken to me said i heard a horse's hoofs upon the bridge the bath then she went away with her apron over her head thomas and i walked each side of the officer giving him an arm he could not walk straight and his legs played freakish tricks with him all the while he talked in a strain of high comedy interlarded with grim little phrases revealing an underlying sense of tragedy and despair until his speech thickened and he became less fluent we spent a fantastic hour searching for his horse it was like a nightmare in the darkness and rain every now and then we heard distinctly the clip-clop of a horse's hoofs and went off in that direction only to be baffled by dead silence with no sign of the animal then again as we stood listening we heard the beat of hoofs on hard pavement in the opposite direction and walked that way dragging the boy who was getting more and more incapable of walking upright at last we gave up hope of finding the horse though the young officer kept assuring us that he must find it at all costs it's a point of honor he said thickly not my horse you know doctor's horse devil to pay tomorrow he laughed foolishly and said always devil to pay in morning we were soaked to the skin come home with me i said we can give you a shakedown frightfully good old man awfully sorry you know and all that are you a blooming general or something but i must find horse by some means we succeeded in persuading him that the chase was useless and that it would be better for him to get into our billet and start out next morning early we dragged him up the rue des augustins to the rue amiral Courbet. outside the iron gates i spoke to him warningly you've got to be quiet there are staff officers inside what staff officers oh my god the boy was dismayed the thought of facing staff officers almost sobered him did indeed sober his brain for a moment though not his legs it's all right i said go quietly and i will get you upstairs safely it was astonishing how quietly he went hanging on to me the little colonel was reading the times in the salon we passed the open door and saw over the paper his high forehead puckered with perplexity as to the ways of the world but he did not raise his head or drop the times at the sound of our entry i took the boy upstairs to my room and guided him inside he said thanks awfully 
and then lay down on the floor and fell into so deep a sleep that I was scared and thought for a moment he might be dead. I went downstairs to chat with the little colonel and form an alibi in case of trouble. An hour later, when I went into my room, I found the boy still lying as I had left him, without having stirred a limb. He was a handsome fellow, and his hand hanging limply across his right arm, and a lock of damp hair falling across his forehead. I thought of a son of mine, who in a few years would be as old as he, and I prayed God mine might be spared this boy's tragedy. Through the night he slept in a drugged way, but just at dawn he woke up and stretched himself with a queer little moan. Then he sat up and said, Where am I? In a billet at Amiens. You lost your horse last night, and I brought you here. Remembrance came into his eyes, and his face was swept with a sudden flush of shame and agony. Yes, I made a fool of myself, the worst possible. How can I get back to Pouzier? You could jump a lorry with luck. I must. It's serious if I don't get back in time. In any case, the loss of that horse... He thought deeply for a moment. I could see that his head was aching to the beat of sledgehammers. Can I wash anywhere? I pointed to the jug and basin, and he said, Thanks enormously. He washed hurriedly, and then stared down with a shamed look at his muddy uniform, all creased and bedraggled. After that, he asked if he could get out downstairs, and I told him the door was unlocked. He hesitated for a moment before leaving my room. I am sorry to have given you all this trouble. It was very decent of you. Many thanks. The boy was a gentleman when sober. I wonder if he died at Pozier, or farther on by the Butte de Warlencourt. A week later I saw an advertisement in Amiens paper. Horse found, brown, with white sock on right foreleg, a pie. I have a fancy it was the horse for which we had searched in the rain. Chapter 12 the quickest way to the cathedral was down a turning on the right-hand side of the street of the three pebbles charlie's bar was on the left-hand side of the street always crowded after six o'clock by officers of every regiment drinking eggnogs martinis bronxes sherry cobblers and other liquids which helped men marvelously to forget the beastliness of war and gave them the gift of laughter and made them careless of the battles which would have to be fought Young staff officers were there, explaining carefully how hard work they were, and how often they went under shell-fire. The fighting officers, English, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, jeered at them, laughing hugely at the latest story of mirthful horror, arranged rendezvous at the Godebert restaurant, where they could see the beautiful Marguerite until she transferred to La Cathedrale in the same street, and our checks, which Charlie cashed at a discount, with a noble faith in British honesty, not often, as he told me, being hurt by a stummer. Charlie's bar was wrecked by shell-fire afterward, and he went to Abbeville and set up a more important establishment, which was wrecked, too, in a fierce air raid before the paint was dry on the walls. The cathedral was a shrine to which many men and women went all through the war, called into its white halls by the spirit of beauty which dwelt there, and by its silence and peace. The great west door was screened from bomb splinters by sandbags piled high, and inside there were other walls of sandbags closing in the sanctuary and some of the windows. But these signs of war did not spoil the majesty of the tall columns and high roof, nor the loveliness of the sculptured flowers below the celestory arches nor the spiritual mystery of those great dim aisles where light flickered and shadows lurked, and the ghosts of history came out of their tombs to pace these stones again, where five, six, seven centuries before they had walked to worship God, in joy or in despair, or to show their beauty of young womanhood, peasant girl or princess, to lovers gazing by the pillars, or to plight their troth as royal brides, or get a crown for their heads, or mercy for their dead bodies in velvet-draped coffins. Our soldiers went in there, as many centuries before, other English soldiers who came out with Edward the Black Prince, by way of Cressy, or with Harry the King through Agincourt. Five hundred years hence, if Amiens Cathedral still stands, undamaged by some new and monstrous conflict in a world of incurable folly, the generation of that time will think now and then, perhaps, 
of the English lads in khaki who tramped up the highway of this nave with their field caps under their arms, each footstep leaving the imprint of a wet boot on the old flagstones, awed by the silence and the spaciousness, with a sudden heartache for a closer knowledge, or some knowledge, of the god worshipped there, the god of love, while not far away men were killing one another by high explosives, shells, hand grenades, mines, machine guns, bayonets, poison gas, trench mortars, tanks, and in close fighting with short daggers like butcher's knives or clubs with steel knobs. I watched the faces of the men who entered here. Some of them, like the Australians and New Zealanders, unfamiliar with cathedrals and not religious by instinct or training, wandered round in a wondering way, with a touch of scorn, even of hostility now and then, for these mysteries, the chanting of the office, the tinkling of the bells at the high mass, which were beyond their understanding, and which they could not link up with any logic of life as they knew it now, away up by Belpomme or Bullicourt, where God had nothing to do, seemingly, with the night raid into Bosch lines, when they blew a party of Germans to bits by dropping stoke bombs down their dugout, or with the shrieks of German boys, mad with fear, when the Australians jumped on them in the darkness and made haste with their killing. All the same, this great church was wonderful, and the Australians, scrunching their slouch hats, stared up at the tall columns to the celestory arches, and peered through the screen to the golden sun upon the high altar, and touched old tombs with their muddy hands, reading the dates on them, 1250, 1155, 1415, with astonishment at their antiquity. Their clean-cut hatchet faces, sun-baked, tanned by rain and wind, their simple blue-gray eyes, the fine strong grace of their bodies as they stood at ease in this place of history, struck me as being wonderfully like all that one imagines in those English knights and squires, Norman English, who rode through France with the Black Prince. It is as though Australia had bred back to the old strain. Our own English soldiers were less arresting to the eye, more dapper and neat, not such evident children of nature. Gravely they walked up the aisles, standing in groups where a service was in progress, watching the movements of the priests, listening to the choir and organ with reverent dreamy eyes. Some of them, country lads, thought back, I fancy, to some village church in England, where they had sung hymns with mother and sisters in the days before the war. England and that little church were a long way off now, perhaps all eternity away. I saw one boy standing quite motionless with wet eyes, without self-consciousness. This music, this place of thoughtfulness, had made something break in his heart. Some of our young officers, but not many, knelt on the cane chairs and prayed, face in hands. French officers crossed themselves, and their medals tinkled as they walked up the aisles. Always there were women in black weeds, kneeling before the side altars, praying to the Virgin for husbands and sons, dead or alive, lighting candles below holy pictures and statues. Our men tiptoed past them, holding steel hats or field caps, and putting their packs against the pillars. On the steps of the cathedral I heard two officers talking one day. How can one reconcile all this with the war? Why not? I suppose we're fighting for justice and all that. That's what the Daily Mail tells us. Seriously, old man, where does Christ come in? He wasn't against righteous force. He chased the money changers out of the temple. Yes, but his whole teaching was love and forgiveness. Thou shalt not kill. Little children, love one another. Turn the other cheek. Is it all sheer tosh? If so, why go on pretending? Take chaplains in khaki. These lieutenant colonels with black crosses, they make me sick. It's either one thing or the other, brute force or Christianity. I am harking back to the brute force theory. But I'm not going to say God is love one day and then prod a man in the stomach the next. Let's be consistent. The other fellows asked for it. They attacked first. Yes, but we are all involved. 
our diplomacy, our secret treaties, our philosophical dope over the masses, our imperial egotism, our trade rivalries, all that was a direct challenge of might against right. The Germans are more efficient and more logical, that's all. They prepared for the inevitable and struck first. We knew the inevitable was coming, but didn't prepare, being too damned inefficient. I have a leaning toward religion. Instinctively, I'm for Christ. But it doesn't work in with efficiency and machine guns. It belongs to another department, that's all. We're spiritual and animal at the same time. In one part of my brain, I'm a gentleman. In another, a beast. It's conflict. We can't eliminate the beast. But we can control it now and then when it gets too obstreperous. And that's where religion helps. It's the high ideal. Otherworldliness. The Germans pray to the same God, praise Christ, and ask for victory. Let them. It may do them a bit of good. It seems to me God is above all the squabbles of humanity, doesn't care a damn about them. But the human soul can get into touch with the infinite and the ideal, even while he is doing butcher's work and beastliness. That doesn't matter very much. It's part of the routine of life. But it does matter. It makes agony and damnation in the world. It creates cruelty and tyranny and all bloody things. Surely, if we believe in God, anyhow, in Christian ethics, this war is a monstrous crime in which all humanity is involved. The Hun started it. Let's go and give the glad eye to Marguerite. At night, in moonlight, Amiens Cathedral was touched with a new spirituality, a white magic beyond all words of beauty. On many nights of war, I walked round the cathedral square, looking up at that grand mass of masonry, with all its pinnacles and buttresses gleaming like silver, and its sculptured tracery like lacework, and a flood of milky light glamorous on walls in which every stone was clear-cut beyond a vast shadow world. How old it was! How many human eyes through many centuries had come in the white light of the moon to look at this dream in stone, enshrining the faith of men! The revolution had surged round these walls, and the screams of wild women, and their shrill laughter and their cries for the blood of aristocrats had risen from the square. Pageants of kingship and royal death had passed across these pavements through the great doors there. Peasant women in the darkness had wept against these walls, praying for God's pity for their hearts. Now the English officers were lighting cigarettes in the shelter of a wall the outline of their features, nightly faces, touched by the moonlight. There were flashes of gunfire in the sky beyond the river. "'A good night for a German air raid,' said one of the officers. "'Yes, a lovely night for killing women in their sleep,' said the other man. The people of Amiens were sleeping, and no light gleamed through their shutters. Chapter 13 Coming away from the cathedral through a side street, going into the Rue des Trois Caillots, I used to pass the Palais de Justice, a big grim building with a long flight of steps leading up to its doorways, and above the portico the figure of Justice, blind, holding her scales. There was no Justice there during the war, but rooms full of French soldiers, with smashed faces, blind, many of them, like that woman in stone. They used to sit on fine days on the flight of steps, a tragic exhibition of war for passers-by to see. Many of them revealed no faces, but were white masks of cotton wool, bandaged round their heads. Others showed only the upper parts of their faces, and the places where their jaws had been were tied up with white rags. There were men without noses, and men with half their scalps torn away. French children used to stare through the railings at them, gravely, with childish curiosity, without pity. English soldiers gave them a passing glance, and went on to places where they might be made like this, without faces, or jaws, or noses, or eyes. By their uniforms I saw that there were chasseurs alpine, and chasseurs d'Afrique, and young infantrymen of the line, and gunners. They sat without restlessness, watching the passers-by, if they had eyes to see, or if blind, feeling the breeze about them, and listening to the sound of passing feet. Chapter 14 
The prettiest view of Amiens was from the banks of the Somme, outside the city on the east side, and there was a charming walk along the towpath, past market gardens, going down to the river on the opposite bank, and past the gardens of little chalets, built for love in idleness in days of peace. They were a fantastic architecture, these cottages, where well-to-do citizens of Amiens used to come for weekends of boating and fishing, and their garden gates at the end of wooden bridges over backwaters were of iron twisted into the shapes of swans or flowers, and there were snails of terracotta on the chimney pots, and painted woodwork on the walls, in the worst taste, yet amusing and pleasing to the eye in their green bowers. I remember one called Mon Idée, and wondered that any man should be proud of such a freakish conception of a country house. They were abandoned during the war, except one or two used for casual rendezvous between French officers and their light of loves and the towpath was used only by stray couples who came out for loneliness and British soldiers walking out with French girls. The market gardeners punted down the river in long, shallow boats like gondolas, laden high with cabbages, cauliflowers, and asparagus, and farther upstream there was a boathouse where orderlies from the New Zealand hospital in Amiens used to get skiffs for an hour's rowing leaning on their oars to look at the picture of the cathedral rising like a mirage beyond the willows and the encircling water with fleecy clouds above its glittering roof or lurid storm clouds with the red glow of sunset beneath their wings in the dusk or the darkness there was silence along the banks but for a ceaseless throbbing of distant gunfire rising sometimes to a fury of drumming when the french soixante quinze was at work outside Roy and their lines beyond Suzanne. It was what the French call la rafale des tambours de la morte, the ruffle of the drums of death. The winding waters of the Somme flowed in higher reaches through the hell of war by Biache and Saint Christ, this side of Peron, where dead bodies floated in slime and blood, and there was a litter of broken bridges and barges and dead trees and ammunition boxes. The river itself was a highway into hell, and there came back upon its tide in slow-moving barges the wreckage of human life, fresh from the torturers. These barges used to unload their cargoes of maimed men at a carpenter's yard just below the bridge outside the city, and often as I passed I saw human bodies being lifted out and carried on stretchers into the wooden sheds. They were the bad cases, French boys wounded in the abdomen or lungs, or with their limbs torn off, or hopelessly shattered. It was an agony for them to be moved, even on the stretchers. Some of them cried out in fearful anguish, or moaned like wounded animals again and again. Those sounds spoiled the music of the lapping water, and the whispering of the willows and the song of birds. The sight of these tortured boys, made useless in life, took the color out of the flowers and the beauty out of that vision of the great cathedral, splendid above the river. Women watched them from the bridge, straining their eyes as the bodies were carried to the bank. I think some of them looked for their own men. One of them spoke to me one day. That is what the Germans do to our sons, bandit, assassin. Yes, that is war, madame. She put a skinny hand on my arm. Will it go on forever, this war, until all the men are killed? Not so long as that, madame. Some men will be left alive, the very old and the very young, and the lucky ones, and those behind the lines. The Germans are losing many men, monsieur? Heaps, madame. I have seen their bodies strewn about the fields. Ah, that is good. I hope all German women will lose their sons, as I have lost mine. Where was that, madame? Over there? She pointed up the Somme. He was a good son, a fine boy. It seems only yesterday he lay at my breast. My man weeps for him. They were good comrades. It is sad, madame. Ah, but yes, it is sad. Au revoir, monsieur. Au revoir, madame. End of section 14
Section 15 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5, Chapters 15 to 18. Chapter 15. There was a big hospital in Amiens, close to the railway station, organized by New Zealand doctors and nurses. I went there one day in the autumn of 1914, when the army of von Kluck had passed through the city and gone beyond. The German doctors had left behind the instruments abandoned by an English unit sharing the retreat. The French doctor who took me round told me the enemy had behaved well in Amiens. At least he had refrained from atrocities. As I went through the long wards, I did not guess that one day I should be a patient there. That was two years later, at the end of the Somme battles. I was worn out and bloodless after five months of hard strain and nervous wear and tear. Some bug had bitten me up in the fields where lay the unburied dead. "'Trench fever,' said the doctor. "'You look in need of a rest,' said the matron. "'My word, how white you are! Had a hard time, eh, like the rest of them?' I lay in bed at the end of the officer's ward, with only one other bed between me and the wall. That was occupied by the gunner-general of the New Zealand Division. Opposite was another row of beds in which officers lay sleeping or reading or lying still with wistful eyes. "'That's all right. You're going to die,' said a rosy-cheeked young orderly after taking my temperature and feeling my pulse. It was his way of cheering a patient up. He told me how he had been torpedoed in the Dardanelles while he was ill with dysentery. He indulged in reminiscences with the New Zealand general, who had a grim gift of silence but glinting eyes. In the bed on my left was a handsome boy with a fine, delicate face, a subaltern in the Coldstream Guards, with a pile of books at his elbow, all by Anatole France. It was the first time I had ever laid in hospital, and I felt amazingly weak and helpless, but interested in my surroundings. The day nurse, a tall, buxom New Zealand girl, whom the general chafed with sarcastic humor, and who gave back more than she got, went off duty with a cheery, "'Good night, all!' and the night nurse, who took her place, and made a first visit to each bed. She was a dainty little woman, with a complexion of delicate rose and large luminous eyes. She had a nun-like look, utterly pure, but with the spiritual fire in those shining eyes of hers for all these men, who were like children in her hands. They seemed glad at her coming." "'Good evening, sister,' said one man after another, even one who had laid with his eyes closed for an hour or more, with a look of death on his face. She knelt down beside each one, saying, "'How are you tonight?' and chatting in a low voice, inaudible to the bed beyond. From one bed I heard a boy's voice say, "'Oh, don't go yet, sister. You have only given me two minutes, and I want ten at least. I'm passionately in love with you, you know, and I have been waiting all day for your beauty.' There was a great gust of laughter in the ward. "'The child is at it again,' said one of the officers. "'When are you going to write me another sonnet?' asked the nurse. The last one was much admired. "'The last one was rotten,' said the boy. "'I have written a real corker this time. Read it to yourself, and don't drop its pearls before these swine.' "'Well, you must be good, or I won't read it at all.' An officer of the British Army, who was also a poet, hurled the bedclothes off and sat on the edge of his bed in his pajamas. I'm fed up with everything. I hate war. I don't want to be a hero. I don't want to die. I want to be loved. I'm a glutton for love. In his pajamas, the boy looked a child, no older than a schoolboy who was mine and who still liked to be tucked up in bed by his mother. With his tousled hair and his petulant grimace, this lieutenant might have been Peter Pan from Kensington. The night nurse pretended to chide him. It was very gentle chiding, but as abruptly as he had thrown off his clothes, he snuggled under them again and said, All right, I'll be good. Only I want a kiss before I go to sleep. I became good friends with that boy, who was a promising young poet, and a joyous creature no more fit for war than a child of ten, hating the muck and horror of it, not ashamed to confess his fear, with a boyish wistfulness of hope that he might not be killed, because he loved life. But he was killed. I had a letter from his stricken mother months afterward. The child was missing then, and her heart cried out for him. 
Opposite my bed was a middle-aged man from Lancashire. I suppose he had been in a cotton mill or a factory, a hard-headed, simple-hearted fellow, as good as gold, and always speaking of the wife. But his nerves had gone to pieces, and he was afraid to sleep because of the dreams that came to him. Sister, he said, don't let me go to sleep. Wake me up if you see me dozing. I see terrible things in my dreams, frightful things. I can't bear it. You will sleep better tonight, she said. I'm putting something in your milk, something to stop the dreaming. But he dreamed. I lay awake, feverish and restless, and heard the man opposite muttering and moaning in his sleep. Sometimes he would give a long, quivering sigh, and sometimes start violently, and then wake up in a dazed way, saying, Oh, my God! Oh, my God! trembling with fear so that the bed was shaken. The night nurse was always by his side in a moment when he called out hushing him down, whispering to him. "'I see pools of blood and bits of dead bodies in my sleep,' he told me. "'It's what I saw up at Bazantine. "'There was a fellow with his face blown off walking about. "'I see him every night. "'Queer, isn't it? "'Nerves, you know. "'I don't think I had a nerve in my body before this war.' The little night nurse came to my bedside. "'Can't you sleep?' I'm afraid not. My heart is thumping in a queer way. May I smoke? She put a cigarette between my lips and lighted a match. Take a few whips, and then try to sleep. You need lots of sleep. In the ward there was only the glimmer of night lights and red glasses, and now and then, all through the night, matches were lighted, illuminating the room for a second, followed by a glowing end of a cigarette shining like a star in the darkness. The sleeping men breathed heavily tossed about violently, gave strange jerks and starts. Sometimes they spoke aloud in their sleep. That isn't a dud, you fool. It will blow us to hell. Now then, get on with it, can't you? Look out! They're coming! Can't you see them moving by the wire? The spirit of war was in that ward, and hunted them, even in their sleep. Lurking terrors surged up again in their subconsciousness. Sights which they had tried to forget stared at them through their closed eyelids. The daylight came, and the night nurse slipped away, and the day nurse shook one shoulder and said, Time to wash and shave. No malingering. It was the discipline of the hospital. Men as weak as rats had to sit up in bed, or crawl out of it, and shave themselves. You're merciless, I said laughing painfully when the day nurse dabbed my back with cold iodine at six o'clock on a winter morning with the windows wide open oh there's no mercy in this place said the strong-minded girl it's kill or cure here and no time to worry you're all devils said the new zealand general you don't care a damn about the patients so long as you have all the beds tidy by the time the doctor comes around i'm a general i am and you can't order me about and if you think I'm going to shave at this time in the morning, you are jolly well mistaken. I am down with dysentery, and don't you forget it. I didn't get through the Dardanelles to be murdered at Amiens. That's where you were mistaken, General, said the imperturbable girl. I have to carry out orders, and if they lead to your death, it's not my responsibility. I'm paid a poor wage for this job, but I do my duty, rough or smooth, kill or cure. You're a vampire. That's what you are. I'm a nurse. If ever I hear you're going to marry a New Zealand boy, I'll warn him against you. He'll be too much of a fool to listen to you. I've a good mind to marry you myself and beat you every morning. Modern wives have strong muscles. Look at my arm. Three nights in one week there were air raids and as the German mark was the railway station, we were in the center of the danger zone. There was a frightful noise of splintering glass and smashing timber between each crash of high explosives. The whine of shrapnel from the anti-aircraft guns had a sinister note, abominable in the ears of those officers who had come down from the fighting lines, nerve-wracked and fever-stricken. They lay very quiet. The night nurse moved about from bed to bed with her flash lamp, her face was pale, but she showed no other sign of fear, and was braver than her patients at that time, though they had done the hero's job all right. It was in another hospital a year later, when I lay sick, that an officer, a very gallant gentleman, said, 
If there is another air raid, I shall go mad. He had been stationed near the blast furnace of Les Isles-Quin, near Bethune, and had been in many air raids, when over sixty-three shells had blown his hut to bits and killed his men until he could bear it no more. In the Amiens hospital, some of the patients had their heads under the bedclothes like little children. Chapter 16 The life of Amiens ended for a while, and the city was deserted by all its people after the night of March 30th, 1918, which will be remembered forever to the age-long history of Amiens as its night of greatest tragedy. For a week the enemy had been advancing across the old battlefields after the first onslaught in the morning of March 21st, when our lines were stormed and broken by his men's odds against our defending troops. We war correspondents had suffered mental agonies like all who knew what had happened better than the troops themselves. Every day after the first breakthrough, we pushed out in different directions. Hamilton Fife and I went together sometimes until we came up with backwash of the great retreat, ebbing back and back, day after day, with increasing speed, until it drew very close to Amiens. It was a kind of ordered chaos, terrible to see. It was the chaos like that of upturned ant heaps, but with each ant trying to rescue his eggs and sticks in a persistent orderly way, directed by some controlling or communal intelligence, only instead of eggs and sticks, these soldier ants of ours, in the whole world behind our front lines, were trying to rescue heavy guns, motor lorries, tanks, ambulances, hospital stores, ordnance stores, steam rollers, agricultural implements, transport wagons, railway engines, YMCA tents, gun horse and mule columns, while rearguard actions were being fought within gunfire of them, and walking wounded were hobbling back along the roads in this uproar of traffic, and word came that a further retreat was happening, and that the enemy had broken through again. Amiens seemed threatened on the morning when, to the north, Albert was held by a mixed crowd of Scottish and English troops, too thin, as I could see when I passed through them, to fight any big action, with an enemy advancing rapidly from Cochalette and outflanking our line by Montauban and Fricourt. I saw our men marching hastily in retreat to escape that tightening net, and while the southern side of Amiens was held by a crowd of stragglers with cyclist battalions, clerks from headquarters staffs, and dismounted cavalry commanded by Brigadier General Carey, sent down hurriedly to link them together and stop a widening gap until the French could get to our relief on the right and until the Australians had come down from Flanders. There was nothing on that day to prevent the Germans breaking through to Amiens except the courage of exhausted boys, thinly strung out, and lagging footsteps of the Germans themselves, who had suffered heavy losses all the way, and were spent for a while by their progress over the wild ground of the old fighting fields. Their heavy guns were far behind, unable to keep pace with the storm troops, and the enemy was relying entirely on machine guns and a few field guns, but most of our guns were also out of action, captured or falling back to new lines, and upon the speed with which the enemy could mass his men for a new assault depended the safety of Amiens and the road to Abbeville and the coast. If he could hurl fresh divisions of men against our line on that last night of March, or bring up strong forces of cavalry or armored cars, our line would break, and Amiens would be lost, and all our work would be in jeopardy. That was certain. It was visible. It could not be concealed by any camouflage of hope or courage. It was after a day on the Somme battlefields, passing through our retiring troops, that I sat down with other war correspondents and several officers to a dinner in the old Hotel de Rhin in Amiens. It was a dismal meal in a room where there had been much laughter, and throughout the battles of the Somme in 1916, a coming and going of generals and staffs and officers of all grades, cheery and high-spirited at these little tables, where there were good wine and not bad food, and putting away from their minds for the time being the thought of tragic losses or forlorn battles in which they might fall. In the quietude of the hotel garden, a little square plot of grass bordered by flower beds, 
I had had strange conversations with boys who had revealed their souls a little after dinner in the darkness, their faces bared now and then by the light of cigarettes or the flare of a match. "'Death is nothing,' said one young officer, just down from the psalm fields for a week's rest cure for jangled nerves. "'I don't care a damn for death. But it's the waiting for it, the devilishness of its uncertainty, the sight of one's pals blown to bits about one, and the animal fear under shell-fire that breaks one's pluck. My nerves are like fiddle strings. In that garden other men, with a queer laugh now and then, between their stories, had told me their experiences in shell-craters and ditches, under frightful fire, which had wiped out their platoons or companies. A bedraggled stork, the inescapable companion of a waddling gull, used to listen to the conferences with one leg tucked under his wing and its head on one side, with one watchful beady eye fixed on the figures in khaki, until suddenly it would clap its long bill rapidly in a wonderful imitation of machine-gun fire. "'Curse the bloody bird!' said the officers, startled by this evil and reminiscent noise, and capered with ridiculous postures around the imperturbable gull. Beyond the lines, from the dining-room, would come the babble of many tongues, and the laughter of officers telling stories against one another over their bottles of wine, served by Gaston, the head-waiter. Between our discussions on strategy he was the strategist by virtue of service in the trenches and several wounds, or by von Tirpitz, an older, whiskered man, or by Joseph, who had a high cackling laugh and strong views against the fair sex, and the inevitable cry, C'est la guerre, when officers complained of the service. There had been merry parties in this room, crowded with the ghosts of many heroic fellows, but it was a gloomy gathering on that evening, at the end of March, when we sat there for the last time. There were there officers who had lost their towns, and Dadoses, Deputy Assistant Director of Ordnance Supplies, whose stores had gone up in smoke and flame, and a few cavalry officers back from special leave and appalled by what had happened in their absence and a group of YMCA officials who had escaped by the skin of their teeth from huts now far behind the German lines, and censors who knew that no blue pencil could hide the truth of the retreat, and war correspondents who had to write the truth, and hated it. Gaston whispered gloomily behind my chair, Mon petit caporal. He called me that because of a fancied likeness to the young Napoleon. Dit donc. « Vous croyez qu'il peut passer par Amiens ?»« Non, ce n'est pas possible, ça. »« Pour la dixième fois ?»« Non, j'ai refusé la croix. »« Mais c'est mauvais, c'est effrayé, après tant de sacrifices. » Madame, of the cash desk, sat in the dining room for company's sake, fixing up accounts as though the last day of reckoning had come, as it had. Her hair, with its little curls, was still in perfect order, she had two dabs of color on her cheeks as usual, but underneath a waxen pallor. She was working out accounts with a young officer who smoked innumerable cigarettes to steady his nerves. Von Tirpitz was going round in an absent-minded way, pulling at his long whiskers. The war correspondents talked together. We spoke gloomily, in low voices, so that the waiters should not hear. If they break through to Abbeville, we shall lose the coast. Will that be a win for the Germans, even then? It will make it hell in the channel. We shall transfer our base to Saint-Nazaire. France won't give in now, whatever happens, and England never gives in. We're exhausted all the same. It's a question of manpower. They're bound to take Albert tonight or tomorrow. I don't see that at all. There's still a line. A line? A handful of tired men. It will be the devil if they get into villiers Bretonneau tonight. It commands Amiens. They could blow the place off the map. They won't. We keep saying they won't. We said they won't get the Somme crossings, but they did. Let's face it squarely, without any damned false optimism. That has been our curse all through. Better than your damned pessimism. It's quite possible that they will be in this city tonight. What is to keep them back? There's nothing up the road. 
It would look silly if we were all captured tonight. How they would laugh. We shouldn't laugh, though. I think we ought to keep an eye on things. How are we to know? We are utterly without means of communication. Anything may happen in the night. Something happened then. It was half-past seven in the evening. There were two enormous crashes outside the windows of the Hotel de Rhin. All the windows shook, and the whole house seemed to rock. There was a noise of rending wood, many falls of bricks, and a cascade of falling glass. Instinctively and instantly, a number of officers threw themselves on the floor to escape flying bits of steel and glass splinters blown sideways. Then someone laughed. Not this time! The officers rose from the floor and took their places at the table and lit cigarettes again. But they were listening. We listened to the loud hum of airplanes, the well-known zoos-zoos of the Gotha's double fuselage. More bombs were dropped farther into the town, with the same sound of explosives and falling masonry. The anti-aircraft guns got to work, and there was a shrill chorus of shrapnel shells winging over the roofs. Bang! Crash! That was nearer again. Some of the officers strolled out of the dining room. They're making a mess outside. Perhaps we'd better get away before it gets too hot. Madame, from the cash desk, turned to her accounts again. I noticed the increasing pallor of her skin beneath the two dabs of red, but she controlled her nerves pluckily, even smiled, too, at a young officer who was settling up for a group of others. The moon had risen over the houses of Amiens. It was astoundingly bright and beautiful, in a clear sky and still air, and the streets were flooded with white light, and the roofs glittered like silver above intense black shadows under the gables, where the rays were barred by projecting walls. Curse the moon, said one officer. How I hate its damned light. But the moon, cold and smiling, looked down upon the world at war and into this old city of Amiens, in which bombs were bursting. Women were running close to the walls. Groups of soldiers made a dash from one doorway to another. Horses galloped with heavy weapons up the street of the Three Pebbles, while shrapnel flickered in the sky above them, and paving stones were hurled up in bursts of red fire and explosions. Many horses were killed by flying chunks of steel. They lay bleeding monstrously so that there were large pools of blood around them. An officer came into the side door of the Hotel de Rhin. He was white under his steel hat, which he pushed back while he wiped his forehead. A fellow was killed just by my side. We were standing in a doorway together, and something caught him in the face. He fell like a log, without a sound, as dead as a doornail. There was a flight of midges in the sky, droning with their double note, which vibrated like cello strings very loudly, and with that sinister noise I could see them quite clearly now, and then as they passed across the face of the moon, black, flitting things, with a glitter of shrapnel below them. From time to time they went away, until there were specks of silver and black, but always they came back again, or others came with new stores of bombs which they unloaded over Amiens. So it went on all through the night. I went up to my bedroom and lay on a bed trying to sleep, but it was impossible. My willpower was not strong enough to disregard those crashes in the streets outside when houses collapsed with frightful falling noises after bomb explosions. My inner vision foresaw the ceiling above me pierced by one of those bombs and the room in which I lay engulfed in the chaos of this wing of the Hotel de Rien. Many times I said, To hell with it all, I'm going to sleep, and then sat up in the darkness at the renewal of that tumult and switched on the electric light. No, impossible to sleep. Outside in the corridor there was a stampede of heavy boots. Officers were running to get into the cellars before the next crash, which might fling them into the dismal gulfs. The thought of that cellar pulled me down like the law of gravity. I walked along the corridor, now deserted, and saw a stairway littered with broken glass, which my feet scrunched. There were no lights in the basement of the hotel, but I had a flash lamp going dim, and by its pale eye fumbled my way to a stone passage leading to the cellar. That flight of stone steps was littered also with broken glass. In the cellar itself was a mixed company of men who had been dining earlier in the evening, joined by others who had come in from the streets for shelter. 
Some of them had dragged down mattresses from the bedroom and were lying there in their trench coats with their steel hats beside them. Others were sitting on wooden cases wearing their steel hats, while there were others on their knees and their faces in their hands, trying to sleep. There were some of the town majors who had lost their towns and some Canadian cavalry officers and two or three private soldiers and some motor drivers and orderlies and two young cooks of the hotel lying together on dirty straw. By one of the stone pillars of the vaulted room, two American war correspondents, Sims and Mackenzie, were sitting on a packing case playing cards on a board between them. They had stuck candles in empty wine bottles, and the flickering light played on their faces and cast deep shadows under their eyes. I stood watching these men in that cellar, and thought what a good subject would be for the pencil of a murhead bone. I wanted to get a comfortable place. There was only one place on the bare stones, and when I lay down there, my bones ached abominably, and it was very cold. Through an aperture in the window came a keen draft, and I could see in a square of moonlit sky a glinting star. It was not much of a cellar. A direct hit on the Hotel du Rhin would make a nasty mess of this vaulted room and end a game of cards. After fifteen minutes I became restless and decided that the room upstairs, after all, was infinitely preferable to this damp cellar and these hard stones. I returned to it and lay down on the bed again and switched off the light. But the noises outside, the loneliness of the room, the sense of sudden death fluking overhead, made me sit up again and listen intently. The Gothas were droning over Amiens again. Many houses round about were being torn and shattered. What a wreckage was being made of the dear old city. I paced up and down the room, smoking cigarettes one after another, until a mighty explosion, very close, made all my nerves quiver. No, decidedly, that cellar was the best place. If one had to die, it was better to be in the company of friends. Down I went again, meeting an officer whom I knew well. He, too, was a wanderer between the cellar and the abandoned bedrooms. I'm getting bored with this, he said. It's absurd to think that this filthy cellar is any safer than upstairs, but the dugout sense calls one down. Anyhow, I can't sleep. We stood looking into the cellar. There was something comical as well as sinister in the sight of the company there sprawled on the mattresses, vainly trying to extract comfort out of packing cases for pillows or gas bags or steel hats. One friend of ours, a cavalry officer of the old school, looked across between Charlie Chaplin and old Bill, with a fierce frown above his black moustache. Sims and Mackenzie still played their game of cards silently between the guttering candles. I think I went from the cellar to the bedroom, and from the bedroom to the cellar, six times that night. There was never ten minutes' relief from the drone of Gothas, who were making a complete job of Amiens. It was at four in the morning that I met the same officer who saw me wandering before. Let us go for a walk, he said. The birds will be away by dawn. It was nothing like dawn when we went out of the side door of the Hotel de Rhin and strolled into the street of the Three Pebbles. There was still the same white moonlight, intense and glittering, but with a paler sky. It shone down upon dark pools of blood and the carcasses of horses and fragments of flesh from which a sickly smell arose. The roadway was littered with bits of timber and heaps of masonry. Many houses had collapsed into wild chaos, and others, though still standing, had been stripped of their wooden frontages, and their walls were scarred by bomb splinters. Every part of the old city, as we explored it later, had been badly mauled, and hundreds of houses were utterly destroyed. The air raid ceased at 4.30 a.m., when the first light of dawn came into the sky. That day Amiens was evacuated by command of the French military authorities, and the inhabitants trailed out of the city, leaving everything behind them. I saw the women locking up their shops, where there were any doors to shut, or their shops still standing. Many people must have been killed and buried in the night beneath their own houses. I never knew how many. The fugitives escaped the next phase of the tragedy in Amiens when, within a few hours, the enemy sent over the first high velocities, 
and for many weeks afterwards scattered them about the city, destroying many other houses. A fire started by these shells formed a great gap between the Rue des Jacobines and the Rue des Trois Cailloux, where there had been an arcade and many good shops and houses. I saw the fire smoldering about the charred beams and twisted ironwork when I went through the city after the day of Exodus. Chapter 17 It was a pitiful adventure to go through Amiens in the days of its desolation, and we who had known its people so well hated its loneliness. All abandoned towns have a tragic aspect. I often think of Douai, which was left with all its people under compulsion of the enemy. But Amiens was strangely sinister with heaps of ruins in its narrow streets, and the abominable noise of high-velocity shells in flight above its roofs and crashing now in one direction and now in another. One of our sentries came out of a little house near the Place and said, Keep as much as possible to the west side of the town, sir. They've been falling pretty thick on the east side. Made no end of a mess. On the way back from villiers Bretonneau and the Australian headquarters on the left bank of the Somme, we ate sandwiches in the public gardens outside the Hotel du Rhin. There were big shell holes in the flower beds, and trees had been torn down and flung across the pathway, and there was a broken statue lying on the grass. Some French and English soldiers tramped past. Then there was no living soul about in the place which had been so crowded with life, with pretty women and children, and young officers doing their shopping, and the business of a city at work. It makes one understand what Rome was like after the barbarians had sacked and left it, said a friend of mine. There is something ghastly about it, said another. We stood round the Hotel du Rhin, shut up and abandoned. The house next door had been wrecked, and it was scarred and wounded, but still stood after that night of terror. One day, during its desolation, I went to a banquet in Amiens, in the cellars of the Hotel de Ville. It was to celebrate the 4th of July, and an invitation had been sent to me by the French commandant de Place and the English APM. It was a beau geste, gallant and romantic in those days of trouble, when Amiens was still closely beleaguered, but safer now that Australians and British troops were holding the line strongly outside, with French on their right southward from Beauve and Hangus Woods. The French commandant had produced a collection of flags, and his men had decorated the battered city with the tricolor. It even fluttered above some of the ruins, as though for the passing of a pageant. But only a few cars entered the city and drew up to the town hall, and then took cover behind the walls. Down below in the cellars, the damp walls were garlanded with flowers from the market gardens of the Somme, now deserted by their gardeners and roses were heaped on the banqueting table. General Monash, commanding the Australian Corps, was there, with the general of the French division on his right. A young American officer sat very grave and silent, not, perhaps, understanding much of the conversation about him, because most of the guests were French officers, with senators and deputies of Amiens and its department. There was good wine to drink from the cold vaults of the Hôtel de Ville, and with the scent of rose, and hope for victory in spite of all disasters, the German offensive had been checked, and the Americans were now coming over in a tide, it was a cheerful luncheon party. The old general, black-visaged, bullet-headed, with a bristly mustache like a French bull terrier, sat utterly silent, eating steadily and fiercely. But the French commandant de place, as handsome as Athos, as gay as d'Artagnan, raised his glass to England and France, to the gallant allies, and to all fair women. He became reminiscent of his days as a sous-lieutenant. He remembered a girl called Marguerite. She was exquisite, and another called Yvonne. He had adored her. O oh, life! O oh, youth! He had been a careless young devil, with laughter in his heart. Chapter 18 I suppose it was three months later when I saw the first crowds coming back to their homes in Amiens tide had turned and the enemy was in hard retreat. Amiens was safe again. They had never had any doubt of this homecoming after that day nearly three months before when, in spite of the enemy's being so close, Foch said in his calm way, 
I guarantee Amiens. They believed what Marshal Foch said. He always knew. So now they were coming back again with their little bundles and their babies and small children holding their hands or skirts, according as they received permits from the French authorities. They were the lucky ones whose houses still existed. They were conscious of their own good fortune and came chattering very cheerfully from the station up the street of the Three Pebbles on their way to their streets. But every now and then they gave a cry of surprise and dismay at the damage done to other people's houses. Ouh la la, regardez ça! C'est affreux! There was a butcher's shop destroyed, and the house of the poor little Madeleine, and old Christopher's workshop, and the milliner's place, where they had used to buy their Sunday hats, and that frightful gap where the arcade had been. Truly, poor Amiens had suffered martyrdom though, thank God, the cathedral still stood in glory, hardly touched, with only one little shell-hole through the roof. Terrible was the damage to the Rue des Beauvais, and the streets that went out of it. To one rubbish heap, which had been a corner house, two girls came back. Perhaps the French authorities had not had that one on their list. The girls came tripping home, with light in their eyes staring about them, ejaculating pity for neighbors whose houses had been destroyed. Then suddenly they stood outside their own house and saw that the direct head of a shell had knocked it to bits. The light went out of their eyes. They stood there staring with their mouths open. Some Australian soldiers stood about and watched the girls, understanding the drama. "'Bit of a miss, Missy,' said one of them. "'Not much left of the old home, eh?' The girls were amazingly brave. They did not weep. They climbed up a hillock of bricks and pulled out bits of old, familiar things. They recovered the whole of a child's perambulator with its wheels crushed. With an air of triumph and shrill laughter, they turned round to the Australians. "'Pour le bébé! they cried. "'While there's life, there's hope,' said one of the Australians, with sardonic humor. So the martyrdom of Amiens was at an end and life came back to the city that had been dead, and the soul of the city had survived. I have not seen it since then, but one day I hope I shall go back and shake hands with Gaston the waiter and say, Comment ça va, mon vieux? How goes it, my old one? And stroll into the bookshop and say, Bonjour, mademoiselle, and walk around the cathedral and see its beauty in the moonlight again when no one will look up and say, curse the moon. There will be many ghosts in the city at night, the ghosts of British officers and men who throng those streets in the Great War and have now passed on. End of section 15Section 16 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6. Psychology on the Somme. Chapters 1 to 8. Chapter 1. All that had gone before was but a preparation for what now was to come. Until July 1 of 1916, the British armies were only getting ready for the big battles which were being planned for them by something greater than generalship, by the fate which decides the doom of men. The first battles by the old contemptibles, down from Mons and up by Ypres, were defensive actions of rear guards holding the enemy back by a thin wall of living flesh, while behind the new armies of our race were being raised. The battles of Festubert Nouveau Chapelle, Luce, and all minor attacks which led to little salience were but experimental adventures in the science of slaughter, badly bungled by our laboratories. They had no meaning apart from providing those mistakes by which men learn, ghastly mistakes, burning more than the fingers of life's children. They were only diversions of impatience in the monotonous routine of trench warfare, by which our men strengthened the mud walls of their school of courage, so that the new boys, already coming out, might learn their lessons without more grievous interruption than came from the daily visits of the intruder to whom the fees were paid. 
In those two years it was France which fought the greatest battles, flinging her sons against the enemy's ramparts in desperate, vain attempts to breach them. At Verdun, in the months that followed the first month of sixteen, it was France which sustained the full weight of the German offensive on the Western Front, and broke its human waves, until they were spent in a sea of blood, above which the French Poilu, the hairy ones, stood panting and haggard on their death-strewn rocks. The Germans had failed to deal a fatal blow at the heart of France. France held her head up still, bleeding from many wounds, but defiant still, and the German high command, aghast at their own losses, 600,000 casualties, already conscious, icily, of a dwindling manpower which one day would be cut off at its source, rearranged their order of battle and shifted the balance of their weight eastward to smash Russia. Somehow or other they must smash a way out by sledgehammer blows, left and right, west and east, from that ring of nations which girdled them. On the west they would stand now on the defensive, fairly sure of their strength, but well aware that it would be tried to the utmost by that enemy which, at the back of their brains, at the back of the narrow brains of those bald-headed vultures on the German general staff, they most feared, as their future peril, England. They had been fools to let the British armies grow up and wax so strong. It was the folly of madness by which they had flung that gauntlet down to the souls of proud peoples arrayed against them. Our armies were now strong and trained and ready. We had about 600,000 bayonet men in France and Flanders and in England. Immense reserves to fill up the gaps that would be made in their ranks before the summer foliage turned to russet tints. Our power in artillery had grown amazingly since the beginning of the year. Every month I had seen many new batteries arrive, with clean harness and yellow straps and young gunners who were quick to get their targets. We were strong in heavies, 12 inches, 9.2s, 8 inches, 4.2s, mostly howitzers, with the long-muzzled 60-pounders terrible in their long-range and destructiveness. Our aircraft had grown fast, squadron upon squadron, and our aviators had been trained in the school of General Trenchard, who sent them out over the German lines to learn how to fight, and how to scout, and how to die like little gentlemen. For a time our flying men had gone out on old-fashioned buses, primitive machines which were an easy prey to the fast-flying folkers, who waited for them behind a screen of cloud, and then stooped on them like hawks sure of their prey. But to the aerodrome near St. Omer came later models, out of date a few weeks after their delivery, replaced by still more powerful types, more perfectly equipped for fighting. Our knights errant of the air were challenging the German champions on equal terms and beating them back from the lines unless they flew in clusters. There were times when our flying men gained an absolute supremacy by greater daring. There was nothing they did not dare, and by equal skill. As a caution, not wasting their strength in unequal contests. It was sound policy, and enabled them to come back again in force and hold the field for a time by powerful concentrations. But in the battles of the Somme our airmen, at a heavy cost of life, kept the enemy down a while and blinded his eyes. The planning of new aerodromes between Albert and Amiens, the long trail down the roads of lorries packed with wings and the furniture of aircraft factories, gave the hint to those who had eyes to see that in this direction a merry hell was being prepared. There were plain signs of massacre at hand all the way from the coast to the lines. At Etaple and other places near Bologna, hospital huts and tents were growing like mushrooms in the night. From casualty clearing stations near the front, the wounded, the human wreckage of routine warfare, were being evacuated in a hurry to the base and from the base to England. They were to be cleared out of the way so that all the wards might be empty for a new population of broken men, in enormous numbers. I went down to see this clearance, this tidying up. There was a sinister suggestion in the solitude that was being made for a multitude that was coming. We shall be very busy, said the doctors. We must get all the rest we can now, said the nurses. In a little while every bed will be filled, said the matrons. 
Outside one hut, with the sun on their faces, were four wounded Germans, Württembergers and Bavarians, too ill to move just then. Each of them had lost a leg under the surgeon's knife. They were eating strawberries and seemed at peace. I spoke to one of them. Wie befinden Sie sich? Ganz wohl. Wir sind zufrieden mit unserer Behandlung. I passed through the shell-shock wards and a yard where the shell-shocks sat about dumb or making queer, foolish noises or staring with a look of animal fear in their eyes. From a padded room came a sound of singing. Some idiot of war was singing between bursts of laughter. It all seemed so funny to him, that war, so mad. We are clearing them out, said the medical officer. There will be many more soon. How soon? That was the question nobody could answer. It was the only secret, and even that was known in London, where little ladies in society were naming the date in confidence to men who were directly concerned with it, having, as they knew, only a few more weeks or days of certain life. But I believe there were not many officers who would have surrendered deliberately all share in the great push, in spite of all the horror which these young officers knew it would involve. They had to be in it and could not endure the thought that all their friends and all their men should be there while they were out of it. A decent excuse for the safer side of it, yes. A staff job, the intelligence branch, any post behind the actual shambles, and thank God for the luck, but not an absolute shirk. Tents were being pitched in many camps of the Somme, rows and rows of bell tents and pavilions stained to a reddish-brown. Small cities of them were growing up on the right of the road between Amiens and Albert, at Derincourt and Daour and Vosoucorbi. I thought they might be for troops in reserve until I saw large flags hoisted to tall staffs, and men of the RAMC busy painting signs on large sheets stretched out on the grass. It was always the same sign, the sign of the cross that was red. There was a vast traffic of lorries on the roads, and trains were traveling on light railways day and night to railroads just beyond shell range. What was all the weight they carried? No need to ask. The dumps were being filled, piled up with row upon row of shells, covered by tarpaulin or brushwood when they were all stacked. Enormous shells, some of them, like gigantic pigs without legs. Those were for the 15-inchers, or the 9.2s. There was enough high-explosive force littered along those roads above the Somme to blow cities off the map. "'It does one good to see,' said a cheery fellow. "'The people at home have been putting their backs into it. Thousands of girls have been packing those things. Well done, munitions!' I could take no joy in the sight, only a grim kind of satisfaction that at least when our men attacked they would have a power of artillery behind them. It might help them to smash through to a finish, if that were the only way to end this long, drawn suicide of nations. My friend was shocked when I said, Curse all munitions. Chapter 2 The British armies as a whole were not gloomy at the approach of that new phase of war which they called the Great Push, as though it were to be a glorified football match. It is difficult, perhaps impossible, to know the thoughts of vast masses of men moved by some sensational adventure. But a man would be a liar if he pretended that British troops went forward to the great attack with hangdog looks or any visible sign of fear in their souls. I think most of them were uplifted by the belief that the old days of trench warfare were over forever and that they would break the enemy's lines by means of that enormous gunpower behind them and get him on the run. There would be movement, excitement, triumphant victories, and then the end of the war. In spite of all risks, it would be enormously better than the routine of the trenches. They would be getting on with the job instead of standing still and being shot at by invisible earthmen. If we once get the Germans in the open, we shall go straight through them. That was the opinion of many young officers at that time, and for once they agreed with their generals. It seemed to be a question of getting them in the open and I confess that when I studied the trench maps and saw the enemy's defensive earthworks thirty miles deep in one vast maze of trenches and redoubts and barbed wire and tunnels, I was appalled at the task which lay before our men. They did not know what they were being asked to do. They had not seen, then, 
those awful maps. We were at the height and glory of our strength. Out of England had come the flower of our youth, and out of Scotland and Wales and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Even out of Ireland, with the 16th Division of the South and West, and the 36th Ulster. The new armies were made up of all the volunteers who had answered the call to the colors, not waiting for the conscription by class which followed later. They were the ardent ones, the young men from office, factory, shop, and field, university, and public school. The best of our intelligence were there, the noblest of our manhood, the strength of our heart, the beauty of our soul, in those battalions which soon were to be flung into explosive fires. Chapter 3 In the month of May a new type of manhood was filling the old roads behind the front. I saw them first in the little old town of St. Paul, where always there was a coming and a going of French and English soldiers. It was market day, and the Grand Place, not very grand, was crowded with booths and old ladies in black and young girls with checkered aprons over their black frocks and pigs and clucking fowls suddenly the people scattered and there was a rumble and a rattle of wheels as a long line of transport wagons came through the square by jove australians there was no mistaking them their slouch hats told one at a glance but without them i should have known they had a distinctive type of their own which marked them out from all the other soldiers of ours along those roads of war. They were hatchet-faced fellows who came riding through the little old market town, British unmistakably, yet not English, not Irish, nor Scottish, nor Canadian. They looked hard, with the hardness of a boyhood and a breeding away from cities, or at least away from the softer training of our way of life. They had merry eyes, especially for the girls round the stalls, but resolute, clean-cut mouths, and they rode their horses with an easy grace in the saddle, as though born to riding, and they drove their wagons with a recklessness along the little booths that was justified by half an inch between an iron axle and an old woman's table of colored ribbons. Those clean-shaven, sun-tanned, dust-covered men who had come out of the hell of the Dardanelles and the burning drought of Egyptian sands looked wonderfully fresh in France. Youth, keen as steel, with a flash in the eyes, with an utter carelessness of any peril ahead, came riding down the street. They were glad to be there. Everything was new and good to them, though so old and stale to many of us, and after their adventures in the East they found it splendid to be in a civilized country, with water in the sky and in the fields, with green trees about them, and flowers in the grass, and white people who were friendly. When they came up in the train from Marseilles, they were all at the windows, drinking in the look of the French landscape, and one of their officers told me that again and again he heard the same words spoken by those lads of his. It's a good country to fight for. It's like being home again. At first they felt chilly in France, for the weather had been bad for them during the first weeks in April, when the wind had blown cold and rain clouds had broken into sharp squalls talking to the men i saw them shiver a little and heard their teeth chatter but they said they liked a moist climate with a bite in the wind after all the blaze and glare of the egyptian sun one of their pleasures in being there was the opportunity of buying sweets they can't have had too much of them said one of the officers and the idea that those hard fellows whose homeric fighting qualities had been proved should be enthusiastic for lollipops seemed to me an amusing touch of character for tough as they were, and keen as they were, those Australian soldiers were but grown-up children with a wonderful simplicity of youth and the gift of laughter. I saw them laughing when, for the first time, they tried on gas masks, which none of us ever left behind when we went near the fighting line. That horror of war on the Western Front was new to them. Poison gas was not one of the weapons used by the Turks and the gas masks seemed a joke to the groups of Australians trying on the headgear in the fields and changing themselves into obscene specters. But one man watching them gave a shudder and said, It's a pity such splendid boys should have to risk this foul way of death. They did not hear his words, and we heard their laughter again. On the first day of their arrival, I stood in a courtyard with a young officer whose gray eyes had a fine, clear light which showed the spirit of the man and as we talked he pointed out some of the boys who passed in and out of an old barn. 
One of them had done fine work on the peninsula, contemptuous of all risks. Another had gone out under heavy fire to bring in a wounded friend. Oh, they are great lads, said the captain in the company. But now they want to get at the Germans and finish the job quickly. Give them a fair chance and they'll go far. They went far, from that time to the end, and fought with a simple, terrible courage. They had none of the discipline imposed upon our men by regular traditions. They were gypsy fellows, with none but the gypsy law in their hearts, intolerant of restraint, with no respect for rank or caste unless it carried strength with it, difficult to handle behind the lines, quick-tempered, foul-mouthed, primitive men, but lovable, human, generous souls, when their bayonets were not red with blood. Their discipline in battle was the best. They wanted to get to a place ahead. They would fight the devils of hell to get there. The New Zealanders followed them with rosy cheeks like English boys of Kent, and more gentle manners than the other Anzacs, and the same courage. They went far, too, and set the pace a while in the last lap, but that, in the summer of sixteen, was far away. In those last days of June, before the big battles began, the countryside of the Somme Valley was filled with splendor. The mustard seed had spread a yellow carpet in many meadows, so that they were fields of the cloth of gold, and clumps of red clover grew like flowers of blood. The hedges about the villages of Picardy were white with elderflower and drenched with scent. It was haymaking time, and French women and children were tossing the hay on wooden pitchforks during hot days which came between heavy rains. Our men were marching through that beauty, and were conscious of it, I think, and glad of life. Chapter 4 Bologna was a port through which all our youth passed between England and the long straight road which led to no man's land. The seven-day leave men were coming back by every tide, and all other leave was cancelled. New drafts were pouring through the port by tens of thousands, all manner of men of all our breed marching in long columns from the quayside where they had orders yelled at them through megaphones by APMs, RTOs, AMLOs, and other blue-tabbed officers who dealt with them as cattle for the slaughterhouses. I watched them landing from the transports, which came in so densely crowded with the human freight that the men were wedged together on the decks like herrings in barrels. They crossed from one boat to another to reach the gangways, and one by one, interminably as it seemed, with rifle gripped and pack hunched, and steel hat clattering like a tinker's kettle, came down the inclined plank and lurched ashore. They were English lads from every country, Scots, Irish, Welsh, of every regiment, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Canadians, West Indian Negroes of the garrison artillery, Sikhs, Pathans, and Dogras from the Indian cavalry. Some of them had been sick, and there was a greenish pallor on their faces. Most of them were deeply tanned. Many of them stepped on the quay side of France for the first time after months of training, and I could tell those sometimes by the furtive look they gave at the crowded scene about them, and by a sudden glint in their eyes, a faint reflection of the emotion that was in them, because this was another stage on their adventure of war, and the drawbridge was down at last between them and the enemy. That was all, just that look, and lips tightened now grimly, and the pack hunched higher. Then they fell in by number and marched away, with red caps to guard them, across the bridge, into the town of Bologna, and beyond to the great camp near Etat, and near the hospital, so that the German aircraft had a good argument for smashing Red Cross huts, where some of them would wait until somebody said, You're wanted. They were wanted in droves as soon as the fighting began on the first day of July. The bun shops in Bologna were filled with nurses, VADs, all kinds of girls in uniforms which glinted with shoulder straps and buttons. They ate large quantities of buns at odd hours of mornings and afternoons. Flying men and officers of all kinds waiting for trains crowded the Folkestone Hotel and restaurants where they spent two hours over luncheon and three hours over dinner, drinking red wine, talking shop, the shop of trench mortar units, machine gun sections, cavalry squadrons, air fighting, gas schools, and anti-gas schools. Regular inhabitants of Bologna, officers at the base, passed to inner rooms with French ladies of dangerous appearance, and the transients envied them and said, those fellows have all the luck. 
What's their secret? How do they arrange these cushy jobs? From open windows came the music of gramophones. Through the half-drawn curtains there were glimpses of khaki tunics and Sam Brown belts in juxtaposition with silk blouses and coiled hair and white arms. Opposite the Folkestone there was a park of ambulances driven by Scottish women, who were always on the move from one part of the town to the other. Motor cars came hooting with staff officers, all aglow in red tabs and armbands, thirsty for little cocktails after a dusty drive. Everywhere in the streets and on the esplanade there was incessant saluting. The arms of men were never still. It was like the St. Vitus disease. Tommies and jocks saluted every subaltern with an automatic gesture of convulsive energy. Every subaltern acknowledged these movements and in turn saluted a multitude of majors, colonels, and generals. The thing became farcical, a monstrous absurdity of human relationship, yet pleasing to the vanity of men lifted up above the lowest caste. It seemed to me an intensification of the snob instinct in the soul of men. Only the Australians stood out against it and went by all officers except their own, with a careless slouch and a look of to hell with all that hand-wagging. Seated on high stools in the Folkestone, our young officers clinked their cocktails and then whispered together, When's it coming? In a few days. I'm for Gomcourt sector. Do you think we shall get through? Not a doubt of it. The cavalry are massing for a great drive. As soon as we make the gap, they'll ride into the blue. By God, there'll be some slaughter. I think the old Bosch will crack this time. Well, cheerio. There was a sense of enormous drama at hand, and the excitement of it in boys' hearts drugged all doubt and fears. It was only the older men and the introspective who suffered from the torture of apprehension. Even timid fellows in the ranks were, I imagine, strengthened and exalted by the communal courage of their company or battalion for courage as well as fear is infectious, and the psychology of the crowd uplifts the individual to immense heights of daring when alone he would be terror-stricken. The public school spirit of pride in name and tradition was in each battalion of the new army, extended later to the division, which became the unit of esprit de corps. They must not let the battalion down. They would do their damnedest to get farther than any other crowd, to bag more prisoners, to gain more kudos. There was rivalry even among the platoons and the companies. A company would show B company the way to go. Their sergeant major was a great fellow. Their platoon commanders were fine kids, with anything like a chance. In that spirit, as far as I, an outsider, could see and hear, did our battalions of boys march forward to the great push whistling, singing, jesting, until their lips were dry and their throats parched in the dust, and even the merriest jesters of all were silent under the weight of their packs and rifles. So they moved up day by day through the beauty of that June in France, thousands of men, hundreds of thousands to the edge of the battlefields of the Somme, where the enemy was entrenched in fortress positions, and where already, before the last days of June, gunfire was flaming over a vast sweep of country. Chapter 5 On the 1st of July, 1916, began those prodigious battles, which only lulled down at times, during two and a half years more, when our British armies fought with desperate sacrificial valor beyond all previous reckoning, when the flower of our youth was cast into that furnace, month after month, recklessly, with prodigal, spendthrift haste, when those boys were mown down in swaths by machine guns, blown to bits by shell-fire, gassed in thousands, until all that country became a graveyard, when they went forward to new assaults or fell back in rear-guard actions with a certain knowledge that they had in their first attack no more than one chance in five of escape, next time one chance in four, then one chance in three, one chance in two, and after that no chance at all, on the line of averages as worked out by their experience of luck. More boys came out to take their places, and more and more, conscripts following volunteers, younger brothers following elder brothers. Never did they revolt from the orders that came to them. Never a battalion broke into mutiny against inevitable martyrdom. They were obedient to the command above them. Their discipline did not break. 
however profound was the despair of the individual and it was i know deep as the wells of human tragedy in many hearts the mast moved as it was directed backward or forward this way and that from one shambles to another in mud and in blood with the same massed valor as that which uplifted them before that first day of july with an intensified pride in the fame of their divisions with a more eager desire for public knowledge of their deeds with a loathing of war's misery with a sense of its supreme folly yet with a refusal in their souls to acknowledge defeat or to stop the side of victory in each battle there were officers and men who risked death deliberately and in a kind of ecstasy did acts of superhuman courage and because of the number of these feats the record of them is monotonous dull familiar the mass followed their lead and even poor coward hearts of whom there were many as in all armies had courage enough as a rule to get as far as the center of the fury before their knees gave way or they dropped dead each wave of boyhood that came out from england brought a new mass of physical and spiritual valor as great as that which was spent and in the end it was an irresistible tide which broke down the last barriers and swept through in a rush of victory which we gained at the cost of nearly a million dead and a huge sum of living agony and all our wealth and a spiritual bankruptcy worse than material loss so that now england is for the time sick to death and drained of her old pride and power chapter six i remember as though it were yesterday in vividness and a hundred years ago in time the bombardment which preceded the battles of the somme with a group of officers i stood on the high ground above albert looking over to gomcourt and thiepval and la boiselle on the left side of the german salient and then by crossing the road to Fricourt, Mametz, and Montauban, on the southern side. From Albert westward, past Thiepval Wood, ran the little river of the Ancre, and on the German side the ground rose steeply to Unze Hill by La Boiselle, and to Thiepval Chapteau above the wood. It was a formidable defensive position, one fortress girdled by line after line of trenches, and earthwork redoubts, and deep tunnels, and dugouts in which german troops could live below ground until the moment of attack the length of our front of assault was about twenty miles round the side of the salient to the village of bray on the somme where the french joined us and continued the battle from where we stood we could see a wide panorama of the german positions and beyond now and then when the smoke of shell fire drifted i caught glimpses of green fields and flower patches beyond the trench lines and church spires beyond the range of guns rising above clumps of trees and summer foliage immediately below in the foreground was the village of albert not much ruined then with its red brick church and tower from which there hung head downward the golden virgin with her babe outstretched as though as a peace offering over all this strife that leaning statue which i had often passed on the way to the trenches was now revealed brightly with the golden glamour as sheets of flame burst through a heavy veil of smoke over the valley in a field close by some troops were being ticketed with yellow labels fastened to their backs it was to distinguish them so that the artillery observers might know them from the enemy when their turn came to go into the battleground something in the sight of those yellow tickets made me feel sick away behind a french farmer was cutting his grass with a long scythe in steady sweeping strokes only now and then did he stand to look over at the most frightful picture of battle ever seen until then by human eyes i wondered and wonder still what thoughts were passing through that old brain to keep him at his work quietly steadily on the edge of hell for there quite close and clear was hell of man's making produced by chemists and scientists after centuries in search of knowledge there were the fires of hate produced out of the passion of humanity after a thousand years of christendom and of progress in the arts and beauty there was the devil worship of our poor damned human race where the most civilized nations of the world were on each side of the bonfires it was worth watching by a human ant 
I remember the noise of our guns as all our batteries took their parts in a vast orchestra of drum fire. The tumult of the field guns merged into thunderous waves. Behind me a fifteen-inch grandmother fired single strokes, and each one was an enormous shock. Shells were rushing through the air like droves of giant birds with beating wings and with strange wailings. The German lines were in eruption. Their earthworks were being tossed up, and fountains of earth sprang up between columns of smoke, black columns and white, which stood rigid for a few seconds and then sank into the banks of fog. Flames gushed up red and angry, rending those banks of mist with strokes of lightning. In their light I saw trees falling, branches tossed like twigs, black things hurtling through space. In the night before the battle, when that bombardment had lasted several days and nights, the fury was intensified. Red flames darted hither and thither, like little red devils, as our trench mortars got to work. Above the slogging of the guns there were louder, earth-shaking noises, and volcanoes of earth and fire sprouted as high as the clouds. One convulsion of this kind happened above Unza Hill, with a long, terrifying roar and a monstrous gush of flame. "'What is that?' asked someone. "'It must be the mine we charged at La Boissoide, the biggest that has ever been.' It was a good guess, when later in the battle I stood by the crater of that mine and looked into its gulf. I wondered how many Germans had been hurled into eternity when the earth had opened. The grave was big enough for a battalion of men with horses and wagons, below the chalk of the crater's lips. Often on the way to Bopon, I stepped off the road to look into that white gulf, remembering the moment when I saw the gust of flame that rent the earth about it. Chapter 7 There was the illusion of victory on the first day of the Somme battles, on the right of the line by Fricourt, and it was not until a day or two later that certain awful rumors I had heard from wounded men and officers who had attacked on the left up by Gomcourt, Thiepval, and Serre were confirmed by certain knowledge of tragic disaster on that side of the battle line. The illusion of victory, with all the price and pain of it, came to me when I saw the German rockets rising beyond the villages of Mametz and Montauban, and our barrage fire lifting to a range beyond the first lines of German trenches, and our support troops moving forward in masses to captured ground. We had broken through. By the heroic assault of our English and Scottish troops, West Yorks, Yorks and Lancs, Lincolns, Durhams, Northumberland Fusiliers, Norfolks and Berkshires, Liverpools, Manchesters, Gordons, and Royal Scots, all those splendid men I had seen marching to their lines. We had smashed through the ramparts of the German fortress, through that maze of earthworks and tunnels which had appalled me when I saw them on the maps, and over which I had gazed from time to time from our front-line trenches when those places seemed impregnable. I saw crowds of prisoners coming back under escort. Fifteen hundred had been counted in the first day, and they had the look of a defeated army. Our lightly wounded men, thousands of them, were shouting and laughing as they came down behind the lines, wearing German caps and helmets. From Amiens, civilians straggled out along the roads as far as they were allowed by military police, and waved hands and cheered those boys of ours. "'Vive la Angleterre!' cried old men, raising their hats. Old women wept at the sight of those gay wounded, and lightly touched, glad of escape rejoicing in their luck and in the glory of life which was theirs still, and cried out to them with shrill words of praise and exultation, Nous les aurons les saboches. Ah, ils sont foutus, ces bandits. C'est la victoire, grâce à vous, petites soldats anglais. Victory, the spirit of victory in the hearts of fighting men and of women excited by the sight of those bandaged heads, those bare, brawny arms splashed with blood, those laughing heroes. It looked like victory in those days, as war correspondents we were not so expert in balancing the profit and loss as afterward we became. When I went into Fricourt, on the third day of battle, after the last Germans, who had clung on to its ruins, had been cleared out by the Yorkshires and Lincolns of the 21st Division, that division which had been so humiliated at Luce, and now was wonderful in courage, 
and when the Manchesters and Gordons of the 30th Division had captured Montauban and repulsed fierce counterattacks. It looked like victory because of the German dead that lay there in their battered trenches, and the filth and stench of death all over that mangled ground, and the enormous destruction wrought by our guns, and the fury of fire which we were still pouring over the enemy's lines from batteries which had moved forward. I went down flights of steps into German dugouts, astonished by their depth and strength. Our men did not build like this. This German industry was a rebuke to us, yet we had captured their work, and the dead bodies of their laborers lay in those dark caverns, killed by our bombers, who had flung down hand grenades. I drew back from those fat corpses. They looked monstrous, lying there crumpled up amid a foul litter of clothes, stick bombs, old boots, and bottles. Groups of dead lay in ditches, which had once been trenches, flung into chaos by that bombardment I had seen. They had been bayoneted. I remember one man, an elderly fellow, sitting up with his back to a bit of earth, with his hands half raised. He was smiling a little, though he had been stabbed through the belly, and was stone dead. Victory. Some of the German dead were young boys, too young to be killed for old men's crimes and others might have been old or young. One could not tell, because they had no faces, and were just masses of raw flesh and rags and uniforms. Legs and arms lay separate, without any bodies thereabouts. Outside Montauban there was a heap of our own dead, young Gordons and Manchesters of the 30th Division. They had been caught by blasts of machine-gun fire, but our dead seemed scarce in the places where I walked. Victory? Well, we had gained some ground, and many prisoners, and here and there some guns. But as I stood by Montauban, I saw that our line was a sharp salient looped round Mehmet's village, and then dipping sharply toward Fricourt. Oh, God, had we only made another salient after all that monstrous effort? To the left there was a fury at La Boiselle, where a few broken trees stood black on the skyline on a chalky ridge. Storms of German shrapnel were bursting there, and machine-guns were firing in spasms. In Contal Maison, around a chateau which stood high above ruined houses, shells were bursting with thunderclaps, our shells. German gunners in invisible batteries were sweeping our lines with barrage fire. It roamed up and down this side of Montauban Wood, just ahead of me, and now and then shells smashed among the houses and barns of Fricourt, and over Mamets there was suddenly a hurricane of hate. Our men were working like ants in those muck heaps. A battalion moved up toward Bosselle. From a ridge above Fricourt, where once I had seen a tall crucifix between two trees, which our men called the poodles, a body of men came down, and shrapnel burst among them, and they fell and disappeared in tall grass. Stretcher-bearers came slowly through Fricourt village with living burdens. Some of them were German soldiers carrying our wounded and their own. Walking wounded hobbled slowly with their arms round each other's shoulders. Germans and English together. A boy in a steel hat stopped me and held up a bloody hand. A bit of luck, he said. I'm off after eighteen months of it. German prisoners came down with a few English soldiers as their escort. I saw distinct groups of them, and a shell smashed into one group and scattered it. The living ran, leaving their dead. Ambulances, driven by daring fellows, drove to the far edge of Fricourt, not a healthy place, and loaded up with wounded from a dressing station in a tunnel there. It was a wonderful picture of war and all its filth and shambles. But was it victory? I knew then that it was only a breach in the German bastion and that on the left, Gomcourt Way, there had been a black tragedy. Chapter 8 On the left, where the 8th and 10th Corps were directing operations, the assault had been delivered by the 4th, 29th, 36th, 49th, 32nd, 8th, and 56th Divisions. The positions in front of them were Gomcourt and the Beaumont Hamel, on the left side of the river Ancre, and the Thiepval Wood on the right side of the Ancre, leading up to Thiepval Chateau, on the crest of the cliff. These were the hardest positions to attack, because of the rising ground and the immense strength of the enemy's earthworks and tunneled defenses. 
but our generals were confident that the gunpowder at their disposal was sufficient to smash down that defensive system and make an easy way through for the infantry. They were wrong. In spite of that tornado of shell-fire which I had seen tearing up the earth, many tunnels were still unbroken, and out of them came masses of German machine-gunners and riflemen, when our infantry rose from their own trenches on that morning of July 1st. Our guns had shifted their barrage forward at that moment, farther ahead of the infantry than was afterward allowed, the men being trained to follow close to the lines of bursting shells, trained to expect a number of casualties from their own guns, it needs some training, in order to secure the general safety gained by keeping the enemy below ground until our bayonets were round his dugouts. The Germans had been trained, too, to an act of amazing courage. Their discipline, that immense power of discipline which dominates men in the mass, was strong enough to make them obey the order to rush through the barrage of ours, that advancing wall of explosion, and, if they lived through it, to face our men in the open with massed machine-gun fire. So they did, and as English, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh battalions of our assaulting divisions trudged forward over what had been no man's land, machine-gun bullets sprayed upon them, and they fell like grass to the scythe. Line after line of men followed them, and each line crumpled, and only small groups and single figures, seeking comradeship, hurried forward. German machine-gunners were bayoneted, as their thumbs were still pressed to their triggers. In German front lines, trenches at the bottom of Thiepfall Wood, outside Beaumont Hamel, and on the edge of Gomcourt Park, the field-gray men who came out of their dugouts fought fiercely with stick-bombs and rifles, and our officers and men, in places where they had strength enough, clubbed them to death, stuck them with bayonets, and blew their brains out with revolvers at short range. Then those English and Irish and Scottish troops, grievously weak because of all the dead and wounded behind them, struggled through to the second German line, from which there came a still fiercer rattle of machine-gun and rifle fire. Some of them broke through that line, too, and went ahead in isolated parties across the wild crater land, over chasms and ditches and fallen trees, toward the highest ground, which had been their goal. Nothing was seen of them. They disappeared into clouds of smoke and flame. Gunner observers saw rockets go up in far places our rockets, showing that outposts had penetrated into the German lines. Runners came back, survivors of many predecessors who had fallen on the way, with scribbled messages from company officers. One came from the Essex and King's Own of the 4th Division, at a place called Pendant Cops, southeast of Serre. For God's sake, send us bombs! It was impossible to send the bombs. No man could get to them through the deep barrage of shell-fire which was between them and our supporting troops. Many tried and died. The Ulster men went forward toward Beaumont Hamel with a grim valor which was reckless of their losses. Beaumont Hamel was a German fortress. Machine-gun fire raked every yard of the Ulster way. Hundreds of the Irish fell. I met hundreds of them wounded, tall, strong, powerful men from the Queen's Island and Belfast factories, and Tyneside Irish and Tyneside Scots. They gave us no chance, said one of them, a sergeant major. They just murdered us. But bunches of them went right into the heart of the German positions, and then found behind them crowds of Germans who had come up out of the tunnels and flung bombs at them. Only a few came back alive in the darkness. Into Thiepfall Wood our men smashed their way through the German trenches, not counting those who fell, and killing any German who stood in their way. Inside that wood of dead trees and charred branches they reformed, astonished at the fewness of their numbers. Germans coming up from the holes in the earth attacked them, and they held firm and took two hundred prisoners. Other Germans came closing in like wolves in packs and to a German officer who said, Surrender, our men shouted, No surrender, and fought in Thiepfall Wood until most were dead, and only a few crawled out to tell that tale. The Londoners of the 56th Division had no luck at all. Theirs was the worst luck, because, 
by a desperate courage and assault, they did break through the German lines at Gomcourt. Their left was held by the London Rifle Brigade. The Rangers and the Queen Victoria Rifles, the old Vicks, formed their center. Their right was made up by the London Scottish, and behind came the Queen's Westminsters and the Kensingtons, who were to advance through their comrades to a farther objective. Across a wide no-man's land they suffered from the bursting of heavy crumps, and many fell, but they escaped annihilation by machine-gun fire and stormed through the upheaved earth into Gomcourt Park, killing many Germans and sending back batches of prisoners. They had done what they had been asked to do, and started building up barricades of earth and sandbags, and then found they were in a death trap. There were no troops on their right or left. They had thrust out into a salient, which presently the enemy saw. The German gunners, with deadly skill, boxed it round with shell fire, so that the Londoners were enclosed by explosive walls, and then very slowly and carefully drew a line of bursting shells up and down, up and down, that captured ground, ravaging its earth anew, and smashing the life that crouched there. London life. I have written elsewhere, in the battles of the Somme, how young officers and small bodies of these linden men held the barricades against German attacks, while others tried to break away through that murderous shell-fire, and how groups of lads, who set out on that adventure to their old lines, were shattered, so that only a few from each group crawled back alive, wounded or unwounded. At the end of the day the Germans acted with chivalry which I was not allowed to tell at the time. The general of the London Division, Philip Howell, told me that the enemy sent over a message by a low-flying airplane proposing a truce while the stretcher-bearers worked, and offering the service of their own men in that work of mercy. This offer was accepted without reference to GHQ, and German stretcher-bearers helped to carry our wounded to a point where they could be reached. Many, in spite of that, remained lying out in a no-man's land, some for three or four days and nights. I met one man who lay out there wounded with a group of comrades more badly hurt than he was until July 6th. At night he crawled over to the bodies of the dead and took their water bottles and iron rations, and so brought drink and food to his stricken friends. Then at last he made his way through roving shells to our lines, and even then asked to leave the stretcher-bearers who volunteered on a search party for his pals. Physical courage was very common in the war, said a friend of mine who saw nothing of war. It is proved that physical courage is the commonest quality of mankind, as moral courage is the rarest. But that soldier's courage was spiritual, and there were many like him in the battles of the Somme, and in other later battles as tragic as those. End of section 16. Section 17 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6, Chapters 9 to 13. Chapter 9. I have told how, before the big push, as we called the beginning of these battles, little towns of tents were built under the sign of the Red Cross. For a time they were inhabited only by medical officers, nurses, and orderlies, busily getting ready for a sudden invasion, and spending their surplus energy, which seemed inexhaustible, on the decoration of their camps by chalk-lined paths, red crosses painted on canvas or built up in red and white chalk on level earth, and flowers planted outside the tents. All very pretty and picturesque in the sunshine and the breezes over the valley of the Somme. On the morning of battle, the doctors, nurses, and orderlies waited for their patients and said, Now we shan't be long. They were merry and bright, with that wonderful cheerfulness which enabled them to face the tragedy of mangled manhood without horror and almost, it seemed, without pity, because it was their work and they were there to heal what might be healed. It was with a rush that their first cases came, and the M.O.s whistled and said, Ye gods, how many more? Many more. The tide did not slacken. It became a spate brought down by waves of ambulances. Three thousand wounded came from Daur, 
on the Somme, three thousand to Corby, thousands to Durancourt, Haley, Pouchevier, Totencourt, and many other clearing stations. At Deor, the tents were filled to overflowing until there was no more room. The wounded were laid down on the grass to wait their turn for the surgeon's knife. Some of them crawled over to haycocks and covered themselves with hay and went to sleep, as I saw them sleeping there like dead men. Here and there shell-shocked boys sat weeping or moaning and shaking with an ague. Most of the wounded were quiet and did not give any groan or moan. The lightly wounded sat in groups telling their adventures, cursing the German machine-gunners. Young officers spoke in a different way, and with that sporting spirit which they had learned in public schools praised their enemy. The machine-gunners are wonderful fellows, topping. Fight until they're killed. They gave us hell. Each man among those thousands of wounded had escaped death a dozen times or more by the merest flukes of luck. It was this luck of theirs which they hugged with a kind of laughing excitement. It's a marvel I'm here. That shell burst all around me. Killed six of my pals. I got through with a blighty wound. No bones broken. God, what luck! The death of other men did not grieve them. They could not waste this sense of luck in pity. The escape of their own individuality, this possession of life, was a glorious thought. They were alive. What luck! What luck! We called the hospital at Corby the butcher's shop. It was in a pretty spot in that little town, with a big church whose tall white towers looked down a broad sweep of the Somme, so that for miles they were a landmark behind the battlefields. Behind the lines during those first battles, but later, in 1918, when the enemy came nearly to the gates of Amiens, a stronghold of the Australians, who garrisoned it and sniped pigeons for their pots off the top of the towers, and took no great notice of whiz-bangs which broke through the roofs of cottages and barns. It was a safe, snug place in July of 16, but that butcher's shop at the corner of the square was not a pretty spot. After a visit there I had to wipe cold sweat from my forehead and found myself trembling in a queer way. It was the medical officer, a colonel, who called it that name. This is our butcher's shop, he said cheerily. Come and have a look at my cases. They're the worst possible. Stomach wounds, compound fractures and all that. We lop off limbs here all day long and all night. You've no idea. I had no idea, but I did not wish to see its reality. The M.O. could not understand my reluctance to see his show. He put it down to my desire to save his time, and explained that he was going the rounds and would take it as a favor if I would walk with him. I yielded weakly and cursed myself for not taking to flight. Yet, I argued, what men are brave enough to suffer, I ought to have the courage to see. I saw and sickened. These were the victims of victory, and the red fruit of war's harvest fields. A new batch of cases had just arrived. More were being brought in on stretchers. They were laid down in rows on the floorboards. The colonel bent down to some of them and drew their blankets back, and now and then felt a man's pulse. Most of them were unconscious, breathing with the hard snuffle of dying. Their skin was already darkened to the death tint, which is not white. They were all plastered with a gray clay, and this mud on their faces was, in some cases, mixed with thick clots of blood, making a hard incrustation from scalp to chin. That fellow won't last long, said the M.O., rising from a stretcher. Hardly a heartbeat left in him. Sure to die on the operating table if he gets as far as that. Step back against the wall a minute, will you? We flattened ourselves against the passage wall, while ambulance men brought in a line of stretchers. No sound came from most of those bundles under the blankets. But from one came a long, agonizing wail, the cry of an animal in torture. "'Come through the ward,' said the colonel. "'They're pretty bright, though we could do with more space and light.' In one long, narrow room there were about thirty beds, and in each bed lay a young British soldier, or part of a young British soldier. There was not much left of one of them. 
Both his legs had been amputated to the thigh, and both his arms to the shoulder blades. Remarkable man, that, said the colonel, simply refuses to die. His vitality is so tremendous that it is putting up a terrific fight against mortality. There's another case of the same kind, one leg gone and the other going, and one arm. Deliberate refusal to give in. You're not going to kill me, doctor, he said. I'm going to stick it through. What spirit, eh? I spoke to that man. He was quite conscious, with bright eyes. His right leg was uncovered and supported on a board hung from the ceiling. Its flesh was like that of a chicken, badly carved white, flabby, and in tatters. He thought I was a surgeon and spoke to me pleadingly. I guess you can save that leg, sir. It's doing fine. I should hate to lose it. I murmured something about a chance for it, and the M.O. broke in cheerfully. You won't lose it if I can help it. How's your pulse? Oh, not bad. Keep cheerful and we'll pull you through. The man smiled gallantly. Bound to come off, said the doctor, as we passed to another bed. Gas gangrene. That's the thing that does us down. In bed after bed I saw men of ours, very young men, who had been lopped of limbs a few hours ago or a few minutes, some of them unconscious, some of them strangely and terribly conscious, with a look in their eyes as though staring at the death which sat near to them and edged nearer. Yes, said the M.O., they look bad, some of them, but youth is on their side. I dare say seventy-five per cent will get through, if it wasn't for gas gangrene. He jerked his head to a boy sitting up in bed, smiling at the nurse who felt his pulse. Looks fairly fit after the knife, doesn't he? But we shall have to cut higher up the gas again. I'm afraid he'll be dead before tomorrow. Come into the operating theater. It's very well equipped. I refused that invitation. I walked stiffly out of the butcher's shop of Corby, past the man who lost both arms and both legs, that vital trunk, past rows of men lying under blankets, past a stench of mud and blood and anesthetics, to the fresh air of the gateway, where a column of ambulances had just arrived with a new harvest from the fields of the Somme. "'Come in again any time,' shouted out the cheery colonel, waving his hand. I never went again, though I saw many other butchers' shops in the years that followed, where there was a great carving of human flesh, which was of our boyhood, while the old men directed their sacrifice, and the profiteers grew rich, and the fires of hate were stoked up at patriotic banquets and in editorial chairs. CHAPTER Ten. The failure on the left, hardly balanced by the partial success on the right, caused a sudden pause in the operations, camouflaged by small attacks on minor positions around and above Fricourt and Mametz. The Lincolns and others went over to Fricourt Wood and routed out German machine gunners. The West Yorks attacked the sunken road at Fricourt. The Dorsets, Manchesters, Highland Light Infantry, Lancashire Fusiliers, and borderers of the 32nd Division were in possession of La Boiselle and clearing out communication trenches to which the Germans were hanging on with desperate valor. The 21st Division, Northumberland Fusiliers, Durham's, Yorkshire's, were making a flanking attack on Cantalmaison, but weakened after their heavy losses on the first day of battle. The fighting for a time was local, in small copses, Lozenge Wood, Peak Wood, Caterpillar Wood, Acid Drop Copse, where English and German troops fought ferociously for yards of ground, hummocks of earth, ditches. GHQ had been shocked by the disaster on the left and the failure of all the big hopes they had held for a breakthrough on both sides of the German positions. Rumors came to us that the Commander-in-Chief had decided to restrict future operations to minor actions for strengthening the line and to abandon the great offensive. It was believed by officers I met that Sir Henry Rawlinson was arguing, persuading, in favor of continued assaults on the grand scale. Whatever division of opinion existed in the high command, I do not know. It was visible to all of us that for some days there were uncertainty of direction, hesitation, conflicting orders. On July 7th, the 17th Division, under General Pilcher, attacked Contalmaison, and a whole battalion of the Prussian Guard, 
hurried up from Valenciennes and thrown on to the battlefield without maps or guidance, walked into the barrage which covered the advance of our men and were almost annihilated. But although some bodies of our men entered Contalmazon in an attack which I was able to see, they were smashed out of it again by storms of fire, followed by masses of men who poured out from Mamet's wood. The Welsh were attacking Mamet's wood. They were handled, as Marbeau said of his men in the Napoleonic battle, like turnips. Battalion commanders received orders in direct conflict with one another. Bodies of Welshmen were advanced and then retired, and left to lie nakedly without cover, under dreadful fire. The 17th Division, under General Pilcher, did not attack at the expected time. There was no coordination of divisions, no knowledge among battalion officers of the strategy or tactics of a battle in which their men were involved. "'Goodness knows what's happening,' said an officer I met near Mehmet's. He had been waiting all night and half a day with a body of troops who had expected to go forward and were still hanging about under harassing fire. On July 9th, Contalmaison was taken. I saw that attack very clearly, so clearly that I could almost count the bricks in the old chateau set in the little wood, and I saw the left-hand tower knocked off by a direct hit of a fifteen-inch shell. At four o'clock in the afternoon, our guns concentrated on the village, and under the cover of that fire our men advanced on three sides of it, hemmed it in, and captured it with the garrison of the 122nd Bavarian Regiment, who had suffered the agonies of hell inside its ruins. Now our men stayed in the ruins, and this time German shells smashed into the chateau and the cottages, and left nothing but rubbish heaps of brick through which a few days later I went walking with the smell of death in my nostrils. Our men were now being shelled in that place. Beyond La Boiselle, on the left of the albert Beaupont Road, there had been a village called Ouvier. It was no longer there. Our guns had removed every trace of it, except as it lay in heaps of pounded brick. The Germans had a network of trenches about it, and in their ditches and their dugouts they fought like wolves. Our 12th Division was ordered to drive them out, a division of English county troops, including the Sussex, Essex, Bedfords, and Middlesex, and those country boys of ours fought their way among communication trenches, burrowed into tunnels, crouched below hummocks of earth and brick, and with bombs and bayonets and broken rifles and boulders of stone and German stick bombs and any weapon that would kill, gained yard by yard over the dead bodies of the enemy, or by the capture of small batches of cornered men, until after seventeen days of this, one hundred and forty men of the Third Prussian Guard, the last of their garrison without food or water, raised a signal of surrender and came out with their hands up. Ovier was a shambles, in a fight of primitive earthmen like human beasts. Yet our men were not beast-like. They came out from those places, if they had the luck to come out, apparently unchanged, without any mark of the beast on them and when they cleansed themselves of mud and filth, boiled the lice out of their shirts, and assembled in a village street behind the lines, they whistled, laughed, gossiped, as though nothing had happened to their souls, though something had really happened, as now we know. It was not until July 14th that our high command ordered another general attack after the local fighting which had been in progress since the first day of the battle. Our field batteries and some of our heavies had moved forward to places like Montauban and Contalmaison, where German shells came searching for them all day long, and new divisions had been brought up to relieve some of the men who had been fighting so hard and so long. It was to be an attack on the second German line of defense on the ridges of the village of bazentin la grande and bazentin la petite to Longeval, on the right, and Delville Wood. I went up in the night to see the bombardment and the beginning of the battle, and the swirl of its backwash, and I remember now the darkness of villages behind the lines through which our cars crawled, until we reached the edge of the battlefields, and saw the sky rent by incessant flames of gunfire, while red tongues of flame leaped up from burning villages. Longeval was on fire, and the two Bazentines, and another belt of land in France 
so beautiful to see, even as I had seen it first between the sandbags of our parapets, was being delivered to the charcoal burners. I have described that night scene elsewhere, in all its deviltry, but one picture which I passed on the way to the battlefield could not then be told. Yet it was significant of the mentality of our high command, as was afterward pointed out derisively by Sixte von Armin. It proved the strange unreasoning optimism which still lingered in the breasts of old-fashioned generals in spite of what had happened on the left on the first day of July, and their study of trench maps, and their knowledge of German machine guns. By an old mill-house called Moulin Vivier, outside the village of Malti, were masses of cavalry, Indian cavalry and dragoons, drawn up densely to leave a narrow passageway for field guns and horse transport moving through the village, which was in utter darkness. The Indians sat like statues on their horses, motionless, dead silent. Now and again there was a jangle of bits. Here and there a British soldier lit a cigarette, and for a second the little flame of his match revealed a bronze face or glinted on steel helmets. Cavalry! So even now there was a serious purpose behind the joke of English soldiers who had gone forward on the first day shouting, This way to the gap! And in the conversation of some of those who actually did ride through Bazentine that day. A troop or two made their way over the cratered ground and skirted Delville Wood. The dragoon guards charged a machine gun in a cornfield and killed the gunners. Germans, rounded up by them, clung to their stirrup leathers, crying, Pity! Pity! The Indians lowered their lances, but took prisoners to show their chivalry. But it was nothing more than a beau geste. It was as futile and absurd as Don Quixote's charge of the windmill. They were brought to a dead halt by the nature of the ground and machine-gun fire, which killed their horses, and lay out that night with German shells searching for their bodies. One of the most disappointed men in the army was on General Haldane's staff. He was an old cavalry officer, and this major of the old, old school, belonging in spirit to the time of Charles Lever, was excited by the thought that there was to be a cavalry adventure. He was one of those who swore that if he had his chance he would ride into the blue. It was a chance he wanted, and he nursed his way to it by delicate attentions to General Haldane. The general's bed was not so comfortable as his. He changed places. He even went so far as to put a bunch of flowers on the general's table in his dugout. "'You seem very attentive to me, Major,' said the general, smelling a rat. Then the major blurted out his desire. Could he lead a squadron round Delville Wood? Could he take that ride into the blue? He would give his soul to do it. "'Get on with your job,' said General Haldane." That ride into the blue did not encourage the cavalry to the belief that they would be of real value in a warfare of trench lines and barbed wire, but for a long time afterward they were kept moving backward and forward between the edge of the battlefields and the back areas, to the great encumbrance of the roads, until they were guided by the infantry and irritable, so their officers told me, to the verge of mutiny. Their irritability was cured by dismounting them for a turn in the trenches and I came across the household cavalry digging by the Coniston steps, this side of Thiepval, and cursing their spade work. In this book I will not tell again the narrative of that, fighting in the summer and autumn of 1916, which I had written with many details of each day's scene in my collected dispatches called The Battles of the Somme. There is little that I can add to those word pictures which I wrote day by day after haunting experiences amid the ruin of those fields, except a summing up of their effect upon the mentality of our men, and upon the Germans who were in the same bloodbath, as they called it, and a closer analysis of the direction and mechanism of our military machine. Looking back upon those battles in the light of knowledge gained in the years that followed, it seems clear that our high command was too prodigal in its expenditure of life in small sectional battles, and that the Army Corps and divisional staffs had not established an efficient system of communication with the fighting units under their control. It seemed to an outsider like myself that a number of separate battles were being fought without reference to one another in different parts of the field. 
it seemed as though our generals after conferring with one another over telephones said all right tell so-and-so to have a go at thiepval or today we'll send such and such a division to capture delville wood or we must get that line of trenches outside Bazentine. Orders were drawn up on the basis of that decision and passed down to the brigades, who read them as their sentence of death, and obeyed with or without protest, and sent three or four battalions to assault a place which was covered by German batteries round an arc of twenty miles, ready to open out a tempest of fire directly a rocket rose from their infantry and to tear up the woods and earth in that neighborhood if our men gained ground. If the whole battle line moved forward, the German fire would have been dispersed, but in these separate attacks on places like Tron Wood and Delville Wood, and later on High Wood, it was a vast concentration of explosives which plowed up our men. So it was that Delville Wood was captured and lost several times and became Devil's Wood, to men who lay there under the crash and fury of massed gunfire, until a wretched remnant of what had been a glorious brigade of youth crawled out stricken and bleeding, when relieved by another brigade ordered to take their turn in that devil's cauldron, or to recapture it when German bombing parties and machine gunners had followed in the wake of fire, and had crouched again among the fallen trees and in the shell craters and ditches, with our dead and their dead to keep them company. In Delville Wood, the South African Brigade of the Ninth Division was cut to pieces, and I saw the survivors come out with a few officers to lead them. In Trone Wood, in Bernafee Wood, in Mammoth's Wood, there had been great slaughter of English troops and Welsh. The 18th Division and the 38th suffered horribly. In Delville Wood, many battalions were slashed to pieces before these South Africans, and after that came High Wood. All that was left of Highwood in the autumn of 1916 was a thin row of branchless trees, but in July and August there were still glades under heavy foliage, until the branches were lopped off and the leaves scattered by our incessant fire. It was an important position, vital for the enemy's defense, and our attack on the right flank of Posier Ridge, above Bessentine and Delville Wood giving on the reverse slope a fine observation of the enemy's lines above Montenpuich and Cochelette away to the Bopon. For that reason, the Germans were ordered to hold it at all costs, and many German batteries had registered on it to blast our men out if they gained a foothold on our side of the slope or theirs. So Highwood became another hell on a day of great battle, September 14, 1916, when for the first time tanks were used demoralizing the enemy in certain places, though there were too few in number to strike a paralyzing blow. The Londoners gained part of high wood at frightful cost, and then were blown out of it. Other divisions followed them and found the wood stuffed with machine guns, which they had to capture through hurricanes of bullets before they crouched in craters amid dead Germans and dead English, and then were blown out like the Londoners under shell fire, in which no human life could stay for long. The 7th Division was cut up there. The 33rd Division lost 6,000 men in advance against uncut wire in the wood, which they were told was already captured. Hundreds of men were vomiting from the effect of gas shells, choking and blinded. Behind, the transport wagons and horses were smashed to bits. The divisional staffs were often ignorant of what was happening to the fighting men when the attack was launched. Light signals, rockets, heliographing were of small avail through the dust, the smoke clouds. Forward observing officers, crouching behind parapets, as I often saw them, and sometimes stood with them, watched fires burning, red rockets and green, gusts of flame, and bursting shells, and were doubtful what to make of it all. Telephone wires trailed across the ground for miles were cut into short lengths by shrapnel and high explosive. Accidents happened as part of the inevitable blunders of war. It was all a vast tangle and complexity of strife. On July 17th, I stood in a tent by a staff officer who was directing a group of heavy guns supporting the 3rd Division. He was tired, as I could see by the black lines under his eyes and tightly drawn lips. On a camp table in front of him, upon which he leaned his elbows, there was a telephone apparatus and a little bell kept ringing as we talked. 
Now and then a shell burst in a field outside the tent, and he raised his head and said, They keep crumping about here. Hope they don't tear this tent to ribbons. That sounds like a gas shell. Then he turned to the telephone again and listened to some voice speaking. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, go on. Our men seen living high wood? Yes. Shelled by our artillery? Are you sure of that? I say, are you sure they were our men? Another message. Well, carry on. Men digging on road from Highwood southeast to Longeval. Yes, I've got that. They are our men, and not Boche. Oh, hell! Get off the line! Get off the line, can't you? Our men, and not Boche. Yes, I have that. Heavily shelled by our guns. The staff officer tapped on the table with a lead pencil, a tattoo, while his forehead puckered. Then he spoke into the telephone again. Are you there? Heavies? Well, don't disturb those fellows for half an hour. After that, I will give you new orders. Try and confirm if they are our men. He rang off and turned to me. That's the trouble. Looks as if we had been pounding our own men like hell. Some damn fool reports Boche. Gives the reference number. Asks for the heavies. Then some other fellow says, Not Boche. For God's sake, cease fire. How is one to tell? I could not answer this question, but I hated the idea of our men sent forward to capture a road or a trench or a wood, and then pounded by our guns. They had enough pounding from the enemy's guns. There seemed a missing link in the system somewhere. Probably it was quite inevitable. Over and over again the wounded swore to God that they had been shelled by our own guns. The Londoners said so from Highwood. The Australians said so from Moquette Farm. The Scots said so from Longeval. They said, Why the hell do we get murdered by British gunners? What's the good of fighting if we're slaughtered by our own side? In some cases they were mistaken. It was an enfilade fire from German batteries. But often it happened according to the way of that telephone conversation in the tent by Bronfebe Farm. The difference between British soldiers and German soldiers crawling over shell craters or crouching below the banks of a sunken road was no more than the difference between two tribes of ants. Our flying Scots, however low they flew, risking the archies and the machine-gun bullets, often mistook khaki for field gray, and came back with false reports which led to tragedy. Chapter 11 People who read my war dispatches will remember my first descriptions of the tanks and those of other correspondents. They caused a sensation and a sense of excitement, laughter which shook the nation because of the comicality, the grotesque surprise, the possibility of quicker victory, which caught hold of the imagination of people who heard for the first time of those new engines of war, so beast-like in appearance and performance. The vagueness of our descriptions was due to the censorship, which forbade, wisely enough, any technical and exact definition, so that we had to compare them to giant toads, mammoths, and prehistoric animals of all kinds. Our accounts did, however, reproduce the psychological effect of the tanks upon the British troops when these engines appeared for the first time to their astonished gaze on September 13th. Our soldiers roared with laughter, as I did when they saw them lolloping up the roads. On the morning of the great battle of September 15th, the presence of these tanks going into action excited all the troops along the front with a sense of comical relief in the midst of the grim and deadly business of attack. Men followed them, laughing and cheering. There was a wonderful thrill in the airman's message. Tank walking up the high street of Flares, with British army cheering behind. Wounded boys, whom I met that morning, grinned in spite of their wounds at our first word about the tanks. Crikey, said a cockney lad of the 47th Division. I can't help laughing every time I think of them tanks. I saw them stamping down German machine guns as though they were wasp nests. The adventures of Creme de Mouth, Cordon Rouge, and Bing boys on both sides of the Beaupalm Road when they smashed down barbed wire, climbed over trenches, sat on German redoubts, and received the surrender of German prisoners who held their hands up to these monsters and cried, Comrade! were like fairy tales of war by H. G. Wells. 
Yet their romance had a sharp edge of reality, as I saw in these battles of the Somme, and afterward, more grievously, in the Cambrai salient and Flanders, when the tanks were put out of action by direct hits of field guns, and nothing of humankind remained in them but the charred bones of their gallant crews. Before the battle in September of 16, I talked with the pilots of the first tanks, and although they were convinced of the value of these new engines of war, and were out to prove it, they did not disguise from me, nor from their own souls, that they were going forth upon a perilous adventure with the odds of luck against them. I remember one young pilot, a tiny fellow like a jockey, who took me on one side and said, I want you to do me a favor, and then scribbled down his mother's address and asked me to write to her if anything happened to him. He and other tank officers were anxious. They had not complete confidence in the steering and control of their engines. It was a difficult and clumsy kind of gear, which was apt to break down at a critical moment, as I saw when I rode in one on their field maneuver. These first tanks were only experimental, and the tail arrangement was very weak. Worse than all mechanical troubles was the short-sighted policy of some authority at GHQ who had insisted upon ASC drivers being put to this job a few days before the battle without proper training. "'It is mad and murderous,' said one of the officers. "'These fellows may have pluck all right. I don't doubt it. But they don't know their engines, nor the double steering trick, and they have never been under shell fire. It is asking for trouble.' As it turned out, the ASC drivers proved their pluck, for the most part, splendidly, but many tanks broke down before they reached the enemy's lines, and in that action in later battles there were times when they bitterly disappointed the infantry commanders and the troops. Individual tanks, commanded by gallant young officers and served by brave crews, did astounding feats, and some of these men came back dazed and deaf and dumb after forty hours or more of fighting and maneuvering within steel walls, intensely hot, filled with the fumes of their engines, jolted and banged about over rough ground, and steering an uncertain course after the loss of their tails, which had snapped at the spine. But there had not been anything like enough tanks to secure an annihilating surprise over the enemy as afterward was attained in the first battle of Cambrai, and the troops who had been buoyed up by that hope that at last the machine-gun evil was going to be scotched were disillusioned and dejected when they saw tanks ditched behind the lines or nowhere in sight when once again they had to trudge forward under the flail of machine-gun bullets from earthwork redoubts. It was a failure in generalship to give away our secret before it could be made effective. I remember sitting in the mess of the Gordons in the village of Franvillers along the Albert Road and listening to a long monologue by a Gordon officer on the future of the tanks. He was a dreamer and visionary, and his fellow officers laughed at him. A few tanks are no good, he said. Forty or fifty tanks are no good on a modern battlefront. We want hundreds of tanks, brought up secretly, fed with ammunition by tank carriers, bringing up field guns and going into action without any preliminary barrage. They can smash through the enemy's wire and get over his trenches before he is aware that an attack has been organized. Up to now, all our offensives have been futile because of our preliminary advertisement by prolonged bombardment. The tanks can bring back surprise to modern warfare, but we must have hundreds of them. Prolonged laughter greeted the speech, but the Celtic dreamer did not smile. He was staring into the future, and what he saw was true, though he did not live to see it, for in the Cambrai battle of November 11th, tanks did advance in hundreds and gained an enormous surprise over the enemy and led the way to a striking victory which turned to tragedy because of risks too lightly taken chapter twelve one branch of our military machine developed with astonishing rapidity and skill during those psalm battles the young gentlemen of the air force went all out for victory and were reckless in audacity how far they acted under orders and against their own judgment of what was sensible and sound in fighting risks, I do not know. General Trenchard, their supreme chief, believed in an aggressive policy at all costs, and was a Napoleon in this war of the skies, intolerant of timidity, 
not squeamish of heavy losses if the balance were tipped against the enemy. Some young flying men complained to me bitterly that they were expected to fly or die over the German lines, whatever the weather or whatever the risks. Many of them, after repeated escapes from anti-aircraft shells and hostile craft, lost their nerve, shirked another journey, found themselves crying in their tents, and were sent back home for a spell by squadron commanders, with quick observation for the breaking point, or made a few more flights and fell to earth like broken birds. Sooner or later, apart from rare cases, every man was found to lose his nerve, unless he lost his life first. That was a physical and mental law. But until that time, these flying men were the knights errant of the war, and most of them did not need any driving to the risks they took with boyish recklessness. They were mostly boys, babes, as they seemed to me, when I saw them in their tents or dismounting from their machines. On dud days, when there was no visibility at all, they spent their leisure hours joyriding to Amiens or some other town where they could have a binge. They drank many cocktails and roared with laughter over bottles of cheap champagne and flirted with any girl who happened to come within their orbit. If not allowed beyond their tents, they sulked like baby Achilles, reading novelettes with their knees hunched up, playing the gramophone, and ragging each other. There was one child so young that his squadron leader would not let him out to go across the battle lines to challenge any German scout in the clouds or do any of the fancy stunts that were part of the next day's program. He went to bed sulkily, and then came back again in his pajamas with rumpled hair. "'Look here, sir,' he said. "'Can I go? I've got my wings. It's perfectly rotten being left behind.' The squadron commander, who told me of the tale, yielded. All right. Only don't do any fool tricks. Next morning the boy flew off, played a lone hand, chased a German scout, dropped low over the enemy's lines, machine-gunned infantry on the march, scattered them, bombed a train, chased a German motor car, and after many adventures came back alive and said, I've had a rare old time. On a stormy day which loosened the tent poles and slapped the wet canvas, I sat in a mess with a group of flying officers, drinking tea out of a tin mug. One boy, the youngest of them, had just brought down his first Hun. He told me the tale of it with many details, his eyes alight as he described the flight. They had maneuvered round each other for a long time. Then he shot his man, en passant. The machine crashed on our side of the lines. He had taken off the iron crosses of the wings and a bit of the propeller as mementos. He showed me these things, while the squadron commander, who had brought down twenty-four Germans, winked at me, and told me he was going to send them home to hang beside his college trophies. I guessed he was less than nineteen years old. Such a kid. A few days later, when I went to the tent again, I asked about him. How's that boy who brought down his first hun? The squadron commander said, Didn't you hear? He's gone west brought down in a dogfight. He had a chance of escape, but went back to rescue a pal. A nice boy. They became fatalists after a few flights, and believed in their luck, or their mascots, teddy bears, a bullet that had missed them, china dolls, a girl's lock of hair, a silver ring. Yet at the back of their brains, most of them, I fancy, knew that it was only a question of time before they went west and with that unconscious thought they crowded in all life intensely in the hours that were given to them, seized all chance of laughter, of wine, of every kind of pleasure within reach, and said their prayers, some of them, with great fervor, between one escape and another. Like young Paul Bencher, who has revealed his soul in verse, his secret terror, his tears, his hatred of death, his love of life, when he went bombing over Bruges. On the mornings of the battles of the Somme, I saw them as the heralds of a new day of strife, flying toward the lines in the first light of dawn. When the sun rose, its rays touched their wings, made them white like cabbage butterflies, or changed them to silver, all a sparkle. I saw them fly over the German positions, not changing their course. Then all about them burst black puffs of German shrapnel, so that many times I held my breath because they seemed in the center of the burst, 
but generally when the cloud cleared they were flying again until they disappeared in the mists over the enemy's country there they did deadly work in single fights with german airmen or against great odds until they had an air space to themselves and skimmed the earth like albatrosses in low flight attacking machine-gun nests killing or scattering the gunners by a burst of bullets from their lewis guns dropping bombs on german wagon transports infantry railway trains one man cut a train in half and saw men and horses falling out and ammunition dumps directing the fire of our guns upon living targets photographing new trenches and works bombing villages crowded with german troops that they struck terror into these german troops was proved afterward when we went into Bopam and Peron, and many villages from which the enemy retreated after the battles of the Somme. Everywhere there were signboards on which was written Fliegelschutz, aircraft shelter, or German warnings of Keep to the sidewalks. This road is constantly bombed by British airmen. They were a new plague of war, and did for a time gain a complete mastery of the air. But later the Germans learned the lesson of low flying and night bombing and in 1917 and 1918 came back in greater strength and made the nights horrible in camps behind the lines and in villages where they killed many soldiers and more civilians the infantry did not believe much in our air supremacy at any time not knowing what work was done beyond their range of vision and seeing our machines crashed in no man's land and hearing the rattle of machine guns from hostile aircraft above their own trenches those aviators of ours a general said to me are the biggest liars in the world cocky fellows claiming impossible achievements what proof can they give of their preposterous tales they only go into the air service because they haven't the pluck to serve in the infantry that was prejudice the german losses were proof enough of our men's fighting skill and strength and german prisoners and german letters confirmed all their claims but we were dishonest in our reckoning from first to last, and the British public was hoodwinked about our losses. Quotes, three of our machines are missing. Quotes, six of our machines are missing. Yes, but what about the machines which crashed in no man's land and beyond our lines? They were not missing, but destroyed, and the boys who had flown in them were dead or broken. To the end of the war, those aviators of ours searched the air for their adventures fought often against overwhelming numbers, killed the German champions in single combat or in tourneys in the sky, and let down tons of high explosives which caused great death and widespread destruction. And in this work they died like flies, and one boy's life, one of those laughing, fatalistic, intensely living boys, was of no more account in the general sum of slaughter than a summer midge, except as one little unit in the armies of the air. Chapter 13 I am not strong enough in the science of psychology to understand the origin of laughter and to get into touch with the mainsprings of gaiety. The sharp contrast between normal ethics and an abnormality of action provides a grotesque point of view arousing ironical mirth. It is probable, also, that surroundings of enormous tragedy stimulate the sense of humor of the individual so that any small, ridiculous thing assumes the proportion of monstrous absurdity. It is also likely, certain, I think, that laughter is an escape from terror, a liberation of the soul by mental explosion, from the prison walls of despair and brooding. In the Decameron of Boccaccio, a group of men and women encompassed by plague retired into seclusion to tell one another mirthful immoralities which stirred their laughter. They laughed while the plague destroyed society around them, when they knew that its foul germs were on the prowl for their own bodies. So it was in this war, where in many strange places and in many dreadful days there was great laughter. I think sometimes of a night I spent with the medical officers of a tent hospital in the fields of the Somme during those battles. With me as a guest went a modern Falstaff, a ton of flesh, who sweats to death and lards the lean earth as he walks along. He was a man of anecdotes, drawn from the sinks and stews of life, yet with a sense of beauty lurking under his coarseness 
and a voice of fine, sonorous tone, which he managed with art and a melting grace. On the way to the field hospital, he had taken more than one nip of whiskey. His voice was well oiled when he sang a greeting to a medical major in a florid burst of melody from Italian opera. The major was a little Irish medico who had been through the South African War and in tropical places where he had drunk firewater to kill all manner of microbes. He suffered abominably from asthma and had had a heart seizure the day before our dinner at his mess and told us that he would drop down dead as sure as fate between one operation and another on the poor bloody wounded who never ceased to flow into his tent. But he was in a laughing mood and thirsty for a laugh-making liquid. He had two whiskies before the dinner began to wet his whistle. His fellow officers were out for an evening's joy, but nervous of the colonel, an austere soul who sat at the head of the mess with the look of a man afraid that merriment might reach outrageous heights beyond his control. A courteous man he was, and rather sad. His presence for a time acted as a restraint upon the company, until all restraint was broken by the Falstaff with me, who told soul-crashing stories to the little Irish major across the table, and sang love lyrics to the orderly who brought round the cottage pie and pickles. There was a tall, thin young surgeon who had been carving up living bodies all day and many days, and now listened to that fat rogue with an intensity of delight that lit up his melancholy eyes, watching him gravely between gusts of deep laughter, which seemed to come from his boots. There was another young surgeon, once of Bart's, who made himself the cup-server of the fat knight, and kept his wine at the brim, and encouraged him to fresh audacities of anecdotary, with a humorous glance at the colonel's troubled face. The colonel was forgotten after dinner. The little Irish major took the lid off the boiling pot of mirth. He was entirely mad, as he assured us, between dances of a wild and primitive type, stories of adventure in far lands, and spasms of asthmatic coughing, when he beat his breast and said, A pox in my bleeding heart! Falstaff was playing Juliet to the Romeo of the tall young surgeon, singing falsetto like a fat German angel dressed in a loose-fitting khaki, with his belt undone. There were charades in the tent. The boy from Bart's did remarkable imitations of a gamecock challenging a rival bird, of a cow coming through a gate, of a general addressing his troops, most comical of all. Several glasses were broken. The corkscrew was disregarded as a useless implement, and whiskey bottles were decapitated against the tent poles. I remember vaguely the crowning episode of the evening, when the little major was dancing the Irish jig with a kitchen chair when Falstaff was singing the prologue of Pagliacci to the stupefied colonel, when the boy, once of Bart's, was roaring like a lion under the mess table, and when the tall, melancholy surgeon was at the top of the tent pole, scratching himself like a gorilla in his native haunts. Outside, the field hospital was quiet, under a fleecy sky with a crescent moon. Through the painted canvas of the tent city candlelight glowed, with a faint rose-colored light, and the Red Cross hung limp above the camp where many wounded lay, waking or sleeping, tossing in agony, dying in unconsciousness. Far away over the fields, rockets were rising above the battle lines. The sky was flickering with the flush of gunfire. The red glare rose and spread below the clouds where some ammunition dump had been exploded. Old Falstaff fell asleep in the car on the way back to our quarters, and I smiled at the memory of great laughter in the midst of tragedy. End of section 17section 18 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6, Chapters 14 to 20. Chapter 14 The struggle of men from one low ridge to another low ridge, in a territory forty miles wide, by more than twenty miles deep, during five months of fighting, was enormous in its intensity and prolongation of slaughter, 
wounding, and endurance of all hardships and terrors of war. As an eyewitness, I saw the full scope of the bloody drama. I saw day by day the tidal waves of wounded limping back until 250,000 men had passed through our casualty clearing stations, and then were not finished. I went among these men, when the blood was wet on them, and talked with hundreds of them, and heard their individual narratives of escapes from death until my imagination was saturated with the spirit of their conflict of body and soul. I saw a green, downy countryside, beautiful in its summer life, ravaged by gunfire, so that the white chalk of its subsoil was flung above the earth and grass, in a wide, sterile stretch of desolation, pitted with shell craters, ditched by deep trenches, whose walls were hideously upheaved by explosive fire, and littered yard after yard, mile after mile, with broken wire, rifles, bombs, unexploded shells, rags of uniform, dead bodies, or bits of bodies, and all the filth of battle. I saw many villages flung into ruin or blown clean off the map. I walked into such villages as Contal Maison, Martin Puich, Le Sars, Tiuli, and at last Balpom, when a smell of burning and the fumes of explosives and the stench of dead flesh rose up to one's nostrils and one's very soul, when our dead and German dead lay about, and newly wounded came walking through the ruins, or were carried shoulder-high on stretchers, and consciously and subconsciously the living, unwounded men who went through these places knew that death lurked about them, and around them, and above them, and at any second might make its pounce upon their own flesh. I saw our men going into battle with strong battalions, and coming out of it with weak battalions. I saw them in the midst of the Battle of Thiepval, at Cantemaison, at Guillemont, at Lopart Wood, when they trudged toward lines of German trenches, bunching a little in groups, dodging shell bursts, falling in single figures or in batches, and fighting over the enemy's parapets. I sat with them in their dugouts before battle and after battle, saw their bodies gathered up for burial, heard their snuffle of death in hospital, sat by their bedside when they were sorely wounded. So the full tragic drama of that long conflict on the Somme was burned into my brain, and I was, as it were, a part of it, and I am still seared with this remembrance, and shall always be. But however deep the knowledge of tragedy, a man would be a liar if he refused to admit the heroism, the gallantry of youth, even the gaiety of men in these infernal months. Psychology on the Somme was not simple and straightforward. Men were afraid, but fear was not their dominating emotion, except in the worst hours. Men hated this fighting, but found excitement in it, often exultation sometimes an intense stimulus of all their senses and passions before reaction and exhaustion. Men became gibbering idiots with shell shock, as I saw some of them, but others rejoiced when they saw our shells plowing into the enemy's earthworks, laughed at their own narrow escapes and at grotesque comicalities of this monstrous deviltry. The officers were proud of their men, eager for their honor and achievement. The men themselves were in rivalry with other bodies of troops, and proud of their own prowess. They were scornful of all that the enemy might do to them, yet acknowledged his courage and power. They were quick to kill him, yet quick also to give him a chance of life by surrender, and after that were, nine times out of ten, chivalrous and kindly, but incredibly brutal on the rare occasions when passion overcame them at some tale of treachery. They had the pride of the skilled labor in his own craft, as machine-gunners, bombers, raiders, trench-mortar men, and were keen to show their skill, whatever the risks. They were healthy animals, with animal courage as well as animal fear, and they had, some of them, a spiritual and moral fervor which bade them risk death to save a comrade, or to save a position, or to kill the fear that tried to fetter them, or to lead men with greater fear than theirs. They lived from hour to hour, and forgot the peril or the misery that had passed, and did not forestall the future by apprehension unless they were of sensitive mind, with the worst quality men might have in modern warfare, 
imagination. They trained themselves to an intense egotism within narrow boundaries. Fifty yards to the left, or five hundred, men were being pounded to death by shell fire. Fifty yards to the right, or five hundred, men were being mowed down by machine gun fire. For the time being, their particular patch was quiet. It was their luck. Why worry about the other fellow? The length of a traverse in a ditch called a trench might make all the difference between heaven and hell. Dead bodies were being piled up on one side of the traverse. A shell had smashed into the platoon next door. There was a nasty mess. Men sat under their own mud bank and scooped out a tin of bully beef and hoped nothing would scoop them out of their bit of earth. This protective egotism seemed to me the instinctive soul armor of men in dangerous places when I saw them in the line. In a little way, not as a soldier, but as a correspondent, taking only a thousandth part of the risks of the fighting men, I found myself using this self-complacency. They were strafing on the left. Shells were pitching on the right. Very nasty for the men in either of those places, poor devils. But meanwhile, I was on a safe patch, it seemed. Thank heaven for that. Here, said an elderly officer, one of those rare exalted souls who thought that death was a little thing to give for one's country's sake. Here we may be killed at any moment. He spoke the words in Contal Maison, with a glow in his voice, as though announcing glad tidings to a friend who was a war artist, camouflaged as a lieutenant, and new to the scene of battle. But, said the soldier artist, adjusting his steel hat nervously, I don't want to be killed. I hate the idea of it. He was the normal man. The elderly officer was abnormal. The normal man, soldier without camouflage, had no use for death at all, unless it was in connection with the fellow on the opposite side of the way. He hated the notion of it applied to himself. He fought ferociously, desperately, heroically to escape it. Yet there were times, many times, when he paid not the slightest attention to the near neighborhood of that grisly specter, because in immediate temporary tranquillity he thrust the thought from his mind and smoked a cigarette and exchanged a joke with the fellow at his elbow. There were other times when, in a state of mental exaltation or spiritual self-sacrifice or physical excitement, he acted regardless of all risks and did mad, marvelous, almost miraculous things, hardly conscious of his own acts, but impelled to do as he did by the passion within him, passion of love, passion of hate, passion of fear, or passion of pride. Those men, moved like that, were the leaders, the heroes. The groups followed them sometimes because of their intensity of purpose and the infection of their emotion, and the comfort that came from their real or apparent self-confidence in frightful situations. Those who got through were astonished at their own courage. Many of them became convinced, consciously or subconsciously, that they were immune from shells and bullets. They walked through harassing fire with a queer sense of carelessness. They had escaped so often that some of them had a kind of disdain of shell bursts, until, perhaps, one day something snapped in their nervous system, as often it did, and the bang of a door in a billet behind the lines, or a wreath of smoke from some domestic chimney, gave them a sudden shock of fear. Men differed wonderfully in their nerve resistance, and it was no question of difference in courage. In the mass, all our soldiers seemed equally brave. In the mass, they seemed astonishingly cheerful. In spite of all the abomination of that Somme fighting, our troops, before battle and after battle, a few days after, looked bright-eyed, free from haunting anxieties, and were easy in their way of laughter. It was optimism in the mass heroism in the mass. It was only when one spoke to the individual, some friend who bared his soul a second, or some soldier ant in the multitude, with whom one talked with truth, that one saw the hatred of a man for his job, the sense of doom upon him, the weakness that was in his strength, the bitterness of this grudge against a fate that forced him to go on in this way of life, the remembrance of a life more beautiful which he had abandoned, all mingled with those other qualities of pride and comradeship and that illogical sense of humor which made up the strange complexity 
of his psychology. Chapter 15 It was a colonel of the North Staffordshire's who revealed to me the astounding belief that he was immune from shell-fire, and I met other men afterward with the same conviction. He had just come out of desperate fighting in the neighborhood of Thiepval, where his battalion had suffered heavily, and at first he was rude and sullen in the hut. I gauged him as a hard northerner, without a shred of sentiment or a flicker of any imaginative light, a stern, ruthless man. He was bitter in his speech to me, because the North Straffords were never mentioned in my dispatches. He believed that this was due to some personal spite, not knowing the injustice of our military censorship under the orders of GHQ. "'Why the hell don't we get a word?' he asked. "'Haven't we done as well as anybody? Died as much?' I promised to do what I could, which was nothing, to put the matter right, and presently he softened, and later was amazingly candid in self-revelation. "'I've a mystical power,' he said. "'Nothing will ever hit me as long as I keep that power which comes from faith. It is a question of absolute belief in the domination of mind over matter. I go through any barrage unscathed because my will is strong enough to turn aside explosive shells and machine-gun bullets.' as matter they must obey my intelligence they are powerless to resist the mind of a man in touch with the universal spirit as i am he spoke quietly and soberly in a matter-of-fact way i decided that he was mad that was not surprising we were all mad in one way or another or at one time or another it was the unusual form of madness that astonished me i envied him his particular kink I wished I could cultivate it as an aid to courage. He claimed another peculiar form of knowledge. He knew before each action, he told me, what officers and men of his would be killed in battle. He looked at a man's eyes and knew, and he claimed that he never made a mistake. He was sorry to possess that second sight, and it worried him. There were many men who had a conviction that they would not be killed, although they did not state it in the terms expressed by the colonel of the North Staffordshire's. It is curious that in some cases I know they were not mistaken and are still alive. It was indeed a general belief that if a man funked being hit, he was sure to fall, that being the reverse side of the argument. I saw the serene cheerfulness of men in places of death at many times and in many places, and I remember one group of friends on the Somme who revealed that quality to a high degree. It was when our front line ran just outside of the village of Montempuich to Courchelette, on the other side of the Beaupont Road, and when the 8th to 10th Gordons were there, after their fight through Longeval and over the ridge. It was the little crowd I had mentioned before in the Battle of Luz, and it was Lieutenant John Wood who took me to the battalion headquarters, located under some sandbags in a German dugout. All the way up to Contalmaison and beyond, there were signs of recent bloodshed and of present peril. Dead horses lay about, disemboweled by shell-fire. Legs and arms protruded from shell-craters where bodies lay half-buried. Heavy crumps came howling through the sky and bursting with enormous noise here and there, and everywhere over that vast, desolate battlefield, with its clumps of ruin and rows of dead trees. It was the devil's hunting-ground, and I hated every yard of it. But John Wood, who lived in it, was astonishingly cheerful, and a fine, sturdy, gallant figure in his kilted dress, as he climbed over sandbags, walked on the top of communication trenches, not bothering to take cover, and skirting round hedges of barbed wire, apparently unconscious of the crumps that were bursting around. I found laughter and friendly greeting in a hole in the earth, where the battalion staff was crowded. The colonel was courteous, but busy. He rather deprecated the notion that I should go up farther to the ultimate limit of our line. It was no use putting one's head into trouble without reasonable purpose, and the German guns had been blowing in sections of his new-made trenches. But John Wood was insistent that I should meet old Tom, afterward in command of the battalion. He had been buried and dug out again. He would like to see me. So we left the cover of the dugout and took to the open again. Long lines of jocks were digging a support trench, digging with a kind of rhythmic movement as they threw up the earth with their shovels. Behind them was another line of jocks, not working. They lay as though asleep out in the open. 
They were the dead of the last advance. Captain Tom was leaning up against the wall of the front-line trench, smoking a cigarette with a steel hat on the back of his head, a handsome, laughing figure. He did not look like a man who had just been buried and dug out again. It was a narrow shave, he said. A beastly shell covered me with a ton of earth. Have a cigarette, won't you? We gossiped as though in St. James Street. Other young Scottish officers came up and shook hands and said, Jolly weather, isn't it? What do you think of our little show? Not one of them gave a glance at the line of dead men over there, behind their prados. They told me some of the funny things that had happened lately in the battalion, some grim jokes by tough jocks. They had a fine crowd of men. You couldn't beat them. Well, good morning. Must get on with the job. There was no anguish there, no sense of despair, no sullen hatred of this life, so near to death. They seemed to like it. They did not really like it. They only made the best of it, without gloom. I saw they did not like this job of battle one evening in their mess behind the line. The colonel, who commanded them at the time, Celt of the Celts, was in a queer mood. He was a queer man, aloof in his manner, a little fay. He was annoyed with three of his officers who had come back late from their three days Paris leave. They were giants, but stood like schoolboys before their master while he spoke ironical, bitter words. Later in the evening he mentioned casually that they must prepare to go into the line again under special orders. What about the store bombs, small arms ammunition, machine guns? The officers were stricken into silence. They stared at one another as though to say, What does the old man mean? Is this true? One of them became rather pale, and there was a look of tragic resignation in his eyes. Another said, Hell, in a whisper. The adjutant answered the colonel's questions in a formal way, but thinking hard and studying the colonel's face anxiously. Do you mean to say we're going into the line again, sir, at once? The colonel laughed. Don't look so scared, all of you. It's only a field day for training. The officers of the Gordons breathed more freely. Poof! They had been fairly taken in by the old man's leg-pulling. No, it was clear that they did not find any real joy in the line. They would not choose a front-line trench as the most desirable place of residence. Chapter 16 In queer psychology there was a strange mingling of the pitiful and comic, among a division, the 35th, known as the Bantams. They were all volunteers, having been rejected by the ordinary recruiting officer, on account of their diminutive stature, which was on an average five feet high, descending to four feet six. Most of them came from Lancashire, Cheshire, Durham, and Glasgow, being the dwarf children of industrial England and its mid-Victorian cruelties. Others were from London, banded together in a battalion of the Middlesex Regiment. They gave a shock to our French friends when they arrived as a division at the port of Boulogne. Name of a dog, said the quayside loungers. England is truly in a bad way. She is sending out her last reserves. But they are soldiers of Lilliput, exclaimed others. It is terrible that they should send these little ones, said kind-hearted fishwives. Under the training of General Pye, who commanded them, they became smart and brisk in the ranks. They saluted like miniature guardsmen, marched with quick little steps like clockwork soldiers. It was comical to see them strutting up and down as sentries outside divisional headquarters with their bayonets high up above their wee bodies. In trench warfare they did well, though the fire step had to be raised to let them see over the top, and in one raid captured a German machine gun which I saw in their hands and hauled it back, a heavier weight than ours, like ants struggling with a stick of straw. In actual battle, they were hardly strong enough and could not carry all the burden of fighting kit, steel helmet, rifle, hand grenade, shovels, empty sandbags, with which other troops went into action. So they were used as support troops mostly behind the Black Watch and other battalions near Bazentin and Longeval. And there these poor little men dug and dug like beavers and crouched in the cover they made under a damnable fire until many of them were blown to bits. There was no glory in their job, only filth and blood. But they held the ground and suffered it all not gladly. They had a chance of taking prisoners at Langeval, 
where they rummaged in German dugouts after the line had been taken by the 15th Scottish Division and the 3rd, and they brought back a number of enormous Bavarians, who were like the, the Brobdingnagians, to these little men of Lilliput, and disgusted with that humiliation. I met the whole crowd of them after that adventure, as they sat, half-naked, picking the lice out of their shirts, and the conversation I had with them remains in my memory because of its grotesque humor and tragic comicality. They were excited and emotional, these stunted men. They cursed the war with the foulest curses of Scottish and Northern dialects. There was one fellow, the jester of them all, whose language would have made the poppies blush. With ironical laughter, outrageous blasphemy, grotesque imagery, he described the suffering of himself and his mates under barrage fire, which smashed many of them into bleeding pulp. He had no use for this war. He cursed the name of glory. He advocated a trade unionism among soldiers to down tools wherever there was a threat of war. He was a Bolshevist before Bolshevism. He had no liking for Germans, and desired to cut them into small bits, to slit their throats, to disembowel them. He looked homeward to a Yorkshire town, and wondered what his missus would say if she saw him scratching himself like an ape, or lying with his head in the earth with shells bursting around him, or prodding Germans with a bayonet. Oh, said the five-foot hero, there will be a lot of murder after this bloody war. What's a human life? What's the value of one man's throat? We're trained up as murderers. I don't dislike it, mind you, and after war we shan't get out of the habit of it. It'll come natural-like. He was talking for my benefit, egged on to further audacities by a group of comrades who roared with laughter and said, Go it, Bill! That's the stuff! Among these Lilliputians were fellows who sat aloof and sullen, or spoke of their adventure with its recent horror in their eyes. Some of them had big hands on small bodies, as though they suffered from water in the brain. Many of them were sent home afterward. General Haldane, as master of the Sixth Corps, paraded them and poked his stick at the more wizened ones, and obviously unfit the degenerates, and said at each prod, You can go. You, you. The Bantam Division ceased to exist. They afforded many jokes to the army. One anecdote went the round. A bantam died, of diseased, and he would, said General Haldane, and a comrade came to see his corpse. Shut the door when you come out, said the old woman of his billet. Fermez la porte, mon vieux. The living bantam went to see the dead one, and came downstairs, much moved by grief. I've seen poor Bill, he said. As tu fermez la porte? said the woman anxiously. The bantam wondered at the anxious inquiry, asked the reason for it. C'est a cause du chat, said the old woman. The cat, monsieur. He have had your friend in the passage three times already today. Toi, foi. Poor little men, born of diseased civilization, they were volunteers to a man, and some of them with as much courage as soldiers twice their size. They were the bantams who told me of the Anglican padre of Longeval. It was Father Hall of Muirfield, attached to the South African Brigade. He came out to a dressing station established in the one bit of ruin which could be used for shelter, and devoted himself to the wounded with a spiritual fervor. They were suffering horribly from thirst, which made their tongues swell and set their throats on fire. Water, they cried, water, for Christ's sake, water! There was no water, except at a well in Langeval, under the fire of German snipers, who picked off our men when they crawled down like wild dogs, with their tongues lolling out. There was one German officer there, in a shell-hole not far from the well, who sat with his revolver handy, and he was a dead shot. But he did not shoot the padre. Something in the face, the figure of that chaplain, his disregard of the bullets snapping about him, the upright, fearless way in which he crossed that way of death, held back the trigger-finger of the German officer, and he let him pass. He passed many times, untouched by the bullets or machine-gun fire, and he went into bad places pits of horror, carrying hot tea, which he made from the well-water for men in agony. Chapter 17 During these battles I saw thousands of German prisoners, and studied their types in physiognomy, and, by permission of intelligence officers, spoke with many of them in their barbed-wire cages, or on the field of battle when they came along under escort. 
Some of them looked degraded, bestial men. One could imagine them guilty of the foulest atrocities. But in the mass they seemed to me decent, simple men, remarkably like our own lads, from Saxon countries of England, though not quite so bright and brisk as was only natural in their position as prisoners, with all the misery of war in their souls. Afterward they worked with patient industry in the prison camps, and established their own discipline, and gave very little trouble if well handled. In each crowd of them there were fellows who spoke perfect English, having lived in England as waiters and hairdressers or clerks or mechanics. It was with them I spoke most because it was easiest, but I know enough German to talk with the others, and I found among them all the same loathing of war, the same bewilderment as to its causes, the same sense of being driven by evil powers above them. The officers were different. They lost a good deal of their arrogance, but to the last had excuses ready for all that Germany had done, and almost to the last professed to believe that Germany would win. Their sense of caste was in their nature. They refused to travel in the same carriages with their men, to stay even for an hour in the same enclosures with them. They regarded them, for the most part, as inferior beings, and there were castes even among the officers. I remember that in the last phase, when we captured a number of cavalry officers, these elegant sky-blue fellows held aloof from the infantry officers, and would not mix with them. One of them paced up and down all night alone, and all next day, stiff in the corsets below that sky-blue uniform, not speaking to a soul, though within a few yards of him were many officers of infantry regiments. Our men treated their prisoners nearly always, after the blood of battle was out of their eyes, with a good-natured kindness that astonished the Germans themselves. I have seen them filling German water bottles at considerable trouble, and the escorts, two or three to a big batch of men, were utterly trustful of them. "'Here, hold my rifle, Fritz,' said one of our men, getting down from the truck train to greet a friend. An officer standing by took notice of this. "'Take your rifle back at once. Is that a way to guard your prisoners?' Our man was astonished. "'Lord bless you, sir. They don't want no guarding. They're glad to be took. They guard themselves.' "'Your men are extraordinary,' a German officer told me. They asked me whether I would care to go down at once or wait until the barrage had passed.' He seemed amazed at that thoughtfulness for his comfort. It was in the early days of the Somme fighting, and crowds of our men stood on the banks above a sunken road, watching the prisoners coming down. This officer, who spoke to me, had an iron cross, and the men wanted to see it and handle it. "'Will they give it back again?' he asked, nervously, fumbling at the ribbon. "'Certainly,' I assured him. He handed it to me, and I gave it to the men, who passed it from one to the other and then back to the owner. "'Your men are extraordinary,' he said. "'They are wonderful.' One of the most interesting prisoners I met on the field of battle was a tall, black-bearded man whom I saw walking away from La Boiselle when that place was smoking with shell bursts. An English soldier was on each side of him, and each man carried a handbag while this black-bearded giant chatted with him. It was a strange group, and I edged nearer to them and spoke to one of the men. "'Who's this? Why do you carry his bags?' "'Oh, we're giving him special privileges,' said the man. "'He stayed behind to look after our wounded. "'Said his job was to look after wounded wherever they were. "'So there he's been, in a dugout, bandaging our lads. "'And no joke, either. "'It's hell up there. "'We're glad to get out of it.' "'I spoke to the German doctor and walked with him. "'He discussed the philosophy of the war, "'simply and with what seemed like sincerity. "'This war,' he said, with a sad, ironical laugh, we go on killing one another to no purpose. Europe is being bled to death and will be impoverished for long years. We Germans thought it was a war for Kultur, our civilization. Now we know it is a war against Kultur, against religion, against all civilization. How will it end? I asked. I see no end to it, he answered. It is the suicide of nations. Germany is strong, and England is strong, and France is strong. It is impossible for one side to crush the other. So when is the end to come? I met many other prisoners then, and a year afterward, who could see no end to the massacre. They believed the war would go on until living humanity on all sides revolted from the unceasing sacrifice. 
in the autumn of nineteen eighteen when at last the end came in sight by german defeat unexpected a few months before even by the greatest optimist in the british armies the german soldiers were glad they did not care how the war ended so long as it ended defeat what did that matter was it worse to be defeated than for the race to perish by bleeding to death chapter eighteen the struggle for Posio Ridge and Highwood lasted from the beginning of August until the middle of September, six weeks of fighting as desperate as any in the history of the world until that time. The Australians dealt with Posio itself, working round Mouke Farm, where the Germans refused to be routed from their tunnels, and up to the windmill on the high ground of Posier, for which there was unceasing slaughter on both sides because the Germans counterattacked again and again and waves of men surged up and fell around that mound of forsaken brick which i saw as a reddish cone through flame and smoke those australians whom i had seen arrive in france had proved their quality they had come believing that nothing could be worse than their ordeal in the dardanelles now they knew that posier was the last word in frightfulness the intensity of the shell fire under which they lay shook them if it did not kill them. Many of their wounded told me that it had broken their nerve. They would never fight again without a sense of horror. Our men are more highly strung than the English, said one Australian officer, and I was astonished to hear these words, because those Australians seemed to me without nerves, as though tough as gristle in their fiber. They fought stubbornly, grimly, in ground so ravaged with fire that the earth was finely powdered. They stormed the Posier Ridge, yard by yard, and held its crest under sweeping barrages, which tore up their trenches as soon as they were dug, and buried and mangled their living flesh. In six weeks they suffered twenty thousand casualties, and Posier now is an Australian graveyard, and the memorial which stands there is to the ghosts of that splendid youth which fell in heaps about that plateau and the slopes below. Many English boys of the Sussex, West Kent's, Surrey, and Warwick regiments in the 18th Division died at their side, not less patient in sacrifice, not liking it better. Many Scots of the 15th and 9th Divisions, many New Zealanders, many London men of the 47th and 56th Divisions fell, killed or wounded, to the right of them on the way to Martinpuich and aucourt la barbe and Fleur from Highwood and Langeval and Bazentine. The 3rd Division of Yorkshires and Northumberland Fusiliers, Royal Scots and Gordons, were earning that name of the Iron Division, and not by any easy heroism. Every division in the British Army took its turn in the bloodbath of the Somme, and was duly blooded, at the cost of 25%, and sometimes 50%, of their fighting strength. The Canadians took up the struggle at Cochelet and captured it in a fierce and bloody battle. The Australians worked up on the right of the Albert Bopom road to Tilly and Livigny and Tilly. On the far left, the fortress of Thiepval had fallen at last after repeated and frightful assaults, which I watched from ditches close enough to see our infantry, Wiltshire's and Worcester's of the 25th Division, struggle trudging through infernal fire. And then, at last, after five months of superhuman effort, enormous sacrifice, mass heroism, desperate willpower, and the tenacity of each individual human ant in this wild ant heap, the German lines were smashed. The Australians surged into Bopalm, and the enemy, stricken by the prolonged fury of our attack, fell back in a far and wide retreat across a country which we laid waste to the shelter of his Hindenburg line, from Bulcourt to St. Quentin. Chapter 19 The goal of our desire seemed attained when at last we reached Beaupont, after these terrific battles in which all our divisions, numbering nearly a million men, took part, with not much difference in courage, not much difference in average of loss. By the end of that year's fighting, our casualties had mounted up to the frightful total of 400,000 men. Those fields were strewn with our dead. Our graveyards were growing forests of little white crosses. The German dead lay in heaps. 
there were twelve hundred corpses littered over the earth below Lupart Wood, in one mass, and eight hundred of them were German. I could not walk without treading on them there. When I fell in the slime, I clutched arms and legs. The stench of death was strong and awful. But our men, who had escaped death and shell shock, kept their sanity through all this wilderness of slaughter, kept, oh marvelous, their spirit of humor, their faith in some kind of victory. I was with the Australians on that day when they swarmed into Beaupont, and they brought out trophies like men at a county fair. I remember an Australian colonel who came riding with a German beer mug at his saddle. Next day, though shells were still bursting in the ruins, some Australian boys set up some painted scenery which they had found among the rubbish, and chalked up the name of the Cooey Theatre. The enemy was in retreat to its Hindenburg line, over a wide stretch of country which he laid waste behind him, making a desert of French villages and orchards and parks, so that even the fruit trees were cut down, and the churches blown up, and the graves ransacked for their lead. It was the enemy's first retreat on the Western Front, and that ferocious fighting of the British troops had smashed the strongest defenses ever built in war, and our raw recruits had broken the most famous regiments of the German army. So in spite of all tragedy and all agony, our men were not downcast, but followed up their enemy with a sense of excitement, because it seemed so much like victory and the end of war. When the Germans retreated from Gomcourt, where so many boys of the 56th London Division had fallen on the 1st of July, I went through that evil place by way of Funkeville, which we called Funky Villas, and stumbling over the shell craters and broken trenches and dead bodies between the dead mass of slashed and branchless trees, came into the open country to our outpost line. I met there a friendly sergeant who surprised me by referring in a casual way to a little old book of mine. This place, he said, glancing at me, is a strange street of adventure. It reminded me of another reference to that tale of mine, when I was among a crowd of London lads who had just engaged in a bloody fight at a place called the Hairpin. A young officer sent for me, and I found him in the loft of a stinking barn, sitting in a tub as naked as he was born. "'I just wanted to ask you,' he said, "'whether Catherine married Frank.' The sergeant at Gomcourt was anxious to show me his own street of adventure. I belong to Toc Emma's, he said, meaning trench mortars, and my officers would be very pleased if you would have a look at their latest stunt. We've got a 9.2 mortar in pigeon wood, way beyond the infantry. It's never been done before, and we're going to blow old Fritz out of kite cops. I followed him into the blue, as it seemed to me, and we fell in with a young officer, also on his way to pigeon wood. He was in a merry mood, in spite of harassing fire round about, and the occasional howl of 5.9. He kept stopping to look at enormous holes in the ground, and laughing at something that seemed to tickle his sense of humor. "'See that?' he said. "'That's old Charlie Londa's work.' At another pit in upheaved earth, he said, "'That's Charlie Londa's again. Old Charlie. Gave him hell. He's a topping chap. You must meet him. My God, look at that!' He roared with laughter again, on the edge of an unusually large crater. "'Who is Charlie?' I asked. "'Where can I find him?' "'Oh, we shall meet him in Pigeon Wood. He's as pleased as Punch at having got beyond the infantry. First time it has ever been done. Took a bit of doing, too, with the largest size of Talk Emma. We entered Pigeon Wood, after a long walk over wild chaos, and guided by the officer and sergeant, I dived down into a deep dugout, just captured from the Germans, who were two hundred yards away, in kite cops. "'What cheer, Charlie!' shouted the young officer. "'Hello, fellow, my lad. Come in. We're getting gloriously binged on a rare find of German brandy. Topping, and I have brought a visitor. Captain Charles Londes, dear old Charlie, received us most politely in one of the best dugouts I ever saw, with smoothly paneled walls fitted up with shelves, and good deal furniture made to match. "'This is a very nice little home in hell,' said Charles. "'At any moment, of course, we may be blown to bits, but meanwhile it is very comfy down here, and what makes everything good is a bottle of rare old brandy and an unlimited supply of German soda-water. 
also to add to the gaiety of indecent minds there is a complete outfit of ladies clothing in a neighboring dugout funny fellows those german officers take a pew won't you and have a drink orderly he shouted for his man and ordered a further supply of german soda water we drank to the confusion of the enemy in his own brandy and soda water out of his own mugs sitting on his own chairs at his own table and dear old charlie who was a little etois as afterward i became with a sense of deep satisfaction the noise of shells seemingly remote discoursed on war which he hated german psychology trench mortar barrages they had simply blown the boche out of gomcourt and his particular fancy stunt of stealing a march on the infantry who said captain londes are laps behind other officers crowded into the dugout one of them said you must come round to mine it's a blasted palace and i went round later and he told me on the way that he had escaped so often from shell bursts that he thought the average of luck was up and he was bound to get done in before long charlie londes dispensed drinks with noble generosity there was much laughter among us and afterward we went upstairs to the edge of the wood to which a heavy wet mist was clinging and saw the trench mortar section play the devil with kite cops over the way late in the afternoon i took my leave of a merry company in that far-flung outpost of our line and wished them luck a few shells crashed through the wood as i left but i was disdainful of them after that admirable brandy it was a long walk back to funky villas not without the interest of arithmetical calculations about the odds of luck in harassing fire but a thousand yards or so from pigeon wood i looked back and saw that the enemy had begun to take notice heavy shells were smashing through the trees there ferociously i hoped my friends were safe in their dugouts again and i thought of the laughter and gallant spirit of the young men after five months of the greatest battles in the history of the world it seemed to me wonderful chapter twenty i have described what happened on our side of the lines our fearful losses the stream of wounded that came back day by day the butchers shops the agony in men's souls the shell-shock cases the welter and bewilderment of battle the shelling of our own troops the lack of communication between fighting units and the command the filth and stench of the hideous shambles which were our battlefields but to complete the picture of that human conflict in the somme i must now tell what happened to the german side of the lines as i was able to piece that tale together from german prisoners with whom i talked german letters which i found in their abandoned dugouts and documents which fell into the hands of our staff officers our men were at least inspirited by the knowledge that they were beating their enemy back in spite of their own bloody losses the germans had not even that source of comfort for whatever it might be worth under barrage fire the mistakes of our generalship the inefficiency of our staff work were not greater than the blunderings of the german high command and their problem was more difficult than ours because of the weakness of their reserves owing to enormous preoccupation on the russian front the agony of their men was greater than ours to understand the german situation it must be remembered that from january to may nineteen sixteen the german command on the western front was concentrating all its energy and available strength in manpower and gunpower upon the attack of verdun the crown prince had staked his reputation upon that adventure which he believed would end in the capture of the strongest french fortresses and the destruction of the french armies he demanded men and more men until every unit that could be spared from other fronts of the line had been thrown into that furnace divisions were called in from other theaters of war and increased the strength on the western front to the total of about one hundred and thirty divisions but the months passed and verdun still held out above piles of german corpses on its slopes and in june germany looked east and saw a great menace the russian offensive was becoming violent german generals on the russian fronts sent desperate messages for help send us more men they said and from the western front four divisions containing thirty-nine battalions were sent to them they must have been sent grudgingly for now another menace threatened the enemy and it was ours the british armies were getting ready to strike 
in spite of verdun france still had men enough withdrawn from that part of the line in which they had been relieved by the british to cooperate in a new attack it was our offensive that the german command feared most for they had no exact knowledge of our strength or of the quality of our new troops they knew that our army had grown prodigiously since the assault on luce nearly a year before they had heard of canadian reinforcements and the coming of the australians and the steady increase of recruiting in england and month by month they had heard the louder roar of our guns along the line and had seen our destructive effect spreading and becoming more terrible they knew of the steady quiet concentration of batteries and divisions on the west and south of the ancre the german command expected a heavy blow and prepared for it but as yet had no knowledge of the driving force behind it what confidence they had of being able to resist the british attack was based upon the wonderful strength of lines which they had been digging and fortifying since the autumn of the first year of war impregnable positions they called them the inexperience of our troops their own immense quantity of machine guns the courage and skill of their gunners and their profound belief in the superiority of german generalship in order to prevent espionage during the coming struggle and to conceal the movement of troops and guns they ordered the civil populations to be removed from villages close behind their positions drew cordons of military police across the country picketed crossroads and established a network of counter-espionage to prevent any leakage of information to inspire the german troops with a spirit of martial fervor not easily aroused to fever pitch after the bloody losses before verdun orders of the day were issued to the battalions counseling them to hold fast against the hated english who stood foremost in the way of peace that was the gist of a manifesto by prince ruprecht of bavaria which i found in a dugout at montauban and promising them a speedy ending to the war great stores of material and munitions were concentrated at railheads and dumps ready to be sent up to the firing lines and the perfection of german organization may well have seemed flawless before the attack began when they began they found that in heavies and in expenditure of high explosives they were outclassed they were startled too by the skill and accuracy of the british gunners whom they had scorned as amateurs and by the daring of our airmen who flew over their lines with the utmost audacity spotting for the guns and registering on batteries and communication trenches crossroads railheads and every vital point of organization in the german war machine working opposite the british lines north and south of the ancre even before the british infantry had left their trenches at dawn on july first german officers behind the firing lines saw with anxiety that all the organization which had worked so smoothly in times of ordinary trench warfare was now working only in a hazardous way under a deadly storm of shells food and supplies of all kinds could not be sent up to front-line trenches without many casualties and sometimes could not be sent up at all telephone wires were cut and communications broken between the front and headquarters staffs staff officers sent up to report were killed on the way to the lines troops moving forward from reserve areas came under heavy fire and lost many men before arriving in the support trenches prince ruprecht of bavaria sitting aloof from all this in personal safety must have known before july first that his resources in men and material would be strained to the uttermost by the british attack but he could take a broader view than the men closer to the scene of battle and taking into account the courage of his troops he had no need to doubt that the immense strength of their positions dug and tunneled beyond the power of high explosives the number of his machine guns the concentration of his artillery and the rawness of the british troops he could count up the possible cost and believe that in spite of a heavy price to pay there would be no break in his lines at seven thirty a m on july first the british infantry as i have told left their trenches and attacked on the right angle down from gomcourt beaumont hamel thiepval Uvier, and la boiselle and eastward from fricourt below mametz and montauban for a week the german troops barbarians and prussians had been crouching in their dugouts listening to the ceaseless crashing of the british drum fire in places like beaumont hamel and men down in the deep tunnels 
some of them large enough to hold a battalion and a half, were safe as long as they stayed there. But to get in or out was death. Trenches disappeared into a sea of shell craters, and men holding them, for some men had to stay on duty there, were blown to fragments. Many of the shallower dugouts were smashed in by heavy shells, and officers and men lay dead there as I saw them lying on the first days of July, in Fricourt and Memetz and Montauban. The living men kept their courage, but below ground, under that tumult of bursting shells, and wrote pitiful letters to their people at home, describing the horror of those hours. We are quite shut off from the rest of the world, wrote one of them. Nothing comes to us, no letters. The English keep such a barrage on our approaches, it is terrible. Tomorrow evening it will be seven days since this bombardment began. We cannot hold out much longer. Everything is shot to pieces. Thirst was one of their tortures. In many of the tunneled shelters there was enough food, but the water could not be sent up. The German soldiers were maddened by thirst. When rain fell, many of them crawled out and drank filthy water mixed with yellow shell sulfur, and they were killed by high explosives. Other men crept out, careless of death, but compelled to drink. They crouched over the bodies of the men who lay above, or in the shell holes, and lapped up the puddles, and then crawled down again, if they were not hit. When our infantry attacked at Gomcourt and Beaumont Hamel and Thiepval, they were received by waves of machine-gun bullets fired by men who, in spite of the ordeal of our seven days' bombardment, came out into the now open at the moment of attack which they knew through their periscopes was coming. They brought their guns above the shell craters and their destroyed trenches under our barrage and served them. They ran forward even into no man's land and planted their machine guns there and swept down our men as they charged. Over their heads the French gunners flung a frightful barrage, plowing gaps in the ranks of our men. On the left, by Gumquot and Beaumont Hamel, the British attack failed, as I have told, but southward the impregnable lines were smashed by a tide of British soldiers, as sand castles are overwhelmed by the waves. Our men swept up to Fricourt, struck straight up to Montauban on the right, captured it, and flung a loop around Mamet's village. For the German generals, receiving their reports with great difficulty because runners were killed and telephones broken, the question was, how will these British troops fight in the open after their first assault? How will our men stand between the first line and the second? As far as the German troops were concerned, there were no signs of cowardice or low morale, as we called it more kindly, in those early days of the struggle. They fought with desperate courage, holding on to positions in rearguard actions when our guns were slashing them, and when our men were getting near to them, making us pay a heavy price for every little copse or gully or section of trench, and above all serving their machine guns at La Boiselle, Ovier, above Fricourt, round Contal Maison, and at all points of their gradual retreat, with a wonderful obstinacy, until they were killed or captured but fresh waves of British soldiers followed those who were checked or broken. After the first week of battle, the German general staff had learned the truth about the qualities of those British new armies which had been mocked and caricatured in German comic papers. They learned that these amateur soldiers had the qualities of the finest troops in the world, not only extreme valor, but skill and cunning, not only a great power of endurance under the heaviest fire, but a spirit of attack which was terrible in its effect. They were fierce bayonet fighters. Once having gained a bit of earth or a ruined village, nothing would budge them unless they could be blasted out by gunfire. General Siegst von Anim put down some candid notes in his report to Prince Ruprecht. The English infantry shows great dash in attack, a factor to which immense confidence in its overwhelming artillery greatly contributes. It has shown great tenacity in defense. This was especially noticeable in the case of small parties which, when once established with machine guns in the corner of the wood or a group of houses, were very difficult to drive out. The German losses were piling up. The agony of the German troops under our shell fire was reaching unnatural limits of torture. The early prisoners I saw, Prussians and Bavarians of the 14th Reserve Corps, were nerve-broken, and told frightful stories of the way in which their regiments had been cut to pieces. The German generals had to fill up the gaps, 
to put new barriers of men against the waves of British infantry. They flung new troops into the line, called up hurriedly from reserve depots. Now, for the first time, their staff work showed signs of disorder and demoralization. When the Prussian Guards Reserve were brought up from Valenciennes to counterattack at Contalmaison, they were sent on to the battlefield without maps or local guides and walked straight into our barrage. A whole battalion was cut to pieces, and many others suffered frightful things. Some of the prisoners told me that they had lost three-quarters of their number in casualties, and our troops advanced over heaps of killed and wounded. The 122nd Bavarian Regiment and Cantalmaison was among those which suffered horribly. Owing to our ceaseless gunfire, they could get no food supplies and no water. The dugouts were crowded, so that they had to take turns to get into these shelters, and outside our shells were bursting over every yard of ground. Those who went outside, a prisoner told me, were killed or wounded. Some of them had their heads blown off, and some of them their arms. But we went on taking turns in the hole, although those who went outside knew that it was their turn to die, most likely. At last, most of those who came into the hole were wounded, some of them badly, so that they lay in blood. That is one little picture in a great panorama of bloodshed. The German command was not thinking much about the human suffering of its troops. It was thinking of the next defensive line upon which they would have to fall back if the pressure of the British offensive could be maintained, the longeval bazentine pozier line. It was getting nervous. Owing to the enormous efforts made in the Verdun offensive, the supplies of ammunition were not adequate to the enormous demand. The German gunners were trying to compete with the British in continuity of bombardments, and the shells were running short. Guns were wearing out under their incessant strain, and it was difficult to replace them. General von Galwitz received reports of an alarmingly large number of bursts in the Boer, particularly in field guns. General von Armin complained that reserve supplies of ammunition were only available in very small quantities. The German telephone system proved totally inadequate in consequence of the development which the fighting took. The German air service was surprisingly weak, and the British airmen had established temporary mastery. The numerical superiority of the enemy's airmen, noted General von Arnim, and the fact that their machines were better made, became disagreeably apparent to us, particularly in their direction of the enemy's artillery and bomb dropping. On July 15th, the British troops broke the German second line at Langeval and the Bazentines, and inflicted general losses upon the enemy, who fought with their usual courage until the British bayonets were among them. A day or two later, the fortress of Ovier fell, and remnants of the garrison, 150 strong, after a desperate and gallant resistance in ditches and tunnels, where they had fought to the last, surrendered with honor. Then began the long battle of the woods, Devil's Woods, High Wood, Trone Wood, continued through August with most fierce and bloody fighting, which ended in our favor and forced the enemy back, gradually but steadily, in spite of the terrific bombardments which filled those woods with shell fire and the constant counterattacks delivered by the Germans. Counterattack, came the order from the German staff, and battalions of men marched out, obediently to certain death, sometimes with incredible folly on the part of their commanding officers who ordered these attacks to be made without the slightest chance of success i saw an example of that at close range during a battle at falfamont farm near guillemont our men had advanced from wedgewood and i watched them from a trench just south of this to which i had gone at a great pace over shell craters and broken wire with a young observing officer who had been detailed to report back to the guns old Falstaff, whose songs and stories had filled the tent under the Red Cross with laughter, toiled after us gallantly, but grunting and sweating under the sun like his prototype, until we lost him in our hurry. Pleasantly a body of Germans came out of a copse called Luzewood on rising ground, faced round among the thin slashed trees of Follemont, and advanced toward our men shoulder to shoulder like a solid bar. It was sheer suicide. I saw our men get their machine guns into action, and the right side of the living bar frittered away, and then the whole line fell into the scorched grass. 
Another line followed. They were tall men and did not falter as they came forward, but it seemed to me they walked like men conscious of going to death. They died. The simile is outworn, but it was exactly as though some invisible scythe had mown them down. In all the letters written during those weeks of fighting, and captured by us from dead or living men, there was one cry of agony and horror. I stood on the brink of the most terrible days of my life, wrote one of them. They were those of the Battle of the Somme. It began with a night attack on August 13th and 14th. The attack lasted till the evening of the 18th, when the English wrote on our bodies in letters of blood, It's all over with you. A handful of half-mad, wretched creatures, worn out in body and mind, were all that was left of a whole battalion. We were that handful. The losses of many of the German battalions were staggering, yet not greater than our own, and by the middle of August the morale of the troops was severely shaken. The 117th Division by Pozier suffered very heavily. The 11th Reserve and 157th Regiments each lost nearly three-quarters of their effectives. The 9th Reserve Corps had also lost heavily. The 9th Reserve Jaeger Battalion lost about three-quarters, and the 84th Reserve and 86th Reserve over half. On August 10th, the 16th Division had six battalions in reserve. By August 19th, owing to the large number of casualties, the greater part of those reserves had been absorbed into the front and support trenches, leaving as available reserves two exhausted battalions. The weakness of the division and the absolute necessity of reinforcing it led to the 15th Reserve Infantry Regiment, 2nd Guards Division, being brought up to strengthen the right flank in the Leipzig salient. This regiment had suffered casualties to the extent of over 50% west of Pozier during the middle of July, and showed no eagerness to return to the fight. These are but a few examples of what was happening along the whole of the German front on the Somme. It became apparent by the end of August that the enemy was in trouble to find fresh troops to relieve his exhausted divisions, and that the wastage was faster than the arrival of new men. It was noticeable that he left divisions in the line until incapable of further effort rather than relieving them earlier so that after resting they might again be brought onto the battlefield. The only conclusion to be drawn from this was that the enemy had not sufficient formations available to make necessary reliefs. In July, three of these exhausted divisions were sent to the east, their place being taken by two new divisions and in August three more exhausted divisions were sent to Russia, eight new divisions coming to the Somme front. The British and French offensive was drawing in all the German reserves and draining them of their life's blood. We entrained at Savigny, wrote a man of one of these regiments, and at once knew our destination. It was our bloodbath, the Somme. In many letters this phrase was used, the Somme was called the Bath of Blood by the German troops who waded across its shell craters and in the ditches which were heaped with their dead. But what I have described is only the beginning of the battle, and the bath was to be filled deeper in the months that followed. End of section 18「Section 19 of Now It Can Be Told by Philip Gibbs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 6, Chapters 21 to 23. Chapter 21. The name, that bloodbath, and the news of battle could not be hidden from the people of Germany, who had already been chilled with horror by the losses at Verdun nor from the soldiers of reserve regiments quartered in the French and Belgian towns like Valenciennes, Saint-Quentin, Cambrai, Lille, Bruges, and as far back as Brussels, waiting to go to the front, nor from the civil population of those towns, held for two years by their enemy, these blond young men who lived in their houses, marched down their streets, and made love to their women. The news was brought down from the Somme front by Red Cross trains, arriving in endless succession, and packed with maimed and mangled men. 
German military police formed cordons around the railway stations, pushed back civilians who came to stare with somber eyes at these blanketed bundles of living flesh. But when the ambulance rumbled through the streets toward the hospitals, long processions of them, with the soles of men's boots turned up over the stretchers on which they lay quiet and stiff, the tale was told, though no word was spoken. The tale of defeat, of great losses, of grave and increasing anxiety, was told clearly enough, as I read in captured letters, by the faces of German officers who went about in these towns behind the lines with gloomy looks, and whose tempers, never of the sweetest, became irritable and unbearable, so that the soldiers hated them for all this cursing and bullying. A certain battalion commander had a nervous breakdown, because he had to meet his colonel in the morning. "'He is dying with fear and anxiety,' wrote one of his comrades. Other men, not battalion commanders, were even more afraid of their superior officers, upon whom this bad news from the Somme had an evil effect. The bad news was spread by divisions taken out of the line and sent back to rest. The men reported that their battalions had been cut to pieces. Some of their regiments had lost three-quarters of their strength. They described the frightful effect of the British artillery, the smashed trenches, the shell crater, the horror. It was not good for the morale of men who were just going up there to take their turn. The man who was afraid of his colonel sits all day long writing home with the picture of his wife and children before his eyes. He was afraid of other things. Bavarian soldiers quarreled with Prussians, accused them unjustly of shirking the Somme battlefields and leaving the Bavarians to go to the bloodbath. Quotes, All the Bavarian troops were being sent to the Somme. This much is certain. You can see no Prussians there. And this in spite of losses the 1st Bavarian Corps suffered recently at Verdun. And how we did suffer. It appears that we are in for another turn at least the 5th Bavarian Division. Everybody has been talking about it for a long time. To the devil with it. Every Bavarian regiment is being sent into it, and it's a swindle." End of quotes. It was in no cheerful mood that the men went away to the Somme battlefields. Those battalions of gray-clad men, entrained without any of the old enthusiasm with which they had gone to earlier battles, their gloom was noticed by the officers. "'Sing, you sheep's heads, sing!' they shouted. They were compelled to sing by order. "'In the afternoon,' wrote a man of the 18th Reserve Division, "'we had to go out again. We were to learn to sing. The greater part did not join in, and the song went feebly. Then we had to march round in a circle and sing, and that went no better. After that we had an hour off, and on the way back to billets we were to sing Deutschland über alles, but this broke down completely. One never hears songs of the fatherland any more. They were silent, grave-eyed men who marched through the streets of French and Belgian towns to be entrained for the Somme front, for they had forebodings of the fate before them. Yet none of their forebodings was equal in intensity of fear to the frightful reality into which they were flung. The journey to the Somme front on the German side was a way of terror ugliness and death, not all the imagination of morbid minds searching obscenely for foulness and blood in the great deep pits of human agony, could surpass these scenes along the way to the German lines, round Courchelette and Fleurs, Goudincourt, Morval, and Les Boeufs. Many times, long before the German battalions had arrived near the trenches, it was but a collection of nerve-broken men bemoaning losses already suffered far behind the lines and filled with hideous apprehension, for British long-range guns were hurling high explosives into distant villages, barraging crossroads, reaching out to railheads and ammunition dumps, while British airmen were on bombing flights over railway stations and rest billets and high roads down which the German troops came marching at Cambrai, Beaupomme, in the valley between Eulles and Wallencourt, at Lignetilly and Busigny, and many other places on the lines of route. German soldiers arriving one morning at Cambrai, by train, found themselves under the fire of a single airplane which flew very low and dropped bombs. 
they exploded with heavy crashes, and one bomb hit the first carriage behind the engine, killing and wounding several men. A second bomb hit the station buildings, and there was a clatter of broken glass and rending of wood and the fall of bricks. All lights went out, and the German soldiers groped about in the darkness amid the splinters of glass and the fallen bricks, searching for the wounded by the sound of their groans. It was but one scene along the way to that bloodbath through which they had to wade to the trenches of the Somme. Flights of British airplanes circled over the villages on the way. At Grevier, in August, 11, 112-16 bombs fell in the market square, so that the center of the village collapsed in a state of ruin, burying soldiers billeted there. Every day the British airmen paid these visits, meeting the Germans far up the roads on their way to the Somme, and swooping over them like a flying death. Even on the march in open country, the German soldiers, tramping silently along, not singing in spite of orders, were bombed and shot at by these British aviators, who flew down very low, pouring out streams of machine-gun bullets. The Germans lost their nerve at such times and scattered into the ditches, falling over one another, struck and cursed by their Unteroffizieren, and leaving their dead and wounded in the roadway. As the roads went nearer to the battlefields, they were choked with the traffic of war with artillery and transport wagons and horse ambulances, and always thousands of gray men marching up to the lines, or back from them, exhausted and broken after many days in the fires of hell up there. Officers sat on their horses by the roadside, directing all the traffic with the usual swearing and cursing, and rode alongside the transport wagons and the troops, urging them forward at a quicker pace because of stern orders received from headquarters demanding quicker movement. The reserves, it seemed, were desperately wanted up in the lines. The English were attacking again. God alone knew what was happening. Regiments had lost their way. Wounded were pouring back. Officers had gone mad. Into the midst of all this turmoil shells fell. Shells from long-range guns. Transport wagons were blown to bits. The bodies and fragments of artillery horses lay all over the roads. Men lay dead or bleeding under the debris of gun wheels and broken bricks. Above all the noise of this confusion and death in the night, the hard, stern voices of German officers rang out, and German discipline prevailed, and men marched on to greater perils. They were in the shell zone now, and sometimes a regiment on the march was tracked all along the way by British gunfire directed from airplanes and captive balloons. It was the fate of a captured officer I met who had detrained at Beaupalme for the trenches of Contalmaison. At Beaupalme his battalion was hit by fragments of twelve-inch shells. Nearer to the line they came under fire of eight-inch and six-inch shells. Four-point-sevens found them somewhere by Bazantin. At Contalmaison they marched into a barrage, and here the officer was taken prisoner. Of his battalion there were few men left. It was so with the 3rd Jaeger battalion, ordered up hurriedly to make a counter-attack near Fleur. They suffered so heavily on the way to the trenches that no attack could be made. The stretcher-bearers had all the work to do. The way up to the trenches became more tragic as every kilometer was passed, until the stench of corruption was wafted on the wind so that men were sickened and tried not to breathe and marched hurriedly to get on to the lee of its foulness they walked now through places which had once been villages but were sinister ruins where death lay in wait for german soldiers it seems queer to me wrote one of them that whole villages close to the front look as flattened as a child's toy under a steamroller not one stone remains on another the streets are one line of shell holes Add to that the thunder of the guns, and you will see with what feelings we came into the line, into trenches where for months shells of all caliber have rained. Fleurs is a scrap heap. Again and again men lost their way up to the lines. The reliefs could only be made at night lest they should be discovered by British airmen and British gunners, and even if these German soldiers had trench maps, the guidance was but little good when many trenches had been smashed in and only shell craters could be found. In the front line of Fleurs, wrote one of these Germans, 
the men were only occupying shell holes behind there was the intense smell of putrefaction which filled the trench almost unbearably the corpses lie either quite insufficiently covered with earth on the edge of the trench or quite close under the bottom of the trench so that the earth lets the stench through in some places bodies lie quite uncovered in a trench recess and no one seems to trouble about them one sees horrible pictures here an arm here a foot here a head sticking out of the earth and these are all german soldier heroes not far from us at the entrance to a dugout nine men were buried of whom three were dead all along the trench men kept on getting buried what had been a perfect trench a few hours before was in parts completely blown in the men were getting weaker it is impossible to hold out any longer losses can no longer be reckoned accurately without a doubt many of our people are killed that is only one out of thousands of such gruesome pictures true as the death they described true to the pictures on our side of the line as on their side which went back to german homes during the battles of the somme those german soldiers were great letter writers and men sitting in wet ditches in foxholes as they called their dugouts up to my waist in mud as one of them described scribbled pitiful things which they hoped might reach their people at home as a voice from the dead for they had little hope of escape from the bloodbath when you get this i shall be a corpse wrote one of them and one finds the same foreboding in many of these documents even the lucky ones who could get some cover from the incessant bombardment by english guns began to lose their nerves after a day or two they were always in fear of british infantry sweeping upon them suddenly behind the trommelfeuer rushing their dugouts with bombs and bayonets sentries became jumpy and signaled attacks when there were no attacks the gas alarm was sounded constantly by the clang of a bell in the trench and men put on their heavy gas masks and sat in them until they were nearly stifled here is a little picture of life in a german dugout near the british lines written by a man now dead the telephone bell rings are you there yes there's nose battalion good that's all then that ceases and now the wire is in again perhaps for the twenty-fifth or thirtieth time thus the night is interrupted and now they come alarm messages one after another each more terrifying than the other of enormous losses through the bombs and shells of the enemy of huge masses of troops advancing upon us of all possible possibilities such as a train broken down and we are tortured by all the terrors that the mind can invent our nerves quiver we clench our teeth none of us can forget the horrors of the night heavy rain fell and the dugouts became wet and filthy our sleeping places are full of water we had to try and bail out the trenches with cooking dishes i lay down in the water with g we were to have worked on dugouts but not a soul could do any more only a few sections got coffee mine got nothing at all i was frozen in every limb poured the water out of my boots and lay down again our men suffered exactly the same things but did not write about them the german generals and their staff could not be quite indifferent to all this welter of human suffering among their troops in spite of the cold scientific spirit with which they regarded the problem of war the agony of the individual soldier would not trouble them there is no war without agony but the psychology of masses of men had to be considered because it affects the efficiency of the machine the german general staff on the western front was becoming seriously alarmed by the declining morale of its infantry under the increasing strain of the british attacks and adopted stern measures to cure it but it could not hope to cure the heaps of german dead who were lying on the battlefields nor the maimed men who were being carried back to the dressing stations nor to bring back the prisoners taken in droves by the french and british troops before the attack on fleur's line the capture of Thiepval and the German debacle at Beaumont Hamel in November, the enemy's command was already filled with grave anxiety at the enormous losses of its fighting strength, was compelled to adopt new expedients for increasing the number of its divisions. It was forced to withdraw troops badly needed on other fronts, and the successive shocks of the British offensive reached as far as Germany itself, 
so that the whole of its recruiting system had to be revised to fill up the gaps torn out of the German ranks. Chapter 22 All through July and August the enemy's troops fought with wonderful and stubborn courage, defending every bit of broken woodland, every heap of bricks that was once a village, every line of trenches smashed by heavy shell-fire, with obstinacy. It is indeed fair and just to say that throughout those battles of the Somme our men fought against an enemy hard to beat, grim and resolute, and inspired sometimes with the courage of despair, which was hardly less dangerous than the courage of hope. The Australians, who struggled to get the high ground at Pozier, did not have an easy task. The enemy made many counter-attacks against them. All the ground thereabouts was, as I have said, so smashed that the earth became finely powdered, and it was the arena of bloody fighting at close quarters which did not last a day or two, but many weeks. Moquette Farm was like the phoenix which rose again out of its ashes. In its tunneled ways German soldiers hid and came out to fight our men in the rear, long after the sight of the farm was in our hands but the German troops were fighting what they knew to be a losing battle. They were fighting rearguard actions, trying to gain time for the hasty digging of ditches behind them, trying to sell their lives at the highest price. They lived not only under incessant gunfire, gradually weakening their nerve power, working a physical as well as a moral change in them, but in constant terror of British attacks. They could never be sure of safety at any hour of the day or night, even in their deepest dugouts. The British varied their times of attack, at dawn, at noon, when the sun was reddening in the west, just before the dusk, in pitch darkness, even the steady, regular bombardment that had never ceased all through the days and nights would concentrate into the great tumult of sudden drum-fire, and presently waves of men, English or Scottish or Irish, Australians or Canadians, would be sweeping on them and over them, rummaging down into the dugouts with bombs and bayonets, gathering up prisoners, quick to kill if men were not quick to surrender. In this way, Thiepval was encircled so that the garrison there, the 180th Regiment, who had held it for two years, knew that they were doomed. In this way, Guillemont and Givenchy fell so that in the first place hardly a man out of two thousand men escaped to tell the tale of horror in German lines, and in the second place there was no long fight against the Irish, who stormed it in a wild, fierce rush which even machine-guns could not check. The German general staff was getting flurried, grabbing at battalions from other parts of the line, disorganizing its divisions under the urgent need of flinging in men to stop this rot in the lines ordering counter-attacks which were without any chance of success, so that thin waves of men came out into the open, as I saw them several times, to be swept down by scythes of bullets which cut them clean to the earth. Before September 15th they hoped that the British offensive was wearing itself out. It seemed to them at least doubtful that after the struggle of two and a half months the British troops could still have spirit and strength enough to fling themselves against new lines. But the machinery of their defenses was crumbling. Many of their guns had worn out and could not be replaced quickly enough. Many batteries had been knocked out in their emplacements along the line of Bazentine and Longeval before the artillery was drawn back to Grand Court and a new line of safety. Italian commanders clamored for greater supplies of hand grenades, entrenching tools, trench mortars, signal rockets, and all kinds of fighting material, enormously in excess of all previous requirements. The difficulties of dealing with the wounded, who littered the battlefields and choked the roads with the traffic of ambulances, became increasingly severe, owing to the dearth of horses for transport and the longer range of British guns which had been brought far forward. The German general staff studied its next lines of defense away through Courchelet, Martinpuich, Le Boeuf, Morval, and Comble, and they did not look too good. But with the luck and courage of German soldiers, and the exhaustion, surely those fellows were exhausted, of British troops, good enough. On September 15th, the German command had another shock when the whole line of British troops on the Somme front south of Ancre 
rose out of their trenches and swept over the German defenses in a tide. Those defenses broke hopelessly, and the waves dashed through. Here and there, as on the German left at Morval and Le Boeuf, the bulwarks stood for a time, but the British pressed against them and round them. On the German right, below the little river of the Ancre, Cochelet fell, and Martin Puich, and at last, as I have written, Highwood, which the Germans desired to hold at all costs, and had held against incessant attacks by great concentration of artillery, was captured and left behind by the London men. A new engine of war had come as a demoralizing influence among German troops, spreading terror among them on the first day out of the tanks. For the first time the Germans were outwitted in inventions of destruction. They, who had been foremost in all engines of death, it was the moment of real panic in the German lines, a panic reaching back from the troops to the high command. Ten days later, on September 25th, when the British made a new advance, all this time the French were pressing forward too, on our right by Wa, Combles was evacuated without a fight, and with a litter of dead in the streets. Godecourt, Le Boeuf, and Morval were lost by the Germans, and a day later Thiepval, the greatest fortress positions next to beaumont hamel fell with all its garrison taken prisoners they were black days in the german headquarters where staff officers heard the news over their telephones and sent stern orders to artillery commanders and provisional generals and after dictating new instructions that certain trench systems must be held at whatever price heard that already they were lost it was at this time that the morale of the german troops on the somme front showed most signs of breaking in spite of all their courage, the ordeal had been too hideous for them, and in spite of all their discipline, the iron discipline of the German soldier, they were on the edge of revolt. The intimate and undoubted facts of this break in the morale of the enemy's troops during this period reveal a pitiful picture of human agony. We are now fighting on the Somme with the English, wrote a man of the 17th Bavarian Regiment. You can no longer call it war. It is mere murder. We are at the focal point of the present battle in Foreau and Wood, near Guillemont. All my previous experiences in this war, the slaughter at Ypres and the battle in the general pit of Hulluch, are the purest child's play compared with this massacre, and this is much too mild a description. I hardly think they will bring us into the fight again, for we are in a very bad way. From September 12th to 27th, we were on the Somme wrote a man of the 10th Bavarians, and my regiment had 1,500 casualties. A detailed picture of the German losses under our bombardment was given in the diary of an officer captured in a trench near Fleur and dated September 22nd. The four days ending September 4th spent in the trenches were characterized by a continual enemy bombardment that did not abate for a single instant. The enemy had registered on our trenches with light as well as medium and heavy batteries, notwithstanding that he had no direct observation from his trenches, which lie on the other side of the summit. His registering was done by his excellent air service, which renders perfect reports of everything observed. During the first day, for instance, whenever the slightest movement was visible in our trenches during the presence as is usually the case of the enemy aircraft flying as low as three and four hundred yards, a heavy bombardment of the particular section took place. The very heavy losses during the first day brought about the resolution to evacuate the trenches during the daytime. Only a small garrison was left, the remainder withdrawing to a part of the line on the left of the Martempuich posea road. The signal for a bombardment by heavies was given by the English airplanes, on the first day we tried to fire by platoons on the airplanes, but a second airplane retaliated by dropping bombs and firing his machine gun at our troops. Our own airmen appeared only once for a short time behind our lines. While many airplanes are observing from early morning till late at night, our own hardly ever venture near. The opinion is that our trenches cannot protect troops during the barrage of the shortest duration owing to lack of dugouts. The enemy understands how to prevent, with his terrible barrage, the bringing up of building material, and even how to hinder the work itself. The consequence is that our trenches are always ready for an assault on his part. 
our artillery which does occasionally put a heavy barrage on the enemy trenches at a great expense of ammunition cannot cause similar destruction to him he can bring his building material up can repair his trenches as well as build new ones can bring up rations and ammunition and remove the wounded the continual barrage of our lines of communication makes it very difficult for us to ration and relieve our troops to supply water ammunition and building material to evacuate wounded and causes heavy losses this and the lack of protection from artillery fire and the weather the lack of hot meals the continual necessity of lying still in the same place the danger of being buried the long time the wounded have to remain in the trenches and chiefly the terrible effect of the machine the heavy artillery fire controlled by an excellent air service has a most demoralizing effect on the troops only with the greatest difficulty could the men be persuaded to stay in the trenches under these conditions there were some who could not be persuaded to stay if they could see any chance of deserting or malingering for the first time on our front the german officers could not trust the courage of their men nor their loyalty nor their sense of discipline all this horror of men blown to bits over living men of trenches heaped with dead and dying was stronger than courage stronger than loyalty stronger than discipline a moral rot was threatening to bring the german troops on the somme front to disaster large numbers of men reported sick and tried by every kind of trick to be sent back to base hospitals in the fourth bavarian division desertions were frequent and several times whole bodies of men refused to go forward into the front line the morale of men in the three ninety third regiment taken at courcholette seemed to be very weak one of the prisoners declared that they gave themselves up without firing a shot because they could trust the english not to kill them the platoon commander had gone away and the prisoner was ordered to alarm the platoon in case of attack but did not do so on purpose they did not shoot with rifles or machine guns and did not throw bombs many of the german officers were as demoralized as the men shirking their posts in the trenches, shamming sickness, and even leading the way to surrender. Prisoners of the 351st Regiment, which lost 1,300 men in 15 days, told of officers who had refused to take their men up to the front line, and of whole companies who had declined to move when ordered to do so. An officer of the 74th Lanvier Regiment is said by prisoners to have told his men during our preliminary bombardment to surrender as soon as we attacked. A German regimental order says, I must state with the greatest regret that the regiment, during this change of position, had to take notice of the sad fact that men of four of the companies, inspired by shameful cowardice, left their companies on their own initiative and did not move into line. Another order contains the same fact and a warning of what punishment may be meted out. Proofs are multiplying of men leaving the position without permission and hiding at the rear it is our duty each at his post to deal with this fact with energy and success many bavarians complained that their officers did not accompany them into the trenches but went down to the hospitals with imaginary diseases in any case there was a great deal of real sickness mental and physical the ranks were depleted by men suffering from fever pleurisy jaundice and stomach complaints of all kinds twisted up with rheumatism after lying in waterlogged holes lamed for life by bad cases of trench foot and nerve broken so that they could do nothing but weep the nervous cases were the worst and in the greatest number many men went raving mad the shell-shock victims clawed at their mouths unceasingly or lay motionless like corpses with staring eyes or trembled in every limb moaning miserably and afflicted with a great terror. To the Germans, barely less to British troops, the Somme battlefields were not only shambles, but a territory which the devil claimed as his own for the torture of men's brains and souls before they died in the furnace fires. A spirit of revolt against all this crept into the minds of men who retained their sanity. A revolt against the people who had ordained this vast outrage against god and humanity into german letters there crept bitter burning words against the millionaires who grow rich out of the war 
against the high people who live in comfort behind the lines. Letters from home inflamed these thoughts. It was not good reading for men under shell-fire. It seems that you soldiers fight so that official stay-at-homes can treat us as female criminals. Tell me, dear husband, are you a criminal when you fight in the trenches? Or why do people treat women and children here as such? For the poor here it is terrible, and yet the rich, the gilded ones, the bloated aristocrats, gobble up everything in front of our very eyes. All soldiers, friend and foe, ought to throw down their weapons and go on strike, so that this war, which enslaves the people more than ever, may cease. Thousands of letters, all in this strain, were reaching the German soldiers on the Somme, and they did not strengthen the morale of men already victims of terror and despair. Behind the lines, deserters were shot in batches. To those in front came orders of the day warning them, exhorting them, commanding them to hold fast. To the hesitating and faint-hearted in the regiment, says one of these orders, I would say the following. What the Englishman can do, the German can do also. Or if, on the other hand, the Englishman really is a better and superior being, he would be quite justified in his aim as regards this war viz the extermination of the german there is a further point to be noted this is the first time we have been in the line on the somme and what is more we are there at a time when things are more calm the english regiments opposing us have been in the firing line for the second and in some cases even the third time heads up and play the man it was easy to write such documents it was more difficult to bring up reserves of men and ammunition the German command was harder pressed by the end of September. From July 1st to September 8th, according to trustworthy information, 53 German divisions in all were engaged against the Allies on the Somme battlefield. Out of these, 14 were still in the line on September 8th. 28 had been withdrawn, broken and exhausted, to quieter areas. 11 more had been withdrawn to rest billets. Under the Allies' artillery fire and infantry attacks, the average life of a German division as a unit fit for service on the Somme was 19 days. More than two new German divisions had to be brought into the front line every week since the end of June to replace those smashed in the process of resisting the Allied attack. In November, it was reckoned by competent observers in the field that well over 120 German divisions had been passed through the ordeal of the Somme this number including those which have appeared there more than once chapter twenty three by september twenty fifth when the british troops made another attack the morale of the german troops was reaching its lowest ebb except on their right at beaumont hamel and beaucourt they were far beyond the great system of protective dugouts which had given them a sense of safety before july first their second and third lines of defense had been carried and they were existing in shell craters and trenches hastily scraped up under ceaseless artillery fire. The horrors of the battlefield were piled up to heights of agony and terror. Living men, dwelt among the unburied dead, made their way to the front line over heaps of corpses, breathed in the smell of human corruption, and had always in their ears the cries of the wounded they could not rescue. They wrote these things in tragic letters, thousands of them, which never reached their homes in Germany, but lay in their captured ditches. The number of dead lying about is awful. One stumbles over them. The stench of the dead lying around us is unbearable. We are no longer men here. We are worse than beasts. It is hell let loose. It is horrible. We lived in misery. If the dear ones at home could see all this, perhaps there would be a change. But they are never told. The ceaseless roar of the guns is driving us mad. Poor, pitiful letters, out of their cries of agony, one gets to the real truth of war. The glory and the splendor of it, preached by the German philosophers and the British jingoes, who upheld it as the great strengthening tonic for their race, and as the noblest experience of men. Every line these German soldiers wrote might have been written by one of ours. From both sides of the shifting lines 
there was the same death and the same hell. Behind the lines, the German general staff, counting up the losses of battalions and divisions who staggered out weakly, performed juggling tricks with what reserves it could lay its hands on, and flung up stray units to relieve the poor wretches in the trenches. Many of those reliefs lost their way in going up, and came up late, already shattered by the shell-fire through which they passed. Our position, wrote a German infantry officer, was, of course, quite different from what we had been told. Our company alone relieved a whole battalion. We had been told we were to relieve a company of fifty men, weakened by casualties. The men we relieved had no idea where the enemy was, how far off he was, or whether any of our own troops were in front of us. We got no idea of our support position until six o'clock this evening. The English are four hundred yards away by the windmill over the hill. One German soldier wrote that the British seem to relieve their infantry very quickly, while the German commands work on the principle of relieving only in the direst need, and leaving the divisions in as long as possible. Another wrote that the leadership of the divisions really fell through. For the most part, we did not get orders, and the regiment had to manage as best it could. If orders arrived, they generally came too late or were dealt out from the green table without knowledge of the conditions in front, so that to carry them out was impossible. All this was a sign of demoralization not only among the troops who were doing the fighting and the suffering, but among the organizing generals behind, who were directing the operations. The continual hammer-strokes of the British and French armies on the Somme battlefields strained the German war machine on the western front almost to breaking point. It seemed as though a real debacle might happen, and that they would be forced to effect a general retreat a withdrawal more or less at ease or a retirement under pressure from the enemy. But they had luck, astonishing luck. At the very time when the morale of the German soldiers was lowest, and when the strain on the high command was greatest, the weather turned in their favor, and gave them just the breathing space they desperately needed. Rain fell heavily in the middle of October. Autumn mists prevented airplane activity and artillery work and the ground became a quagmire, so that the British troops found it difficult to get up their supplies for a new advance. The Germans were able, in this respite, to bring up new divisions, fresh and strong enough to make heavy counterattacks in the Stuff and Schwaben and Regina trenches, and to hold the lines more securely for a time, while great digging was done further back at Beaupalme and the next line of defense. Successive weeks of bad weather and our own tragic losses checked the impetus of the British and French driving power, and the Germans were able to reorganize and reform. As I have said, the shock of our offensive reached as far as Germany, and caused a complete reorganization in the system of obtaining reserves of manpower. The process of combing out, as we called it, was pursued with astonishing ruthlessness, and German mothers, already stricken with the loss of their elder sons, raised cries of despair when the youngest born were also seized, boys of eighteen belonging to the 1918 class. The whole of the 1917 class had joined the depots in March and May of this year, receiving a three months training before being transferred to the field recruit depots in June and July. About the middle of July, the first large drafts joined their units and made their appearance at the front and soon after the beginning of our offensive at least half this class was in the front-line regiments. The massacre of the boys had begun. Then older men, men beyond middle age, who correspond to the French territorial class, exempted from fighting service and kept on lines of communication, were also called to the front, and whole garrisons of these gray heads were removed from German towns to fill up the ranks. The view is held here, wrote a German soldier of the Somme, that the higher command intends gradually to have more and more Landsturm battalions, men of the oldest reserves, trained in trench warfare for a few weeks, as we have been, according to the quality of the men 
and thus to secure by degrees a body of troops on which it can count in an emergency. In the month of November the German High Command believed that the British attacks were definitely at an end, having broken down, as they claimed, in mud and blood. But another shock came to them when once more British troops, the 51st Highland Division and the 63rd Naval Division, left their trenches in fog and snow and captured the strongest fortress position on the enemy's front at Beaumont Hamel, bringing back over 6,000 prisoners. It was after that they began their retreat. These studies of mine, of what happened on both sides of the shifting lines in the Somme, must be as horrible to read as they were to write. But they were less than the actual truth, for no pen will ever, in one book or in hundreds, give the full record of the individual agony, the broken heart springs, the soul shock, as well as the shell shock, of that frightful struggle in which, on one side or the other, two million men were engulfed. Modern civilization was wrecked on those fire-blasted fields, though they led to what we called victory. More died there than the flower of our youth and German manhood. The older order of the world died there, because many men who came out alive of that conflict were changed, and vowed not to tolerate a system of thought which had led up to such a monstrous massacre of human beings who prayed to the same God, loved the same joys of life, and had no hatred of one another except as it had been lighted and inflamed by their governors, their philosophers, and their newspapers. The German soldier cursed the militarism which had plunged him into that horror. The British soldier cursed the German as the direct cause of all his trouble, but looked back on his side of the line and saw an evil there which was also his enemy, the evil of a secret diplomacy which juggled with the lives of humble men so that war might be sprung upon them without their knowledge or consent, and the evil of rulers who hated German militarism not because of his wickedness, but because of its strength in rivalry, and the evil of a folly in the minds of men which had taught them to regard war as a glorious adventure, the patriotism as the right to dominate other peoples, and liberty as the catchword of politicians in search of power. After the Somme battles, there were many other battles as bloody and terrible, but they only confirmed greater numbers of men in the faith that the old world had been wrong in its makeup and wrong in its religion of life. Lip service to Christian ethics was not good enough as an argument for this. Either the heart of the world must be changed by a real obedience to the gospel of Christ, or Christianity must be abandoned for a new creed which would give better results between men and nations. There could be no reconciling of bayonet drill and high explosives with the words, love one another. Or if bayonet drill and high explosive force were to be the rule of life in preparation for another struggle such as this, then at least let men put hypocrisy away and return to the primitive law of the survival of the fittest in a jungle world subservient to the king of beasts. The devotion of military chaplains to the wounded, their valor, their decorations for gallantry under fire, their human comradeship and spiritual sincerity, would not bridge the gulf in the minds of many soldiers between a gospel of love and this argument by bayonet and bomb, gas shell and high-velocity blunderbuss, club and trench shovel. Some time or other, when German militarism acknowledged defeat by the break of its machine or by the revolt of its people, not until then, there must be a new order of things which would prevent such another massacre in the fair fields of life that could come only by a faith in the hearts of many peoples breaking down old barriers of hatred and reaching out to one another in a fellowship of common sense based on common interests and inspired by an ideal higher than this beast-like rivalry of nations. So thinking men thought and talked. So said the soldier poets who wrote from the trenches. So said many onlookers. The simple soldier did not talk like that unless he were a Frenchman. Our men only began to talk like that after the war, as many of them are now talking, and the revolt of the spirit, vague but passionate, against the evil that had produced this devil's trap of war and the German challenge 
was subconscious as they sat in their dugouts and crowded in their ditches in the battles of the Somme. End of section 19